And we're live. Hello, friends. Thanks for waiting. Happy, oh, not quite, almost New Year. Let me make this chat a little bigger to look at here. Not quite, almost New Year. And then mute myself. Let me make this chat a little bigger no to look time loops. Hey, hey there. Hey, friends. How you doing? We've got some dragons on the bottom. We both made videos. Tim, Tim, your, your Burninator was good. I didn't. I didn't even really get the Trogdor reference. Um, that's I'm too old or missed something, but it was still loved it because you know it's Vagar burn and stuff. So that's Vagar the Burninator, and you're right. I did like the Gray Water Watch. Uh, my name is Mud. Conjunction there. That was brilliant that you saw that. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah, something I've learned over the weekend is people love Wojaks. Uh, Westeros Be Like has blown up on my channel. Uh, it's it really has become my most popular video, and it's actually pulled in an uh, an outside audience that I was not expecting. Oh, that's good to hear, Tim. Because of course that was obviously not a monetizable video <laughs> with all the obviously. music in there. So I'm <laughs> no. glad it is bringing some people to your channel. Cleo says Happy New Year, everyone. It is it is pretty much bird bedtime, but. I have kept her up just a little bit so that she could say Happy New Year to y'all before she gets a tuck in, which I'll give her a tuck in in just a minute. All right, let me bring this mic a little closer. Yes, thank you for joining us. So in case you missed the structure of the event, I guess I could have picked four pictures that I'll fix this in a second. In any case, we've got four topics for four hours and uh, yeah, it's loose structure. But, Tim, I do want you to rudely interrupt me with a buzzer or something on the hour. That would be great. Um, yeah, I have will... an alarm set for the next four hours every okay, hour Okay, you're beautiful. Tim, you're beautiful, and I love you, and your organization is just... <laughs> so we both have, we both have some, uh, some drink, some libations to celebrate. Um, I, of course, have some henny, as is my want. And I've got a Cleo hen. She's a hen. I call her... Henny pen and various things like that. So this is, this is my henny for my henny. I did not get the gray goose for the goose because I just don't really need to drink that much vodka, Tim. I'm not a much of a drinker. Uh, <laughs> but you went further than me. You have, what do you have? Expl you have a whole theme and stuff. Yeah, I actually, I have a whole extra table next to me full of drinks. But I'm starting off with this Cabernet Sauvignon House of the Dragon theme that my brother got me. But I'm drinking it from a red solo cup because I have no class and I am just a damn barbarian. Very good. And um, you're not a barbarian. That's not true. That's a, that's a, it's high. It's a, well, you're one of those like barbarians that oils their hair and has muscles and, you know, takes care of themselves. <laughs> no, not one of those other kind of barbarians. In any case, um, at 20 minutes after the hour, not this hour because we're not doing a new, but 20 minutes after each new year. We'll celebrate Garth New Year and uh, might go live on Instagram with my at Garth the Green account because I can't celebrate the Garth the Green New Year uh, on YouTube quite the same as I can. So if you are on Instagram and you haven't followed my Garth the Green account, that's me praising Garth set to music. So it's mixed media, if you will. But uh, yeah, we'll check that out. And so, yeah, we're going to do House of the Dragon discussion first. And then we'll do a little Winds of Winter predictions, and I've got some tasty topics queued up for that one. Uh, then we'll talk some theories, general Song of Ice and Fire theories, and then lastly, we're just going to talk about Euron for an hour. Because Tim, every time we try to talk <laughs> about something else, Euron seeps in and takes over. That's it's the way of it's the way of the Lovecraftian entities. They just sort of seep in and take over. So that's what you got there. That's why I got. There. The Kraken and the Dragon lapels to cover both our broad topics. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, you're somewhere in between nerd and barbarian, Tim. Like I said, highly cultured and refined. But uh, yeah, we, you know, if you've got a super chat and if you can, yeah, I mean, if you're not going to be around, whatever later, you can you can break my structure. I won't cry. But I just wanted, I didn't want it to be four hours of just nebulousness. So. House of the Dragon, Tim. First of all, let's talk about by let's let's start by talking about how incredible my video was that I put out yesterday. Did you enjoy it? What did you think? How was the editing for you? 
Oh, ranking the dragons? Yeah. <laughs> <That was good. laughs> Did we have any disagreements? Um, I mean, as a Damon fan, Caraxes is going to be my number one choice, but I also got to give Nana Vagar the respect she deserves. That's why she's the Burninator. Let's, um, well, let's, since I have the dragons up on the screen, let's talk about the cannibal first, because the cannibal, when I was doing the research, the more I thought about the cannibal, the more interesting it was. Um, so the thing I want to focus in on is the idea that it might not be a Targaryen dragon. Um, interest, the thing I had forgotten before is that the dragon keepers on Dragonstone had made a dozen attempts to tame and claim the cannibal unsuccessfully and so maybe that's just cannibals of mean dragon um you know once sheep stealer went wild they tried to claim they tried to get sheep stealer back and couldn't so it doesn't mean that you know doesn't necessarily have to mean anything other than cannibals especially savage or whatever you know he'll cut a mf -er. <laughs> but if this whole thing is like we think where the bloodlines, it's actually the familiar bloodlines. Okay, there's, there's two, okay, let me back up. There's two ways the Targaryen dragon bond could work. It could be that all Valerians from Valyria, okay, anybody with Valyrian blood can potentially ride a dragon. Now, there are, in Valyria, there are like 40 families, the most powerful families that vied for power and like makes you think of some sort of senate. Or maybe there's just like, you know, you have to have a certain amount of status to run for whatever. There's not a president or an emperor is the point. They had some political system sharing power amongst, sounds kind of like an oligarchy a little bit. But mm -hmm. in any case, there's something going on like that. Um, and it's there's this line about the Targaryen dragons always having been bred for war. And since we know that the Valerians did lots of things with their dragons other than go to war... For example, pave very long, hundreds and hundreds of miles long stretches of roads, wide stretches of flat Valerian road, unbreakable. They made castles, they did trading, they had sorcerers to control the mines, they made glass candles, they made Valerian steel. You've got the human-animal hybrid experiment doctor people, you know, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. all. And, and it makes sense that if there's basically... Any Valerian potentially can ride a dragon. However, the different families might monopolize uh, the dragon simply by possessing them. Uh, and then the thing is, though, it's more likely that... It, okay, Cleo's being a little incorrigible. You're going to bed very soon, Cleo. Um, <laughs> it's more likely, Tim, that the, the dragon lineages are bonded to specific families. You know, we talked about the Damon Song thing and how it implies that you know, there's this is it's really just another log on the fire of this theory about the dragon bond, which is that there's some sort of ancestor that must be sacrificed first. Somehow we got to stuff their spirit in the dragon so that the descendants of that ancestor will then have a connection to the dragon, a sort of psychic connection. Um, if you it fits a lot of the criteria of a song of ice and fire magic, you know, it's all works on blood magic and human sacrifice and stuff, especially the Valerian magic. And so if this is the case, then the Targaryens, essentially, they possess their dragons because they have, they all descend from ancestor Targaryen, the first one who was killed and stuffed into a dragon, Balerion's ancestor, if you will. And then so all the children of, you know, Balerion's wife, who died back in Valeria and didn't get to go to Dragonstone, they brought Balerion... The only dragon that came from Valyria. Actually, <clears throat> excuse me. It says they brought five dragons from Valyria. Balerion is the only one that survived to the conquest, which is 112 years later. So we have to assume that some of those five dragons would have been females and egg layers. And we don't know. Maybe they can switch gender. They don't even know, who, you know, male and female except for by which ones lay eggs. But the point is, the Targaryens came to Dragonstone with a few dragons and with eggs, and all the dragons that we see in the story, except for maybe Cannibal, are descended from the same lineage of dragon that is bonded to Targaryen. But the Cannibal, something very interesting happens 
at the funeral of Corliss Valerion. Isn't that right, Tim? Yeah, it seems like the cannibal... If we believe every word of Fire and Blood, it seems as if the cannibal gives a sort of salute when he's flying over uh, Corliss's funeral. And then there is the there is the theory that the cannibal ha- uh, it flies north and is in Skagos. Tell me about that theory. Um, what is there for that other than the fact that there are cannibals on Skagos and Skagos is and uh, cannibal is a cannibal? Is it's, there anything uh, else? Part of it, part of it is the the awaking dragons from stone. Skagos is the old tongue word for stone. Uh, the Skagosi are known as the stone stoneborn. Born. Yeah, so it makes them a uh, sort of parallel to the Ironborn. Um, I've said like Skagos and the Ironborn being on opposite sides of the north, they're like two thorns in the north side because the Skagos Skagosi have rebelled, and I think it's it's because Rickon is there. And the brand theory about how powerful of a war is brand, will he be able to warg a dragon? Couple that with the idea that Rickon might be an even more powerful warg. That so people, I think uh, people want there to be a dragon on Skagos to open up that possibility. Now, I I'm not a. Uh, it's one of those theories. I don't love it. I don't hate it. Mm -hmm. but i also do real but i also then put that if that is true then that would make the cannibal if the cannibal is still alive on skagos he'd be over 500 years old i know how old do we want this poor dragon to be (laughs) (laughs) okay well so setting aside the skagos theory because that that is a little bit off the beaten path i mean that seems on it's hard to see how there'd be room for another dragon in the story other than an ice dragon mm-hmm. coming out of the north. Um, that's the same problem with the Winterfell dragon theory. It's like it kind of seems like something hatched out of the first keep when Ramsay burnt it and all that. There's a lot of the language that's suggestive. And then the, the wolf sees a river of flame that looks like a serpent and all that. But it's like, yeah, mm-hmm. no one saw a dragon flying out of Winterfell and across the countryside. No one's ever heard it rustling around down there. You know, like, I don't, it just seems kind of far-fetched. And then what's it going to do in the story? You know, it's like, oh, well, that's John's dragon or some brand's going to, like, well, Danny has three. Like, we need to figure out something to do with those other two anyway. So it's definitely pretty unlikely. However, um, getting back to the original question, Valarion, Tim, of course, is a different Valerian family other than Targaryen. And they came to Driftmark, we don't know when, but before the Targaryens were on Dragonstone. Now, it does say that the Valerians were never dragon riders. Okay. Mm -hmm. In Valeria. Now, nevertheless, there were other Valerians, as I mentioned, on Dragonstone. Uh, As I mentioned in the video, there were other Valerians on Dragonstone because Dragonstone was founded... 200 years before the doom and the targs moved there 100 years before the doom so we know that at least 100 years before targaryens other valerians came in fact built because the targaryens are not known for building few stone so the dragonstone mm-hmm. fortress built by pre-targaryen valerians so the most logical thing to assume is that the cannibal was that's how he got on dragonstone the valerians that came there before Targaryen. Now, the the first, I guess I'm skipping over the first explanation. Like, the, the thing you'd assume at first is like, oh, that's just a Targaryen dragon that got loose. You know, a hatchling that got away, or one of the dragons laid eggs, you know, on drag, you know, outside of the normal area, and the dragon keepers didn't find them, and then they hatched. But mm-hmm. I definitely think the most important thing that Martin might be doing with Cannibal is talking about the the dragon lineages and showing us that this is a non-Targaryen dragon. And so the dragon keepers, Tim, to get back to the where I started, the dragon keepers, if they are chasing down dragon, I mowed them and now I gotta get Tim to call back in. That, it was just, it could just completely shut down. That was a complete crash. I guess they didn't like that Balerion theory or something um let me uh it should be the same link tim if you're watching you should be able to just uh call me back as it were 
Should be the same link. Yeah, that was just a complete T-Mobile internet modem collapse. And that was very frustrating. Sorry, I'll just have to collect my, uh, my mojo again. Where's Tim? Tim will help me get my mojo back. Tim, come back. No, shh. Quiet, phone. Quiet. That was devastating. Thanks for hanging with me, though. At least it happened at the beginning, I guess. Man, I was just starting to cook with that Balerian thing. Yeah, it's going to buffer for a second. Man. Yep. No, I'm just waiting for Tim to call me back. Tim, let me just uh, make sure that it's... That he's got... That it's not a new... It should be the same link, Tim. And just make sure. Yep, it's the same one. Just call me back, baby. I didn't mean to hang up on you, Tim. Come on back. <clears throat> Anyways, yeah, so it's a long night. And hopefully, uh, yeah, we'll get this thing going. Anyways, I do think, guys, I do think Cannibal. There's Tim. Thank God. Save me, Tim. Just, you know. Oh, we're good? Yes. Well, you, we're <laughs> alive on YouTube. I don't know about good. You tell me how you're doing. I'm a little I'm a little ticked off there, Tim. I'm trying to do a television show here. <laughs> so anyway. Was back to California internet. <laughs> yeah. The people watching on the rewatch won't see that. Um, my power mm -hmm. went out in case you haven't. Put that together. My power oh. went out, or oh. the internet went out, and yeah, anyway. So we were just shaking and baking with the cannibal, and I was just starting to get the conversation revived, just trying to give it CPR. Um, and I tend to think, Tim, that cannibal probably is a different lineage than Targaryen. Mm -hmm. I guess I, oh, that's right. I had just asked you about the dragon keepers. I was asking, and this is, we're just guessing, we don't know. Do you think the Dragon Keepers are of the Targaryen blood, cousins and things? Or do you think they're purely just using technique? Um, or are they, are they of Valerian descent that aren't Targ? Like, what do you think? I think they would be of Valerian descent that aren't Targaryen. So if we think about the 40 families... And it's said that like the Targaryen dragons were bred for war. And I, I, I love your, your example of the road crew dragon. Like you wouldn't want to use a war dragon to build a road. You'd want a more docile, lazier dragon. The Targaryen dragons are non-union. So, so it's, it's like in the way that we breed horses and we breed dogs, you know, like a war horse and a plow horse or a hunting dog and a lap dog gonna serve different purposes. And sit, so that would mean that Dragonstone wouldn't have been built by Targaryens. It would have been built by other Valyrians and other Valyrian dragons specifically used for building purposes. The road right. crew dragon, the architecture right. dragon. So that would put other Valyrians, and then those Valyrians coming there and doing that work, they would need their laborers. They would have their, their households, their servants, just as Aenar Targaryen along with bringing his family, also brought his his servants. He had uh -huh. slaves. I mean, I guess one could assume that he probably granted them their freedom and they became, like, paid paid help. But, yeah. So yeah, the Valyrian Dragon Keepers... If I could just probably... pause real quick. I, I love where you're going with this. But, yes, what I what I, I always say this, it's when it says that Aenar moved with all his, you know, his family and his slaves, one would assume... Uh, that the well, the Valerian slavery seems to be a lot like SOC slavery, where there are tiers, like Roman slavery. So the the Targaryen family slaves, quote unquote, would be like their in a in a different society, the household servants, the ones that do math tutors and various other things. So yes, um, one assumes that when they come to Westeros, since there is not slavery in Westeros, and we don't ever hear about slaves on Dragonstone, that those people would then just become the household servants uh, as per Westerosi society. But yeah, so great point. Yeah. 
Dragonstone is built by Valerians, so we know that dragons and Valerian mages are on Dragonstone before the Targaryens, and the Dragon Keepers would be there already taking care of things before the Targaryens got there. So you're you're basically building up to saying they probably inherited those Dragon Keepers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the Dragon Keepers of, of House of... I guess not today because there's no Dragon Keepers now, but the House of the, the Dragon Keepers we see on House of the Dragon are probably descendants of the Valyrian small folk who came with the large, who came with the more noble families to Dragonstone. And then as for House Valerion, as you said, because they're not a dragon riding family. Well, if you are not part of this elite, if you're not part of this 40 noble family, this oligarchy, plutocracy, whatever then you need to carve out your own niche in life. And this becomes a real thing in history where this is how we get our merchant princes. And you end up in times where the merchant class actually at times can become richer and more powerful than the actual royal families. And that's where I see House Valarion falling into that. They didn't have dragons, so they're like, okay, we got we to gotta find another way to, to become powerful. And that's why we get that line from Corliss to Damon, like you and I are both men who have had to carve our own way out in life. Damon's ta he's talking to Damon in the sense that Damon is a second son because no matter what, Damon's still a prince. Corliss doesn't have that. But Corliss and his lineage, his ancestry, his the Valerian family had to build themselves up from essentially, essentially nothing in the beginning. We don't know where their roots lie, but it's not a dragon riding family. They had to find their wealth through other means. And then Corliss makes his wealth through his voyages. So he is, in a sense, a self-made man in that respect. So it could be that, um, <clears throat> it could be that, like, so why did, you know, why did the cannibals salute Corliss Valarion? Did the Valarion somehow have a connection to this lineage? I guess you'd have to suppose, suppose that before the Targaryens came to Dragonstone, the Valarions are there, other Valerians are there, and maybe the Valarions are intermarrying with those Valerians. And so some of those people that would have been able to bond with Cannibal and his lineage then became into House Valarion. But if that's the case, they'd also be in Targaryen because the mother of the Conquerors was a Valarion who was already half Targaryen. So the mm -hmm. Valarions and Targaryens have been intermarrying before the conquest. Um, so it doesn't mm -hmm. quite... There's, there's, no, there's nothing about... Like, Corliss has some Targaryen blood. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, yeah, so maybe, maybe, maybe Balerion isn't of a different lineage. Maybe he's just an unclaimed dragon. And, like, he salutes Corliss because... I don't know. It's, it's just weird. It's like, if they never bonded then the the dragon wouldn't give a crap <laughs> yeah. about somebody dying, you know? Yeah, well, because that's the thing. It's it's do you believe he saluted him? Because we have our three different counts in Fire and Blood, and some of them like to... they'll The maesters will admit sometimes that things are thrown in just because they sound nice. Just like the songs that the singers sing. A lot of them are based off of myth because they make for a good story. The idea of... Corliss Valarion being such a badass that even in death, the cannibal salutes him. It makes for a great scene. It makes for a great movie. But is it historically accurate? Probably not. <laughs> I tend to think it would be because it would have been witnessed by everyone at the funeral. So it would be a hard mm -hmm. thing to... I mean, if it happened, it would have. everyone would have remarked and remembered on it. And it just seems like a weird thing to make up if it didn't happen. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, if, Corliss, if Corliss was riding the cannibal in secret, I mean, there that's another tinfoil theory that <laughs> it's another one of those ones that it's like, I don't hate it. It's a nice thought, but what narrative purpose does it serve? If Because if he had the ability to ride the cannibal, then that's something he should have revealed. That was, I get having an ace in your back sleeve, but during that point of the war, you should have played that card. Well, let's think about the. It gets back to the um, the Adam uh, Adam of Hole question, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, fi uh, spoilers. You know, this will be. We're discussing the future of House of the Dragons in Fire and Blood. I don't. This is not a no spoilers video. Um, 
you know, uh, Adam of Holt is supposedly Lenor's bastards, but it's pretty obvious that they are, Adam and Alan are um, Corliss's bastards, and they become dragon riders. So the question is, well, how's that? The, the, the easiest answer is that all Valarions actually do have Targaryen blood. Again, mm -hmm. the mother of the Conquerors is a Valarion who was already half Targaryen, which means that not only did Valarions marry into Targaryen, but Targaryens married into Valarion. And so all the Valarions have Targaryen blood. So that could be the answer for Adam of Hull. Um, however, the idea that uh, Cannibal flies by Corliss, like, yeah, it's... Did Corliss try to bond with Cannibal? Or did, did, did Corliss's parent try to do that? Or, like... It's annoying. It's like, the, it's a detail that feels like there's something more there to figure out what it is. And I guess I can't quite come up with a satisfactory answer. Yeah, I think the point is for it to be ambiguous. It's to make you question and to know that you're never going to have a true answer. It's something that you're just going to have to ponder over and just be like, well, why did it happen? Why? But, uh, yeah. But as you're saying, yeah, with the Valarions, even though they weren't a dragon riding family, since they've bre since they've intermarried with the Targaryens so much, they have they have the bloodline necessary. So it's like like with any anyone, I guess, with a Valyrian ancestry, is they have the key, but that's still but that doesn't necessarily mean they're actually allowed through the front door. Yeah, and that kind of gets us um to the Nettles discussion, which is something that I wanted to talk about. Um, by the way, you can, of course, send in questions and support the program with the paypal.me link in the description, as well as the super chat function. Kelly Johnson wants to know if we will see hard Hugh hammer this season. And I believe he has been cast. So the mm -hmm. answer is yes, which means yes, we should see all the dragon four. seeds. And we went through this, me and Tim, uh, the last couple of weeks, we read through all the fire and blood that's going to become season two. And the sowing of the seed, the dragon seeds, all that stuff, it has to be there this year. So we should see cheap stealer, nettles, and all that stuff. Uh, Kelly says, do you think that Lord Baratheon really couldn't find a bride with lineage pure enough for Rhaegar? Or did Blood Raven spoil the match and use weather magic to make a storm out of nowhere to sink the Baratheon ships with only Patchface surviving? Nah, I think the Patchface storm is just a storm. It's Shipbreaker Bay, that's what it does. Um, it's named Shipbreaker Bay. Uh, and if anybody sunk that ship, it would be the Deep Ones, right? Yeah, because <laughs> the thing about that is, is that if that would only be plausible for Blood Raven to do if Stefan Baratheon had actually found someone in the Free Cities. But he came, he was coming home empty handed. Yeah, so right, yeah. it would make, so why, why break his ship? And we, Blood Raven, we, we don't know that he can control storms. Like, the only person we've ever seen control wind and storms is Euron. Correct? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I just saw someone send a super chat directly. Uh -huh. to me. They are like Starks being awoken to skin changing. Uh, Jenny Volstone. Are you talking about Squish? I'm sorry. Um, are you referring to Squishers being like Starks? Clarify um, Jenny Volstones. We'll wait for the clarification. Um What was I asking you? Oh, shit. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, we both got distracted. <laughs> completely spaced. What were we just talking about, guys? Oh, Storms. Yes, Euron is the only one who controls Storms in the story that we know of, right? Is there anyone else who controls the wind? Not that I know oh, of. Oh, Melisandre Although might. Davos says right. that he could hear the screams of the people she burned when they sail and the winds have their screams. So it seems like Melisandre might be controlling the wind. Yes. Well, there is there is a line. Um, That's interesting. Actually. So Edric Storm is sent to lease by Davos. That's where Edric Storm is hiding to keep him safe. And there is a line that part of the Golden Company that's supposed to be going to Storm's End to meet up with John Con gets scattered by a storm in lease and so the it's it, it's 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 ambiguous like what does this mean 
because there literally is a sto- a bastard named Storm and Lease who could potentially be a key in the Golden Company. But I think that's that's probably more of a symbolic thing. The le- the scattered by a storm and lease might be more like the golden co- these golden company ships are t- are taking Edric Storm on board, and that's why they're late. Or it could mean they've been destroyed by an actual storm. So let's put a pin in that and come back to that in the Winds of Winter. I'd like to talk about Edric Storm and the Golden Company and stuff. So try to remember that if you can, chat and or Tim. Uh, but yeah, okay, so it is just Euron and Mel that controls the storm. So yeah, Blood Raven. I don't know. I mean, Green Seers conceivably could do anything. They're connected to nature. That could mean damn near anything. However... I like to work with what we're given. Martin usually likes to follow a formula where, like, he'll give us the clue to a mystery in a different plot line. So mm-hmm. we'll see. Oh, like, for example, Melisandre has never talked about raising the dead or giving the Relora's kiss. But we've seen Beric and Thoros do it, and we know that they're working with the same magic. So therefore, we have intuited that Melisandre is probably going to be around to raise John. The, the fandom figured that out as soon as, you know, long damn time ago, before it happened on the show, for sure. So, similar thing here. Like, yeah, I don't know. I also don't like the Blood Raven did everything theories. It's just too easy. You know, unless Martin is really yeah. showing us that that's what's going on, then I don't. What what in doubt, blame Blood Raven? Yeah, yeah I don't like Well, that. maybe it's something we... Now, if we get another Duncan Egg story and a storm a storm happens and blood Raven is in close proximity, then we can start going down that road and theorizing on that one. But at the moment, blood Raven being a storm bringer is not something that's really there. Uh, except for the Eldrick of Mel Nibbin. Right. As you said it, right. As you said it. <laughs> oh, and then Jenny was, so you mentioned something about the dragon seeds, their blood needed to be awakened, like the Starks and their skin changing. Okay. So yeah, this is actually something I've brought up before. Okay. Um, with his, with, with the Starks and skin changing and how I, I had talked about when the Starks were conquering the North, they seemed to be picking up magical bloodlines along the way because the Starks marry into the Barrow Kings and the Marsh Kings when they defeat the War King at Sea Dragon Point. Uh, they take he takes the war king's daughters to bride, so it seems like yeah the St- the Starks seem to to me seem to be like in a magical amalgamation because of all of the different magical families that they've brought in. Now that's not that's not saying that the Starks started out as nothing special all their own, and it's actually the friends they made along the way that really <laughs> did it. Starks are blood of the other, but they've definitely. They've definitely picked up power ups on on the way along when it came to conquering the north. I just thought about them like smashing the mark the mar- the marsh king and like the green side pops out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like they def- it's like how Mega Man gets his powers. You yeah. defeat an enemy and then you get it. <laughs> Dropping mad loot. Well, we've got uh, only three minutes until East Coast New Year. That boy, that first hour really. F- Time flies when your power goes out of the stream crashes for 10 minutes, doesn't it? Um, and you start yeah, 10 and minutes late. when you're already late. 15 minutes late to begin uh, with. So, Tim, <laughs> your first drink, again, your first drink is you got the, the Targaryen wine, yes? Yes, I have the House of the Dragon Cabernet Sauvignon. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's a ca- it's a red wine. It's a red Sauvignon, Cabernet. Sauvignon, Sauvignon, bon. Sauvignon. So, um, one of the things that I really enjoy about House of the Dragon, I will say with this last three minutes... That's not wine in a red cup, is it? I said I was drinking wine from a red solo cup like a damn barbarian. I have no class. I caught the end of the sentence and not the beginning. It's a nice red. Okay. All right. That's how we're doing it. That's fine. I'm drinking straight from the bottle, so I guess I ain't got nothing to talk about. Um, (laughs) You want to talk classless, Jed? To the head, to the head. Well, I could put a paper bag around it, I guess. I could have, instead of dressing up in these nice LML clothes, I could have worn my natural nimble dick outfit, but I try to keep that side of myself contained off the air so y'all don't see that. That's actually my real personality. This entire David Lightbringer thing is an act that I just put on. The nimble dick squisher hour was the real, that was the real me coming through, but 
<clears throat> nah, we got two minutes. I was just saying, I really do love the way that they have um, fleshed out all of the dragon stuff. They've got long pokey poles, you know? <laughs> you need a 10 foot, I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. Well, it's a dragon, you need a 20 foot pole. So that's cool. I like that the dragon's intelligence is played up. They understand High Valerian, you know? Um, I need a... How do we do a countdown? I need, like, um... World clock. Will that do it? No, I need the seconds. World clock doesn't give you the seconds. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna watch the thing change. It'll be like, up. Oh, it happened. We're supposed to count down. Damn it. Count down the clock. Thirty seconds. Okay, I've got time. Boom. Count down to New Year 2024. Go there. Go there. Go. Internet so slow. Oh boy. Nope, it's just not. It happened. Yay! Happy New Year! <laughs> Happy New Year, East Coast. Okay, uh, so, yep, I got my theme going here. Tip another one um, back for y'all. So, on my table, my mountain of drinks... Uh, I have a beer brewed from a brewery in every time zone. So for the East Coast, starting with a Pennsylvania classic, brewed here right in my home state of PA, Yingling Traditional Lager. I just want to show you y'all real quick what the website for the countdown clock says. Oh, yeah, it's... So many, I'm sure so many people are trying to get on that right now. Yeah, but this is the only really reason people that you have this website. <laughs> this exact, yeah, this specific date. I just think it's ironic. It's like the time, the website for the time timed out. Mm -hmm. Out of time. And what other 2023, you're out of time. Time 2023 is timed out. That's, that's what we needed to know. So, yeah. At what other point do we need the seconds besides New Year's? What's that now? I said, at what other point do we need to know the exact seconds along with the time except we for don't, New no, Year's? No, just that. That's it. If, if your clock just went out, if you're just resetting your clock, you don't need the exact seconds. What's that? Yeah, 2023 blocked and reported. What's funny is somewhere the, uh, the webmaster of that website is at home having a meltdown. and be like, oh, this is our big night. Our website's not working. Their servers are in California, too. Yeah, that's kind of <laughs> like me half an hour ago. I'm, I shouldn't make fun, I suppose. <laughs> um, so, yes, as I was saying, I really think one of the greatest things on House of the Dragon, for us, the hardcores, is the care that Ryan Condal and company have shown just the whole dragon keeping. Like... When Damon pops out and he's like, I've been building incubators. I was just like, <laughs> where is Damon's steampunk workshop? I hope that's my season to request. Can I see Damon like tinkering with like alchemy and stuff? But of course they did also show us when he was over in Essos, what was he doing with his very cool coat? You know, he was in the library reading old scrolls. So mm -hmm. I do love this about Damon your favorite character, um, that they have built him up as this sort of Valerian Renaissance man who is trying, you know, realizes it's on him and people like him to preserve these traditions. Viserys being less interested in dragons maybe makes him feel like he's got to know more about dragons. But yeah, just the dragon keepers, yeah. like we were saying, the the, the dragons understand Val Valerian. I just rewatched the whole Rx Lucerys scene last week and... It's really cool, man. I forgot how cool it is. Like when Arak, when uh, Luke lands and he's quieting the dragon, he's like, all right, listen, pay attention, listen close, obey. We got to fly. You know, he's like, you can see him calming him and like using the command. So yeah, it's awesome. I love the dragon, dragon lord communication. And then they've also developed the idea that, oh, it's not a perfect 
control. You know, once Vagar had fire spit in his face, Aemond couldn't control him. And Arax, Luke wasn't trying to get Arax to attack Vagar, but once they were close, the dragon followed his instinct and it attacked. So that's what dragons do. And I always, I keep comparing that to, you know, Rainies and Melis in the dragon pit. Like, Melis didn't just start, like, eating people randomly while Rainies was doing her stare down. That seemed like Ra uh, Melis was doing exactly what Rainies wanted. So, yeah, I, I, there's just a lot. I mean, take that any way you want, Tim, but I just love the care that they have given to the dragons, the dragon keeping, the dragon dragon lord relationship. Uh, you can really see mm -hmm. Ryan's love for the, the high fantasiness of, of House Targaryen. Yeah. Yeah, because we've talked before about when you're adapting how uh, fire and blood into a TV series. So you're given a very, because you're working with very bare bones material, and now it's up to the writers and the showrunners to put meat, put some real meat onto those bones. And so, like you said, we get, we get, so we're going to need more characterization for these characters. And that's why we get Damon, who is a man who wears many hats. He's a prince, he's a warrior, he's a scholar, he's a groomer. That's the difference between being a stan and a, and a fan is you're willing to admit his flaws fair enough, as well. not fair, fair, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So that's why we get a man of many facets. Same with Corliss. Same with Rainy. Same with Rainera. All of our characters. We need to see them with personality, with traits, with hobbies to give them the characterization that we don't have in the book because in the book we're more or less being given a just a, a history lesson, a very, a very interesting, engaging history lesson, but still a history lesson more than a story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> failed, uh, failed t-shirt ideas. Okay. Um, Cause I am going to start doing a lot more with the shirts and stuff this year. We just got an account with a, a new website to make t-shirts. All that's coming. Garth the Green, Praise Garth, all sorts of stuff. Um, one of the uh, failed idea, I'm not going to say whose idea this was, but my divorce lawyer is a brick. <laughs> there was a picture of Damon. That's, we decided that was probably not, not cool, not very tasteful to celebrate murder like that. Oh. But yes, Damon, gray character, very dark gray. You know, gray so dark, almost black. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> Like the Valerian steel, yeah. Like I'm, I'm not gonna tip. I won't tiptoe around it. Damon straight up murdered his wife. He's a bad man. Okay, he's a bad person. Obey, obey me, Rock. Obey me. No, Rock. No. Like yeah, he totally did it. But that doesn't make him like. But that doesn't make me like him less as a character. And if someone's gonna come at me and be like, "Well, how can you like Damon when he does all these awful little things?" Well, it's like okay, but you know these are these are. Fictional characters, okay? Well, fictional character. Do you do you get what I'm telling you? I just, just I always have to quote Ben Affleck in in uh in Jay and Silent Bob that line. Yes, I did. I, I I do think one of the things that suffered to agree with the chat a little bit um in the first <laughs> season was like Rhea Royce just appeared and then she died. She, I really like could have used a couple more scenes with her to develop that. To see Damon, like Damon in the veil, like it was literally one scene that was supposed to represent an entire plot line. That didn't really work for me. Um, I did like most of the show, but that did not work for me. It was way too short and it was a little confusing, but he didn't even yeah. say anything too, which is kind of messed up. Um, that is I, I had Jon Snow fine. flashbacks. I'm like, say something. That's the downside to the first season trying to cover over a decade's worth of events into one season so that we can get to our linear story in season two onward. Yeah, also Lunk the Lunk points out we didn't get to see Damon petition Lady Arryn. Yeah, that was um, an interesting bit of dialogue there. Uh, okay, so... And just real quick, just, I'll just remind... Some of the younger people in the audience that, you know, <laughs> there was a time when people would enjoy characters instead of standing them. And yeah. you could enjoy a villainous character because it's a well-written character. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. you have to 
apologize for their actions. Um, yeah. I will also add, you know, serious thought is like, it's okay to put yourself in the perspective of a bad person. Like I, Cersei is a classic example. Cersei is a very bad person, manifestly horrible, pushes her friend down a well at age 11 because she confessed to having a crush on Jamie, basically. Okay. That's I always mention that first manifest a horrible person. However, also a victim of marital rape, Westerosi patriarchal society and all that stuff too. So it's also worthwhile. And Martin obviously did this writing the character to consider her perspective. Um, and it's just, let's be adults. Let's consider that multiple things are true at once. And, uh, you know, it reminds me of um, political conversations, and I'm only going to speak generically here. Uh, but sometimes when we're assessing causality, right, we can say, oh, well, like, for example, what, what the things that cause terrorism? Or like, it's a conversation that you have to think about if you're a government and you want to fight terrorism. Like, what causes, what drives terrorism? Um, terrorism isn't justified. However... There are things that cause it. And so, yeah, it's just, it's the same thing with these bad characters. It's like, it's interesting to think about what motivates them. Why do they do these things? It doesn't mean that what they did is right or that it's justified, but it didn't just happen because they're a bad person and they like doing bad things. Like, no, they had some reasoning that made sense to them. Uh, so anyway, I will stop. I think everyone understands, but... It's important to say, when we're talking about people like Damon, and I also, like, Dame. okay, so right now, the people that get the heat are Damon and also King Aegon, because King Aegon abused, coerced, or potentially R-worded the serving girl, right? It's mm -hmm. Essentially, mm -hmm. some, you know, something on that continuum. A, a coercion at best, and coercion is still the R-word. Maybe it was an actual physical... We don't know, but it was, you know, if you talk about him online anywhere, it'll only be two seconds before people jump in and be like, ah, the rapist, egg on the rapist. And it's like, yes, yep. he did do that. Um, however, there's also, like that doesn't happen in a vacuum. Like, why did he do that? Why does he think he can do that? Uh, what does that mean about him being king? Um, is he going to, does that mean that he's going to uh, take that same like everything belongs to me attitude to everything for the rest of his life? Or could he have a turning point? Like we know, of course, if we're speaking spoilers, we know that Aegon is hideously burned and goes into, you know, hiding for almost a year. And he's on Milk of the Poppy and he comes back and he's kind of a different person. I, don't know, I wouldn't say a good person. He fed Rhaenyra to the dragon right in front of her son. That's not very cool oh it's not very nice um but he did change and so yeah it's the same kind of thing it's like we can discuss the character even though like he did something which like you would never like um <clears throat> well whatever i don't it's obvious like rape yeah. murder these things are horrible i guess my point was that in season two the list is going to expand beyond Damon and also Rhaenyra because like Vaemon Valarion was beheaded on behalf of Rhaenyra's lie. Like Damon did it, but Vaemon died for speaking the truth because Rhaenyra was trying to cover up her lie. So that's on her. And in the book, Rhaenyra feeds mm -hmm. Vaemon to her dragon Cyrax as well. That's, I don't know why they didn't keep that. Um, but in season two, there's going to be a lot of war crimes and a lot of people like pretty much, by the end of this, almost everybody has done horrible things. Mm. So don't stand any of them is my point, I guess, except for Nettles and like, like even Daron. I thought, I remember Daron as being like a pretty good kid. No, he commits atrocities too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I said, that's why it's be a fan, not a stan, okay? That's like, it. <laughs> So let's, um, our four hour schedule is a little bit messed up, but let's do a little more House of the Dragon before we slide over to Winds of Winter because everything's going to be ice and fire after that. 
What are you looking forward to the most, Tim, on season two? Uh, I would say it's going to be the reaction to Lucerus's death when Eamon comes back and how he handles it. Because we've been discussing, is he going to own it and be like, how, how is he going to respond? Is he going to own it? Is he going to try and tell the truth? Or is it going to be a mix? Is he going to be like, it is is his uh his front face going to be like yeah i did it and he's gonna but in in behind closed doors it's actually going to be eating him up inside because just like you said like with uh with rainer uh, uh Vayman is killed because she lies and then she lies to cover her lies the same thing will happen with Amon and how potentially happen with Amon and how he approaches his explanation for what happened for what exactly happened to Luke and who he's going to confide the truth in as versus what he's going to present to Aegon. Cause if, if we look at the book, the line that Aegon gives is it's a good start. And Aemon might be like, okay, yeah, in front of you, I'm going to have to play up the role. Like I intentionally did it, but with people like Helena or Allison, will he be more, will he be more like no i actually didn't mean to do that it was a total accident i like that i tend to think that that's that's how i would play it um aegon loves it aegon thinks it's mm -hmm. great and aemon is like oh i i didn't think it was great um i'm kind of shaken up by it you know that would be interesting um and then of course Allison in the books is like oh my god what did you do so yeah that is going to be very interesting the diversity of opinion i i think Eamon will own it certainly publicly i said that right after the thing happened uh, i do think there will be a moment i would like to see it be him and Aegon. it could be him and helena when he confesses to someone that he lost control of nana vagar couldn't control mm. Couldn't, couldn't keep Nana down. Can't tell Nana what to do. So, yeah, I could see him telling that either to Aegon or maybe to Helena. I'm dying to see some... I mean, if Helena's not going to ride her dragon, then it's dialogue that she's, like... I, I, I've always pointed this out. It's like, Fire and Blood doesn't give us much dialogue. It gives us the main events mm -hmm. overview. So when it tells us, after Blood and Cheese, Helena's just, oh, well, she just... You know, she wouldn't leave her apartments and she's in mourning and stuff. Well, she's talking to people and still having dreams and prophecies and things. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what they do with Helena's. And I see a lot of people in the chat saying this, what they do with Helena in season two. Um, they've gotten their feet wet, you know, with Helena giving little short prophecies that seem to have to do with what happens in the next episode or two. Um, the beast beneath the boards obviously refers to Melly's, at least in part, literally beneath the boards. Okay. And literally a beast. It could have to do with blood and cheese if they come up from the floor as well. And I think that would be interesting if there's a double meaning to it, but yeah, like Helena's not just going to sit in a room and be quiet. Like the actress is, is talented and they are clearly into the prophecy angle. They're working with the song of ice and fire. Like, what kinds of things could Helena foresee or advise because of her visions? Like, is she going to try to mm -hmm. tell people to stop the war? Like, no, we shouldn't do this. We're going to lose all our dragons. We're going to, the house, this will lead to our doom. Will it be that kind of prophecy? Or will she have, a, like, before Aegon and Sunfire go to Rook's Rest, will she be like, no, you shouldn't go. I've seen you burned. Or it's something more cryptic, obviously. But yeah, I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to So what do you think about that? Yeah, because I think, like you said, with uh, with the Rainy, we already got one example with Rainies and Maylies popping up, but then there is Blood and Cheese, and then also potentially the events at Bitterbridge. I think the be the Beast Beneath the Board Lines is going to be like one of those, the gift that just keeps on giving because of how many events it could allude to, or the fact that it might actually be a combo and just actually alludes to all, is actually alluding to all of them in its own way. You're muted. Mute it. Barris Aurelius is saying perhaps Helena will predict uh, one of the uprisings. There's a couple of them in King's Landing. Mm -hmm. And there's also the prophet character, the shepherd, who is, seems to be, mm -hmm. I mean, he might just be a fanatic, but he, 
I wouldn't be surprised if he's somebody that has visions or dreams, and that's why he's, you know, touched a little bit. Um, yeah, so... The blood and cheese, I'm not looking forward to it. It's definitely going to be interesting to see how they do it. I think it's just going to be mad red wedding vibes. It's just going to be a horrific thing that everyone talks about. Oh, my God, that Game of Thrones show. You know, why do they keep doing horrible things? <laughs> <clears throat> welcome. You're welcome for the content, Bebop Bum. Oh, the cave paintings. Yeah, man, that was fun. See, now this show, if this show gave us diagrams of stars and black holes in a cave we would assume that it does have something to do with the main plot of ice and fire obviously i got very excited in season six when john and danny went in and saw the children of the forest carvings on dragon stone like i would love to know that there are children of the forest carvings in the caves on dragon stone there's no reason why there wouldn't be the hmm. children of the forest live in caves they used to inhabit all of westeros you know, yeah, can they get to islands? They're on the Isle of Faces, probably, you know. Yeah, talk about like just something that was built for nothing. Like the 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 symbol is like when the White Walkers were making those uh those elaborate symbols out of like the dead bodies, and it went absolutely nowhere because D D did not know how to write fantasy and did not know how to handle the white walker and children of the forest storylines just like they didn't know how to handle the dorn and iron island plots the spiral glyph was foreshadowing of the show going down the drain bud raven said <laughs> so yeah if this if something like that happens on house of the dragon we can take it more seriously because we know george and ryan condal work very closely as opposed to D and D stopped talking to George after season four. Mm -hmm. So and did their own thing. So by the time they were doing all those cave stuff, like that was nothing that they got from George almost certainly maybe, but seemingly not George has said many times that he bemoans the fact they didn't talk. They didn't consult him after season four. So mm -hmm. Ryan and George work very closely George is obviously very into House of the Dragon. So yeah, if we see, so like, for example, the Song of Ice and Fire, George told us before House of the Dragon that this was a thing for the books too, in preparation for it being a thing on House of the Dragon, we can say now. Um, okay. Someone in the chat said that uh, the shepherd is the natural enemy of Sheep Stealer. <laughs> but the shepherd... I don't know, the shepherds stay away. Like, Sheep Stealer gets the occasional sheep dog, but the shepherds seem like, well, I'm not, I'm not messing around with that. You can have them. <laughs> I do love how they included that detail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're like, yeah, Sheep Stealer, though, he doesn't eat the, sh he doesn't eat the shepherds. I was like, I have to assume that's because they don't try to fight the dragon with their shepherd staffs. <laughs> King David out there with a the sling. Trying to hit the dragon. That's not smart. All right. Yeah. I do imagine like the poor shepherd looking out, seeing his sheep getting getting eaten, and just, but then having to tell himself like, you don't need the money that bad. Just let him have it. <clears throat> All right. So what else are we looking for in House of the Dragon? Well, the claiming um, nettles and sheep stealer. I mean, mm -hmm. that's... That's who I'd be really excited about. <clears throat> yeah, because just to get the comp, I want it just for the confirmation. Because, like we said when we were talking, when we were reading the source material, I don't see how they could cast Ulf the White and Hugh Hammer and and the Hall Boys and not have Nettles. It seems like she has to be there, but without it, without any casting confirmation, she's just, the best like, dragon scene. Know. Yeah, <laughs> like. <laughs> Adam of Hole is pretty cool too, but like, yeah. Um, sheep Stealer, Nettles. So let's talk about Nettles and Sheep Stealer. This is something that I wanted to discuss this evening. Um, by the way, uh, Girl Nettles, who of course joined us uh, most of last season for the House of the Dragon postgame show, was going to be here tonight. Unfortunately, she is not feeling well. But the return of Nettles will happen soon. That's Girl Nettles, the YouTuber and funny person who is obviously 
the number one cosplayer of Nettles from the books in the fandom. So she'll be around soon. But yes, Nettles. So I watched, I rewatched Gray Area's Nettles video. Have you seen that, Tim? Um, it's like three I'm years sure ago. I'm sure I have. You probably have. Yeah, that I, that I saw it probably three years ago. So she basically is talking about all the different theories about Nettles and stuff. And the main thing mm -hmm. that's interesting, well, there's a couple things to discuss. First, how did she bond with the dragon and what is she doing? We've talked about that a bunch. Um, we know that she becomes the fire witch that begins the burned men clan in the mountains. That's pretty much spelled out by the maesters. There's a couple different witnesses to that tradition. So it's pretty clear that uh, Nettles and Sheep Stealer went and lived in the mountains in the Vale and be became worshipped, you know, as a witch. Uh, one of the things that Gray Area pointed out that was interesting is Rhaenyra accusing Nettles of being a sorceress, saying, oh, she has the stink of sorcery about her. And then later she's worshipped by the mountain clans. Now, she might just be worshipped because she controls the dragon. And you could be considered a sorceress for being able to control and ride a dragon that no one else can, certainly. But... Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, you know, not only does she feed the sheep to Sheep Stealer, the last time that her, when her and Damon part from Maidenpool, it says that she takes a black ram and slits mm -hmm. its throat and then feeds it to Sheep Stealer and she's covered in the ram's blood when she climbs on the dragon. And all of that sounds hella witchy, Tim. So mm -hmm. one wonders if... Uh, that she actually is performing sorcery. Like, if you take it all together, the fact she's worshipped as a witch later, it brings us back to the question of how is she controlling and bonding with Sheep Stealer. Now, my opinion is that she is a dragon seed. Not all dragon seeds have to look Valerian. That's just, you know, don't fall into the trap of skin tone prejudice and all that. Uh, and she's, there's lots of dragon seeds there, so there's no reason to think that she isn't. And as we've established, even if you have the right blood, the dragon can still reject you and eat you, as Quentin found out. So the theory that's interesting that I have always dismissed and that I maybe dismissed too quickly and want to entertain is the idea that she is Leaf. Now, the, one of the reasons that I didn't like that theory is because I just like the, ca the character of Nettles being just who she seems to be. Somebody from the streets who rides a dragon and then has that very important reaction after going into battle where Hugh Hammer and Ulf the White are like, yeah, this is awesome. And she's tears are coming down her face. She's horrified, just like you and I would be if we took a dragon and burned a bunch of people alive and listened to them scream and stuff. We'd come back home and be like, oh my God, what did I just do? And so Nettles has this very human reaction to the dragon warfare, which I think is super important, like per Martin's, the way that he handles war and violence, like he doesn't overly glorify it. So it's like if Nettles is a child of the forest, those reactions don't necessarily make sense to me. And also if the children of the forest rode a dragon, wouldn't they have had an agenda? Like all she does is go to war with the dragon for Team Black and then retire to the mountains. So I just feel like if the Children of the Forest went to all the effort to send one of their own in disguise to go out and live a fake life as Nettles, so they rode a dragon, like they didn't really do anything with the dragon once they got it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. What, what are your thoughts on that theory? See, the thing with that is, is like... The idea of Nettles being a child of the forest, like a full-on child of the forest, no, nah, I don't see it. Having blood of the children? Possibly. That's, that's a seed that we've seen planted with House Reed the, and the Cranog men. So, and, the, and we know that the children before the coming of the First Men and the coming of the Andals were all across Westeros. So if she were to have some kind of latent children of the forest blood along with Valyrian blood, the way the Starks have probably some kind of latent chip blood of the other, maybe. I think the more 
the bigger point though is the ambiguity like you said that when she slaughters the black ram and that has some very black goat of cohort feel to it and yes as people were say, people making your uh the vavitch references <clears throat> she does live deliciously um <laughs> It's it's but it's the ambiguity of what is causing this. Is it Valyrian blood? Is it Pavlovian training? Is it sorcery? Or is it all three? And then and the thing is is that when it comes to Valyrian blood, it doesn't need to be like full on pure stock Valyrian. And that's why we have our line with Brown Ben Plum in our main series. He has a drop or two of dragon blood uh-huh. from Aegon the Fourth. But Aegon the Fourth has been dead. Mm-hmm. For about 120 years so we're talking four or five generations down the line of that brown ben plum descends from aegon and yet the dragons still recognize it so it's like you don't need to have like be a full cup of valyrian blood you just need a drop and the dragons will recognize so that's all really that nettles needs that's why the ambiguity yeah. is there right and the targaryens have a lot less Valerian blood than you think. Um, you know, they're Ooh. constantly marrying outside the family. So really, somebody did the math on it. It's a low percentage, actually. Um, I will just say, as far as Quentin being definitely, definitely dead, Tim and I actually did a reread stream. Uh, we did a Quentin character stream where we basically, we read a lot of his chapters. And specifically, we read his death scene and the aftermath. Mm-hmm. Went through all the details um, I am very convinced that he's dead, and having gone back over it, I'm even more convinced. So if you want to see the arguments about that, we did entertain the idea. You can, And I'm talking to the person in the chat. I forget who that was. It was asking about Quentin. Uh, it was a super chat. Let me, let me scroll back and give some respect. Bebop the Bum. Nice handle. Um, yes, I don't think he's alive. And we went through the whole scene very carefully. And I, all the arguments are there on that stream. You won't like the answer because I don't think he's alive, but I'm not saying that casually. We did go there mm-hmm. and he got burned and pretty sure that's what happened. But yeah, there it is. This is going back to what I said about having mm-hmm. the key, but that not necessarily allowing you in. Quentin has Targaryen blood. Going back to the first, Dana- going back to the first Daenerys, they are on the good sister. His Great grandmother, I believe, if I'm getting the exact. It, yeah. Anyway, he has Valyrian blood, so that gives him the in. But that doesn't gar. But as we've seen, that doesn't guarantee it because we'll also get another example of this, which is Silver Dennis. Silver Dennis is a potential dragon seed, and he gets torn apart by Sheep Stealer and the Cannibal. So that's why Nettles has this. On top of the Valyrian blood that makes her a dragon seed, she also has this Pavlovian dragon training. She's going to sheep steal her day after day after day with a sheep until he gets used to her. Because having Valyrian blood isn't enough. There needs to be more. I mean, even the, we see even with the princes and the dragon tamers, like, Aemon doesn't have a dragon in the beginning. He's, he's just as targ as anyone else. <laughs> The strong boys have dragons, but he doesn't. And that's just because, like, just having the blood is not an automatic win. Like, there, ne- you need to do more to foster the bond, to foster the connection. Quentin tried to do it in 15 minutes. So, yeah, let me, um, let me give a couple shout-outs real quick. Whew, that was a good one. Um, so, first of all, I want to thank everyone in the chat that has been recommending to me the channel Quinn the GM um not a huge channel but a fast growing channel that a lot of people have heard of I finally got around to checking out their channel it's very good Uh, I watched three or four of their videos love his style I sent him a message and invited him to come on uh I invited him on tonight like super last minute but he had already had plans however main point is that uh, he is a fan of the show and will be coming on Sometime soon. So you can look forward to that. Quinn the GM did a cool stream where he went through a draft. Uh, the, the, uh, there's an outline from 2003 of George Martin's that got discovered or something like a month ago. And it had some, it, it's, it's, not, it's basically like 
very brief notes of what A Feast for Crows was going to be before it got split. Mm -hmm. But after the time gap was scrapped, they think. And it's basically like there's a name of a character and like very brief note. I mean, Martin's making the briefest notes, three word sentences about each like chapter and what he's planning on doing. <clears throat> now, it seems from those notes to me that the purpose of Quentin's plot is to loose the dragons. Like he came all the way. If you're looking at from Martin's point of view, breaking the fourth wall and thinking like the writer, what are these characters, characters in the book? Just to let you know, like the reason why Martin chooses a character, um, uh, you know, to have a character like Quentin become a POV or not is if they, or Barristan is a good example. Like sometimes he needs a window into a scene. And if there's not one of our main characters in a scene, he's got to have a character to give us a view on something. For example, um, <clears throat> uh, Darkstar and uh, Ario Hota. You know, Ario Hota was essentially a POV that Martin invented so that we could see what's going on with Dorne. And we may or may not get uh, a perspective on uh, who are the ones going to catch Darkstar? Obara and Ario. Obara. And Aria Hota. Oh, we have. Oh, right, Aria Hota. So we will get Aria Hota's POV to go see what happens there. We're gonna beard Darkstar. They're gonna go give him a beard trim, We're bringing him an electric razor. We're gonna trim that. Actually, no, he's clean shaven. Oh, they got to put a beard yeah. on him because he doesn't have a beard. Okay. <laughs> um, big wizard with a big fat PayPal or super chat. Thank you. You give me much more oh, than damn. this amount of entertainment this year. You're quite welcome. We love what we do. <clears throat> Especially the Dunkin' Egg streams. You know, if I would just take a minute and reflect on the year. The Dunkin' Egg streams, Tim. Oh, that's probably the most was. fun I had on this YouTube channel all year. We did a lot of fun stuff. I really enjoyed the Ironborn research. That was a big highlight. Mm -hmm. Discovering the Reaper culture. But nah, dude. Discovering that you are a vocal actor extraordinaire. Doing all the voices. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that was that's yeah, as much like, fun as I've ever had on this channel. It really is. Yeah, like <laughs> reading Fire and Blood is fun, but you don't get to break out the voices like you do with Duncan Egg, which is very dialogue driven. Yeah, and it was fun to do the same, you know, characters on consecutive weeks. The Maynard Plum, yes, I. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Maynard Plum. I was just. Yeah. I've never had more fun doing a voice. So, I also think because the the Duncan Egg stuff is when you probably also noticed how how committed to the bit I will be when it came to things like the empty beer bottles because I was giving because uh, I was doing a Warriors reference with Arion the 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 stuffed crow I had for the Blood Raven chapters like if I come up with a with an idea I, I stick with it just like tonight the 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 drink setup indeed indeed Tim. Um... Yeah, well, like I said, you 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 brought it in every sense. It, <laughs> yeah, everyone like the, the set, the fire and brimstone, like a uh, Southern Baptist Septon voice. That was yep. Oh, uh, and who could forget um, Uthor Underleaf? <laughs> How did you do Uthor Underleaf? <laughs> the Frenchman. None, <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Okay, that was worth a minute to reflect. It is New Year's, so it's time for that. Oh, oh. I hope okay. we get a fourth Duncan Egg story just so we can read it. I know. I'm <laughs> I'm sad there aren't more. I'm like, can we read them again? Or like we really well, we read them slow, man. We did symbolism, we did character. I mean, we couldn't we if, really did take our time to chew it up. If we're getting a Duncan Egg show, if that's really in the works and we're gonna get it, then then we can we can go back. We can go back. Maybe we can pick a character and do their read a few of their chapters in a row, so we can get some voices going. Like Jamie, Jamie's <laughs> Jamie's chapters in Feast are just full of so much sarcasm. there would be a lot of fun to read, but um, we need to read. The one where he fights Brienne in the stream, really bad. 
The symbolism in mm-hmm. that is off the charts, and we haven't been there in a few years. Um, also, the one with Jamie, um, and he's with somebody that blows the horn of Herrick when they go to Harrenhal. Yeah, isn't that also the one where he's like trying to foster peace with the Blackwoods and the Brackens, and yes. gets like that real bookish Blackwood kid? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's some good shit there for sure. All right. Um, okay. So yeah, Jamie's. We need to read some Jamie chapters. That's high on the list. Ilona Dracula. Absolutely. It needs to happen. Um, so, okay. So, last House of the Dragon. Let's actually get into Winds of Winter. We'll, we'll come back to some House of the Dragon stuff, I'm sure. But, Winds of Winter predictions. Okay. So, you mentioned Edric Storm. Edric Storm mm-hmm. is a character that I have not talked about on any Winds of Winter predictions. So, you're saying that there's a theory that he's going to get scooped up by the Golden Company? Is that what you were saying? Yes. And this goes back to the idea of Fagon and his building this entourage of pretenders and fakes. Right. Because the, right. Golden, because the Golden Company are pretenders and fakes. They claim to be Lostons. They claim to be Muds. They claim to be all of these extinct Westerosi houses. Because anyone in the Free Companies is allowed to choose their own name. Now, there's there's the potential that they're telling the truth, but more likely they're picking these names because they want to they wanna try and stake a claim when they get over to Westeros. And something you notice with the Golden Company is nobody's ever claiming to be a Lannister or a Stark or a Tyrell. Nobody's ever claiming to be from a big house. So I think they're claiming... Because claiming to be from an extinct house or at least a small house makes it a lot less likely. There's less chance to prove you wrong. And we've talked about how Darkstar is possibly going to join Fagon as as a Kingsguard member, his his fake Arthur Dane. Because Fagon, if he really wants to build up this presence as the son of Rhaegar and and commit to the bit to make himself look legitimate then having symbols is going to be great. That's why him having the sword Blackfire would be so important. That's why right. if Aegon the Conqueror's crown resurfaces, it's going to be so important. Well, the oh, same and who's thing the Lannister be- that's disappeared? Tyrek? Right, and the theory is that Varys has squirreled him away to be mm-hmm. a replacement Lannister when they are launching the Fagon Revolution. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. So this this would be more of that. This would be their Baratheon. So this this that actually lends credence to the theory. Because yeah, if it could be that Varys and and Illyrio are collecting new mm-hmm. lords in to replace some of them. So I'll carry on. That would be the, that would be yeah. what they were doing with Edric. Yeah. So Dark. So like I said. So Dark Star would be his fake Arthur Dane. Edric Storm, and that that's his Rhaegar connection. Edric Storm is like his Oris Baratheon to his namesake, Aegon the Conqueror. Also, bringing Edric Storm would be like a reconciliation between the Targaryens and the Baratheons, settling the beef between Rhaegar and Bobby B. And they have said they're going to take Storm's end by guile, by trickery. And if we remember uh, going back to... they're going to hand it to Edric. Oh, that makes so much sense. It's just a kind of fake piece... That Varys loves yeah. too. Be like, oh, we're healing the Baratheon Targaryen rift with two Fakos. Go ahead. And also because if you go back to the second Shadow Baby, the first Shadow Baby kills Renly. The second one is sent there to kill Courtney Penrose. Why? Because Courtney Penrose refuses to give up Edric Storm. So if Edric Storm comes back to Storm's End, the Castle Garrison is probably going to hand it to him because they love that kid. Oh, and Courtney Penrose died for him. Yeah. True. True. I love that theory. This makes... Okay, another parallel is uh, Aegon the Younger and Viserys, Rhaenyra and Daemon's children, being sent on a boat to Pentos and being intercepted by the th- th- people from the Three Sisters coming to Westeros, right? Mm -hmm. so that would not be unlike Gendry and his rowboat getting picked up by the Golden Company. Yeah, because uh, 
Yeah, because when we go back to the show, Gendry and Edric Storm's storylines kind of mesh. Because that's what that's what they did. They took they multiple multiple storylines were interwoven into one character. That's why Danny's burning of King's Landing ugh, is probably though is probably a John Con plot line more than anything. Yeah, and just real quick, I want to tell you guys that um Tim and I in January are gonna do a whole Winds of Winter stream for King's Landing. Uh, there is so much going on in King's Landing that we need to put it up on a board and like outline. We didn't even talk about the High Sparrow, Tim, when we were outlining mm -hmm. everything. There's Sand Snakes, Fagon, Cersei, John Con, the High the High Sparrow, Varys and Illyrio. Um, yeah, there's yeah. a lot going on in King's Landing, and so yeah, we we're gonna do a whole stream just to preview. King's Landing and Winds of Winter. Um, yeah. So, however, I yes, this I, we should do like this. Varys. Th this is like I want to think about more now. Some people have said Orain Waters could appear mm -hmm. as his, you know, master of ships, fake yeah, Valarion, kind of. Yeah. Um, who else yeah. could they? That's be? why I want to. That's why I want to uh, clarify. So, because Marsha Agdom, you're asking the Golden Company has Edric. We don't know. That's what I was saying. So, so what I had said about an hour ago when you wanted me to put a pen in this is there is a line uh, in the Winds of Winter sample chapters that part of the fleet carrying the Golden Company is scattered by a storm and lease. That's why when they get to storms and they take when they take Griffin's Roost, not all the Golden Company is there. Some people got left behind. Right now, this could mean two things. This could mean literally storms happened and the fleet that was carrying these golden company members sunk or it's a symbolic side it's a symbolic line meaning they made a pit stop and lease to pick up edric storm because after everything goes down with courtney penrose davos smuggles edric storm to lease and that's where he is St edric storm has been in a safe house in lease so that line scattered by storm and lease could meet could potentially mean stopping to pick up Edric Storm. So hold on. So who are the people that are trying to outwit Varys and Illyria's network of informants? You said Davos and Stannis? No, no, no. So Stannis wanted to... Oh, no, it wasn't. It was, okay. It was Davos yeah. and like three other people that smuggled Edric Storm. Yeah, yeah. So... Right. There, there's potential that though that Davos and his co-conspirators might be working with when they get over to the free cities that they might have connection. They potentially that opens up connections with Varys and Illyrio to get this all to get all this into the plan. And also keep in mind too, uh, Edric Storm's birthday presents. They were always sent by the 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 the, the Warhammer he got all the things oh, duh. when he would write when he would write letters back to Robert duh. and Robert would say would laugh and say Varys what did you send him this oh. year Varys no Varys is very knowledgeable about the existence of Edric Storm so working him in as a chess piece would be a natural thing for Varys to do yeah I. I... I would say it's it's a trap. Well done, Long the Lunk. Well played. It's a that's right. I would guess that it's more likely than not. Even if Varys and Illyrio didn't know about Edric Storm going to lease until he got there, it would only be days before they figured that out. Like you can't yeah. just take yeah. someone like that. They yeah, they know everything that goes on. They're as well connected as anybody in the world. I mean, they've got Westeros and the Eastern Seaboard of the Western Seaboard of Essos on lockdown. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I love who's. So, do you know where this theory came from originally? Is there a credit that we can give someone? I'm not sure because it's been it's something I've heard. It's one of those things that like I've heard heard bits and pieces from, and then just kind of as I look more about, it, just start to fit, fit more of the pieces together. But I'm not sure where I can exactly give a source to. Because Edric Storm is just this character. It's like, okay, why is he in the story? Besides the mm -hmm. moral quandary of Davos and Stannis and should we burn children or not? Is that good? Um, mm -hmm. In the context of, you know, Azor Ahai and Nissa and Lightbringer. But that could have been anybody. 
So yeah, where is mm. Edric's like? What's why? Why? Why do we have this big eared Florent, you know, kid mm. running around, likable? Shireen liked him. He was nice to Shireen, so we gotta like him. You know, that actually does mean a lot. Like Shireen is visibly scarred in a way that a lot of people have stigmas against. And Edric Storm mm. was her friend, so good kid. Yeah, gotta think. So that's the thing. Because, like, just how you brought up Gray Area's video about nettles from three years ago. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you read something or you hear something, and it could be four or five years back, but then over time, you come back to that rabbit hole, and then you find another tunnel, and you just start digging more, and you start making your own connections. And that's just how these ideas build. What's up, Swagger Dagger? Good to see you, buddy. So, yeah, I love this. I love this. And now I want to see if there's any others that we can figure out. Like, who else will he produce? Because that, that's the thing about having 12 years to think on these things, is these ideas formulate over, and, they, and they've, give, they've been given so much time to breed and grow that you just, but over time, but you also just lose track of where you orig, of where the origin came from. It's that's why beautiful. it's like, George, you need to, Sorry, go ahead. Finish your sentence. I was going to say, like, that's like, George, like, if, if, if you're worried, I mean, I know he's not going to do it. Like, he's he's even said himself, like, you can't rewrite a story just to subvert expectations. If everything has been leading up to the butler did it, then you have to commit to it. You can't just change it at the last second because somebody figured out where you're going to go. But at the same time, it's like, but George, the more time you spend not putting out the book, the more time we have to make guesses, to make the correct guesses and figure out where you're going. Especially, too, when you got, like, People like you and me and everyone, other people in the Song of Ice and Fire community that are also following your trail of breadcrumbs, looking at the mythology and the other sto and the stories and the history you drew on. We can really start making educated guesses. It's going to be hard to subvert some of these expectations. Yeah, well, somebody's got it right somewhere, right? Um, so a mm -hmm. couple of super chats real quick. Um, uh, thank you from Roaring Moonbeam, Squisher. Thank you. Thank you, Squisher. Uh, and then Dragon Seed. It drives me crazy trying to figure out who can ride a dragon. Nettles is one, but not the golden standard. Nettles is one what? Um, what was the question here? I did have a point I want to bring up about Nettles. Uh, but Dragon Seed, if you want to leave a chat and clarify the question, what specifically you're trying to get. Well, I guess you're just... <laughs> no, I feel you. But let me, yeah, let me come back to Nettles. And then also Kat says, thoughts on how Shireen will be safe and happy and nothing bad will ever happen to her. <laughs> Never going to happen. Um, I have, okay, I have something for you in a second. Let me go back to the regular chat. And so, okay, so but, um, a couple I'm things. I'm sorry, First, but. What's that? I was going to say, I'm sorry, but Stannis is bogged down by the storm. And according to Melisandre, the only way to fix that is child murder. Well, it's not going to happen exactly the same as on the show because Stannis is stuck in a storm, but Mel and Shireen and Selyse are at the wall. So that's going to be a little different. But, well, okay, let me come back to that in a second. So look, I am wrong. Kelly Johnson, you are right. Kelly Johnson has pointed out that the children of the forest on the Isle of Faces use storms to keep people away from the island. Mm -hmm. And that, we don't know that that's true, but it probably is because it's similar to Avalon and other such islands and how they got to use magic somehow to keep people away, right? So, yes, I well, guess that is suggestive uh, of the Green Seers potentially being able to manipulate the wind which, like I said, the Green Seers potentially, if they're manipulating any part of nature, we're going to be like, yeah, sure, why not, right? So there well, you go. Sometimes it's, Maybe sometimes Blood Raven killed them with the storm, but I think Tim made the better point. They did find a bride, so what's the point of sinking their ship? Yeah. Well, with, with the Owl Faces, sometimes it's storms that keep them away, sometimes it's winds, and sometimes it's a flock of like a, a murder of very pissed off ravens that chase people away. So it varies on how people are pushed back from the Isle of Faces. 
I love, okay, so uh, first of all, A Theory of Ice and Fire, shout out. Thanks for, thanks for livening up the Discord with some new ideas and stuff to talk about. I really appreciate you. And by the way, I put out the new, new Discord link for this week on Patreon. And if you click the Members tab on YouTube, if you're a channel member, then you can get that uh, Discord link. Um, but yeah, Theory of Ice and Fire. I have never heard anyone suggest that Jaken is a Targaryen and ahead of the dragon. You are very convinced of that. I have not taken a look at the theory. It seems far-fetched at first, but it could just be because everyone missed it. I don't know. But look, man, if that one, if you get that one, then uh, we'll have to tip our cap to you for sure. But yeah, I just mm. did want to thank you and give you a shout out for, um, and th that's one of the reasons I made the Discord. Like, put your theories there. We've got separate categories for, you know, House of the Dragon and Song of Ice and Fire and all that stuff. So, yeah, man. Mm -hmm. Teflon TV. I, mean, can... I can't use a green screen. Um, I Okay, so I did invite oh, the, Tony to drop in. in What's that? The Don is in the chat? He's in the chat. That's how he He's is in that the chat. Tony and I invited him to drop in if he, um, if he had wanted to. So I wasn't sure if... What do you mean you can't use a green screen? We get you always usually you don't usually use a green screen. We usually uh, come to us live in front of your fabulous collection of alcoholic beverages for your background. Yeah. Oh, so nah, you can keep it real, man. I was gonna say like. If we're talking wins, we could have talked Jock at uh, Jock and Agar. But while, but for Tony here, uh, I do want to bring up Tony had a theory that I really liked uh, regarding Victarion and Barristan and how Sir Barristan might die. This what this is one I, I first heard from Tony Teflon. I really liked about Victarion possibly fighting Barristan because Victarion okay. wants to cross the big name off his bucket list. Yes, I remember that. But let's let's see if Tony jumps in and we'll bring that on when he gets here. But real quick, going back to the Nettles thing, I really think the key to Nettles is that riding a dragon is a two-part process. One, you got to have the blood, but two, it's still a big, scary beast. And Sheep Stealer and Cannibal, like the dragon tamers from that, that their job is to control dragons, they couldn't tame these dragons. So these dragons are very wild and ferocious. So the sheep is what Nettles used to make friends with the dragon so that she could get close enough for her blood to do the work of, of creating the bond. That, that is how I see it. Um, but it could be that she is recreating the dragon bond from scratch and that she is not blood of the dragon and that she is doing blood magic with the sacrifice of the sheep and something else that we don't understand because it's not witnessed, you know, um, mm -hmm. maybe she sacrificed another human being or maybe it's a prayer or a spell. We don't know. Um, but I do think that George is giving us clues about, and there's three minutes till the next new year, uh, central time new year. Um, I do think that George is giving us clues about how it was done originally with the Valerians, okay? Like, mm -hmm. the dragons probably go back to the Great Empire of the Dawn and such. But at some point, people from the Great Empire of the Dawn move to Valeria. Maybe it happens when the Empire is falling apart. Maybe before there's a colony. The most likely scenario is there's colonies first, the Empire collapses, and then the escapees flee to the colonies, like Old Town or whatever. But at some point, we've got these wild dragons uh, on, you know, hanging out in the volcanoes. And the Valerians have the ability, the know-how to tame them. But how do you get close to them? Well, there are some clues that the Valerians might have been shepherds. I thought it was a fact. It's not a fact. It's a theory uh, based on some various clues. But it could be that Nettles is showing us how the Valerians approached these dragons to create, to do the original mm -hmm. spells. Cause it's like, oh, well, I'm saying you got to kill a Valerian ancestor and stuff them into the dragon. I, 
you probably need to be close to the dragon while you're doing that. You need it to cooperate in the spell somehow. How do you, you got to pet it on the head? I don't know. Paint paint your blood markings on its forehead so you could dive in there. We don't know, but presumably you need to make friends with the dragon to even create the dragon bond to begin with. And you would do that the way you would tame any wild animal. So I don't think the point of the sheep is to show us that nettles isn't a dragon seed. It's rather to show us the other part of the process. That is my take. It is, yeah. you know, but. Yeah, again, the the blood only gets you into the door. It gets you into the interview, but there's more. You need, you need, that, get, that gets you, that gets your foot in. But then you got to make friends with the dragon, feed the dragon, pet the dragon, bond with the dragon, and then possibly incorporate some sorcery. It's probably you got to tick all the boxes to get this dragon bond going. I think that's what we're what we're supposed to be, like make of it. Yeah, and and so I guess we could also consider like what Danny did um, yes, to wake these the dragons because she's pet. sort of she's a Targaryen, and those eggs are like Targaryen dragon eggs. So she doesn't need to like do a fresh ancestor bond, but maybe you've got to awaken it with some you know, some blood sacrifice sort of reinvigorated. So we got, um, yeah, sure. just no about there, I guess your alarm's going to go off, but so your drink mm -hmm. for this hour does not come from central time zone America. Is that correct? No, it comes from, there we go. Do, 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 do. All right. Happy new year, Chicago. We are central time. New year. Now next beer. So shout out to Alona Dracula in the chat and anybody else coming to us um, from around the world, other places. But yes, this one, I don't know where Modelo's made it. Now you're, we, yeah. so you, this is Modelo Especial. It is brewed in Nava, Mexico, and it is imported by Crown Imports in Chicago, Illinois, both uh, of which count. Oh. But the point is, the point is, I was getting that I was tell what I was telling Dave when I was out shop when I was sh when I got to this bit, I could not I could not find a beer from a central state that was going to be enjoyable. Now I'm willing to give the benefit of the doubt. I'm willing to give the benefit of the doubt. I'm on the Milwaukee's East Coast best, America. Tim. I'm on Milwaukee Beck. That's non alcoholic. No, Milwaukee's <laughs> best. <laughs> Beware the Milwaukee's best beneath best. the boards. That's what, was, that's what I was getting at. Maybe it's because I'm on the East Coast. I'm just limited in my choices. Obviously, they're going to be pushing more local and East Coast breweries my way. But all I could find was either Bex, which is non-alcoholic, Paps Blue Ribbon out of San Antonio, but I'm not a frat boy, and Miller High Life out of Milwaukee. So I went with Modelo from Mexico. So sorry, Central United States. <laughs> I so, just couldn't bring myself to drink that swill. No, that's dope. We 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 dig it. I mean, look, mankind does things like calls sheep hunting stealing and calls makes a border and says one country is this and one country is that, but it's all one land. So, um, uh, let's see here. Uh, two things. So the point of nettles to go back to the nettles shot of the forest theory because I forgot a couple things. The main clues about it are that her name, Nettles, um, both wildlings, it's really, okay, so it's really wildlings that are named after plants, not children of the forest. Children of the forest, the, the nicknames that they have, Snowy Locks and all that, it's Bran and Mira and Jojen that make up those names. Those aren't their names. Okay. So um, their name is something in the true tongue. <laughs> like, um, but Nettles is a wildling name and the wildlings are very much analogous to the children of the forest such as Mance Raider's six spear wives and the six uh children of the forest in Brand's cave being very much analogous um so Nettles lives in a cave she has a wildling type name the children of the forest live in caves um and then it ties into the Damon theory it does because her and Damon are definitely lovers it's not Damon's daughter the big clue about that is that when Sheep Stealer and Nettles flew off from Maidenpool. Caraxes gave a cry that shattered every window in the castle. So 
just as Jaharis and Alisan's love translated to Silverwing and Vermithor, who then coupled us dragons, um, you know, coiling around each other and mourning Silverwing, mourn Vermithor's death, and not spoiler, spoiler. Um, so it, you know, Sheepstealer giving that, I mean, Caraxes giving that cry when Sheepstealer flew away. That tells me uh, Damon and Nettles were lovers, and that seems to make more sense for the character. You know, like, Nettles is everything that Damon loves. You know, too young, okay, <laughs> just to say it. But more importantly, has this raw connection to the dragons. Like, she did it the hard way. She did it the old way. This would be very interesting to Damon. Again, just setting the age thing aside. Um, like, this is very compelling. She is someone who mastered a dragon on her own. Like, yes, I could see Damon taking on the sort of, you know, uh, it's a romantic relationship, but it's one where he's the older person and he's like, you know, teaching her and instructing her, like it says in Fire. Some of that is very... It's so maesterly patriarchal and biasy. It's hard to like, oh, we taught her how to bathe and this and that. Like, uh, who knows? But it definitely seems like a romantic relationship. The point is, Damon, when he dies over the over the God's eye, his body's never found. So, I don't think that's anything. But Gray Area does. Gray Area thinks that Damon actually became a three eyed raven before. Blood Raven. Um, and so the idea is that if Nettles is a child of the forest, now we have a reason for her to be a child of the forest. She has come and recruited Damon, essentially. And Rhaenyra is like, oh, Damon fell in love with her because of her spells. What if there's like a little bit of truth to that? What if like part of the purpose of child of the forest Nettles is, you know, to recruit Damon. Because the obvious idea with Damon, if he survived, it's like, oh, some people think he reconnected with, he rejoined Nettles and they lived somewhere happily ever after. Well, it doesn't seem to be the case because Nettles became the Fire Witch. But yeah, what if, what if he survived on the Isle of Faces and what if, yeah, that that's kind of, somebody in the, com, uh, Alona Dracula in the chat was saying, maybe the point of the Nettles theory is people that like the idea that Damon's on the Isle of Faces. And yes, those do kind of go together. I don't know if I buy any of that. I still consider it to be less likely to be true than, than more likely. Um, I don't think there's any clues that Damon's a green seer. I think his, his life of violence and murder should end in mutual annihilation of hate with Aemon. Like that makes perfect sense as a finish to his arc. I don't think he really deserves or needs that second act however um it's a little more there's a little more there than i uh thought so i don't want to dismiss it i will honor that as possible you're you're what's what would you rate it um the, the two parts nettles being a child of the nettles being lee specifically and then damon surviving and that being you know 7.8 too much water um yeah because <laughs> the thing with it is Okay, the the Damon Nettles relationship. Again, it's one of those ambiguous things. Is it a ro romantic relationship? There are some who think that Nettles might be a bastard daughter of Damon's. Then there's always just the no. It's just a simple master mentor relationship, and it's so ambiguous because it can go one of any ways. And especially when you're considering these are tar Targaryens and the incest is wincest mentality, it really could go any any possible direction. But as for the idea of Damon surviving the battle of the God's Eye. Yeah, that like one I don't Tim, like. I just remembered, I remember like he, he makes like 13 cuts in the Weirwood tree while he's waiting for Aemond. Mm -hmm. Is is that actually a magical act that he learned from Nettles? Child of the Forest? Yeah, it's I mean it's possible. Anything's Just possible with but these are one of those things where it's like there's so little information that like I feel like some people are building some very sturdy buildings on some very shaky foundation with some of those theories. Well the key here it's is like that we I'm sorry, yeah. just real quick. The key is that these are all the Maester accounts. So when the Maesters mm -hmm. 
they don't believe in magic. So they're just like, oh yeah, she cut the ram's throat and then she was all covered in blood. They're not seeing it for a magical ritual. So it's the ideas we're supposed to look at the like, oh, Damon, you know, he was just counting the days. So he put one slash in the tree and then it says, oh, but every spring they bleed fresh. It's like, why was it the weirwood tree that he was carving? It's just because he's an asshole and he picked the most sacred tree to make day marker cuts in. But again, if mm-hmm. if there's a shot of the forest connection to all this, then maybe that's something magical that he's doing by carving the tree. I don't know. Yeah. Again, like I said, it's possible. We've seen that Damon is definitely interested in the arcane and the occult. Like, that's why the show has had him reading books in the libraries while he's in Pentos. So if 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 uh, if Nettles is providing him with some kind of, like, children lore, that's something he's going to be interested in. It'd be the same reason why I would see, like, Duncan, Prince of Dragonflies, falling in love with someone like Jenny of Old Stones. Because she's probably doing the same type of thing in, in, the, in the Duncan Egg days. But at the same time, it's like we don't need every person who supposedly died just because their body wasn't found. That means they're secretly alive. The idea of Damon surviving, it's also right up there with the idea that Luke survived and got amnesia and lived out the rest of his life as a fisherman. Because that's another maester account in Fire and Blood. Not everything I do love that's that. Floated- yeah, but not that just goes to show, though, though not everything in Fire and Blood has credence. Like... Sometimes, sometimes, George, like, yes, George is For throwing sure. in things that we're supposed to think about, but he's also, that doesn't mean he's not throwing in the occasional misdirection that means absolutely nothing. That's what I see with the Luke thing, at least. Now, with Damon and Nettles, like, yeah, it's, it, it could go any, any possible direction. Um, I think, if you were to ask me, I think they were lovers. I won't discount the idea that maybe Nettles is one of Damon's bastards. Like, I'm sure he's had, I'm sure he's got a number of them running around. So it's not something I'm going to throw out. But I think the idea that they were lovers and that Ray Nero was at least a little bit, uh, in her, a, 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 little, a, little, a little bit right in her jealousy, you know, to yeah. think that. But, but at the same time, though, but, more I see it's 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 also showing though Rainera's hypocrisy is the big thing of calling Nettles a bastard when she herself had three bastards and was trying to put them That's on the, the main throne. part, yeah. And I think Mysaria yeah. knows what's up too. Like Mysaria uses the truth in cruel ways. Mm-hmm. She's not just making shit up. She has an information network. So she heard about Nettles and Damon. She knows that they're sleeping together. That's that's solid mm-hmm. information, I think. So um yeah. No, but I think Damon. I think Damon went out like a boss on the God's Eye, and that's where his story ends. Well, I okay. So Barris Aurelius <laughs> says, "How about this? Damon survived, but then was sacrificed to the old gods by the Green Men. Like, can you imagine his broken body? He's like crawling out of the shore, and the, he sees these weird pan figures come out of the woods, and he's like, ah, oh, save me! And they're like, <sighs> they just like." They drag him up to the weirwood and just. I hate it. I hate it. I'm done. I hate it. I'm I'm done. Out of here. (laughs) (laughs) Quit. That's funny. Did uh? I guess Tony's not gonna drop in. I didn't see him. Oh, Oh, we said he's gonna get some stuff ready. Okay. He's taking a sweet time, probably. Uh, the super chat. Let's go back. I totally did. Thanks for reminding me. With this new function, it's easy. I never actually miss him. I can always go back. Ramsey. Oh yeah, no, I didn't miss that. I was just, <clears throat> I was just waiting. I was just queuing that up. That's it's a monster question. So Ramsey is my favorite villain of all time. What do you think George got right about his portrayal from a writing perspective? I appreciate the the, the qualifier there. Um, okay, so this is a great question. Oh, just one last thought on Damon. The other reason why the theory is a little bit compelling is because I really do feel like. Somewhere there has to be a clue about who was the last three-eyed crow. I do believe there's always a three-eyed crow. If Blood Raven is holding on for Bran to get there, that means that they need to pass it off. So mm-hmm. it's always bugged me that we have no idea who the previous three-eyed ravens were. None. There's Lord Caswell, you know, like 
Lord Commander <laughs> Cas. I mean, there's there's really no clues that I've ever seen anyone produce about it. So at least this is yeah. a theory about someone. I just don't see any clues that Damon's a green seer, and I don't like making people green seers when they're Targaryens. With I think Gray was saying, well, he's got connections to House Massey if you go back a couple generations or something, but House Massey's not really. I mean, their sigil is yeah. suggestive, but I, you know, like Damon, it's, it's, Damon's the type of guy who's he's not a green seer, but if he met one, he would be like, "Tell me everything. I want to know all about it." Like yeah, that—that—that's that's his character. Maybe they fed him some Jojen brains. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ramsey Bolton. There's a few things that George gets right. Um, Oh, yes, Alice Westhill. Let me, uh, one second for Ramsey. There's a Damon follow-up here in the PayPal. So first of all, thank you, Helen, for no question, just a contribution. But yeah, let me get this. When I imagine the future fight above the God's Eye in the show, I envision Caraxes wrapping around, ooh, this is kind of sexy, wrapping and winding his long body around Vagar to prevent her from flying. And this is how he ultimately brings her down and gets Damon close enough for his leap. That actually does make sense, um, because it's always been a little, okay, George, sure, yeah, Damon leapt in the midair from one dragon. I mean, it's the coolest thing, it's the most badass thing that anyone's ever done in the story, <laughs> like action hero-wise. But yes, now that we've seen that Caraxes is wormy, and that makes sense, the name Bloodworm suggests the, the, the book Carax, it's probably how George is imagining him. So yeah, that's probably right. It's, it says that um, Vagar bites Caraxes' wing and Caraxes bites Vagar's neck. But yeah, I would imagine there's also... So when you, see, when you think about one biting the other's neck, that puts the two heads close to each other and locked together, stationary. So yeah. Anyway, I suspect the mystery of the details of that fight have informed Caraxes delightfully noodly design from the beginning. Yeah. I think that makes sense. That's yeah. That's like a great way to do it. You know, if I was doing the show, that's probably how I would imagine it going as a technique. Yeah. Cause, cause Damon, Damon and Caraxes are of one mind. We saw that in the step stones. Like when Damon takes the arrow wound, Caraxes screams and turns in the direction that the arrow came from. Uh, Damon raises his arm and Caraxes raises his, his wing. So they are like really connected. Okay. So if Damon is going into that fight with the intention of killing Amond and not necessarily even surviving, just I'm going to take him down at all cost, then Caraxes doing the same thing, wrapping up Vagar in a death lock so that they just all fall, like kind of makes sense. I like it. Happy New Year, Dave and Tim. So what do you think, Tim? You like it? Oh, yeah, your theory? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm very... I mean, it's probably not going to be the, like, season three that we're going to get that fight, but I would yeah. be interested in seeing how they're going to they're gonna film that one. Three or four, one or the other. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so Ramsey... Well, I'll give it to you first, Tim. I have a lot of thoughts on Ramsey, and I feel like I'm going to talk for five minutes, so... What do you like about, since we just talked about Damon and villains and we've already set the stage for, we're not justifying, but admiring, you know, he's because he is a great villain. I mean, he's freaking terrifying. There's no doubt in the show yeah. and the books. I mean, he's terrifying. Um, and shout out to uh, Ewan Rian. Is that the actor? I'm so bad with actor names. What was his? Ewan? He's very good. He's very, I mean, he's perfect Ramsey. Oh my God. Even when they did, they gave him corny things to do, like waving the sausage. He's still like, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll leave it to chat to figure out actor names. Yeah, they'll terrible. get, they'll get the act. Yeah, that's his name. Ewan Rian. Okay. So yeah. What, what do you like about the villain? And then I will, I'll take a heck at it. Okay. Um, so Ramp, what do I like about Ramsey? Well, Ramsey. I do. Ramstein. He he he's he's just so putrid. He really is. That's um, a good word. 
he's so putrid. Yeah, Ramsey's there as like he's like the anti John. He really he really is. Um, which is yeah, the uh, rejection, the rejection of the bastard trying to fit the mold of what a Bolton should be. Like he's he would not like what Tyrion says to John about like own it, wear it like like own it bastard wear it like a name like ramsey's like no i'm i'm true born i true i i am i'm rams i'm roose bolton's only son and he's making sure that he remains roose bolton's only son but ramsey is also like he's someone because he doesn't think and they've shown that like his ferocity in battle but he's mostly just he's just hacking he's just like a melee fighter he has no thought in it he has the Bastards boys, but the Bastards boys are are working for Roos. They're not really his friends. Ramsey is someone who thinks that he had that he has power. And yeah, to an extent he does, but really he doesn't. He's un- he's he doesn't real he's someone who doesn't realize just how undermined he truly is. He's completely blind to it. And that's what makes like his story so interesting because it's it's just seeing when are you going to get this comeuppance and when are you going to see that nobody's actually in your court. Even the guys that you think are your friends are really just placating to you and they're working, but they're really working for your dad. He's like a Euro. And in that way, even though Ramsey is so dark and brutal, he's actually like a Euron light because Euron is kind of in the same situation with his own lick spittles, like people like left hand Lucas Cod and people like that. But at the same time, Euron, even though these guys prob these guys may not actually be committed to them, Euron at least is is able to offer them something to keep them in good graces, the way that Ramsey can't. He can't. Re- there's really nothing he can offer as long as Roos as long as Roos is alive. But if Ramsey were to pull like what happened on the show if ramsey loses oh, roos he's not gonna be able to maintain power i can't say hello everyone to the don tony teflon what's up tony we'll just wait for tony to can you hear me mr tony I added him too soon. I have to fix my speakers real quick. There's something going on here. Oh, but he sounds uh, good. Listen to those pipes. That should be. There we go. All right, there that's better. Go. I can hear you now. You can hear me? All right, that's what Welcome to the channel, on, Mr. Man. Teflon. Of course, Tony Teflon, Teflon TV. Right. It's one of the longest I running. Being in, so- Oh yeah, let me give you let me give you your props first, Tony. Let me give you the props. I mean, oh. look, I've been doing this a long time. Tony Teflon was there when I started. When I was a babe, he was already a full grown tree holding up the canopy of the fandom. So thank you very much. Oh, we've been friends a long time, Tony, and it is always good to talk to you. And of course, if you watch Tony Teflon's uh streams with Phil, his House of the Dragon streams, you may know me as Nana Vagar. Who likes to call in to uh, the hotline? <laughs> but yeah, what's up, Tony? What's going on? I appreciate you having me on. Uh, you know what I mean. I appreciate you rocking. I'm sorry about the whole thing. It's just that I usually have a room that I do it with a green screen that I, you know, do all the live streams at. So I can't just have the big green screen behind me. So I moved out here to the back of my living room, and uh, so I had to move all the stuff around. Hopefully, it's all right. I'm sorry if it's uh little laggy or anything else or the picture isn't as it, as it normally would be but uh hopefully it sounds all right to that's everybody else. it sounds great um i too have books under my laptop if the camera was was turned around that truth would be revealed so that's that's how we roll <laughs> yeah do you no, have I thoughts had, on rams I, I mean we could talk about all kinds of stuff but we've just been talking about ramsey as a well-written villain so yeah what are your thoughts on right. that Welcome to I the think, show. You know, Let's talk about Ramsey. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, well, what I deal with Ramsey as a character from we're talking about the books, right? Not the show character, right? I didn't like the actor who played him on the show. I didn't feel that he uh, presented a menacing enough figure to portray who this man is on the uh, on the on in the books, right? He's the guy on the show was a little small. Uh, 
And this this didn't do it. Like I would never be afraid of him. Randy is supposed to be someone who is a, I would say six one, six two, probably about two fifty. You know what I mean? That is this a bigger guy that you know is a physical threat because they say specifically he's not well sword trained, but he still could whip your ass just with his physical prowess and his mindset mm-hmm. to get the job done. And I don't feel like the actor actually portrayed that. So when dealing with the character of Ramsey as a villain that they put him in there and the way they they set him up the villain that they want him to be we have seen other vi- villains in this book up in that series you've seen a joffrey you've seen a cersei you've never seen someone who is as, as sadistic uh someone who enjoys inflicting pain on someone as ramsey did who is willing to kill to the point where you've seen other people willing to kill or have people kill for them but someone who actually gets enjoyment out of killing people in order to get to to get to their means and everything else and so they dumbed the character down in the show obviously you can't do everything you can't have dogs in there having sex with people like they do in the, in the books and everything else like that right it took a lot of his menace for me away and everything else from the show but as a book villain i think he's a great book villain he whole series if you really look from top to bottom of who there is i think that he could he could be there am i lagging still oh yeah and you're muted dave (laughs) your voice is not (laughs) lagging your image is but so far your voice is coming through good so you can go ahead just keep talking you're good yeah, no, that that that's what I would say mostly about Ramsey. I mean, if you, I think that when he when he goes out and wins the winner, it 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 won't be exactly the way they did it in the show, but I do think it'll be uh, similar. I think he'll be hunted by 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 Arya uh, and the Super Pack. I think that that that's how he goes out. He escapes Winterfell and runs away, but Arya inside Nymeria and the super pack check tra- uh, track him down and then they eat him and they kill him I think that's how he goes out so I do think he gets eaten by animals not his own dog since they didn't really do the super pack in the the show I think that's why it was taken out but and they didn't do the walking aria in the show I think that's why it was taken out but I think that's when it all goes said and done he'll get eaten by Nymeria and the rest of the super pack the wolves will, will hunt him down to fight him. so first of all Tony, brilliant. Love that. Second of all, look at you bringing it back to Winds of Winter predictions, which is what we're supposed to be doing this hour. I think I've lost track of the hours. I don't know. But yes, I like that quite a bit. Um, The wolf pack is absolutely going to be a huge factor going forward. I think that Bran will be involved, potentially Rickon, as well as Arya. And they do need stuff to do before the others. Um, Hunting down Ramsay would be excellent. Um, Love that idea. Tim, your thoughts. Yeah, because we need to we need to bring Arya north after she deals with everything in River Run. Like she's probably gonna have a moment with Lady Stoneheart when she returns. I can see Arya being the one to kind of like release Stoneheart's like vengeful spirit by showing like, no, your daughter is alive. Because we know the Frey Pie thing in the books is not going the way it went down with the show because Frey Pie in the books is Wyman Manderley's masterpiece. Uh, but then, yeah, after after whatever, after the Lady Stoneheart stuff is settled, for Arya to start making her way north, for the real Arya to be the one to take out Ramsay after his abuse <laughs> of the fake Arya, Jane Poole, makes, yeah, that, that makes, like, narrative sense. Yeah, I, I the Stoneheart in... It's beautiful. Her actually meeting up with her. I don't know how much you'll get of her. I think that in the position mm-hmm. that she's in, Lady Stoneheart, where she's going to be confronted with Brienne and Jamie mm-hmm. Lannister's there and all that, I don't know how long it's going to last with her. I don't know if we could get to the point where Ari will make it in time to do it, because I don't think she's long for the for it. I think if she had a more significant role and it was something bigger that they, they, they've been forced to put her in the show. The fact that they didn't put her in the show makes me think that she's not long for winter winter. I think she may be taken out very fast. Yeah. I mean, she wasn't put in the show because D and D wanted to downplay the whole fantasy element. Cause they've said they want it. They want it housewives and, and, uh, and, and uh, football fans to be, to be fans too. So, 
trying to appeal to the lowest common denominator took a lot of the fantasy and sword and sorcery trope out of uh, themes out of it. And don't forget the wolves are expensive, uh, even more than the that dragons. Too. They really limited mm -hmm. and also like really hard to work with the huskies and all that. So like there's a lot of logistical limitations for the wolves. So that could be the reason for that. Um, I think, I mean, you know, there's so many plot elements. It's not like, I think the wolf, I mean, we already know Arya is controlling the wolf pack from over the sea. So there's going to be some amount mm -hmm. of wolf packing. Uh, but yeah, it's like, what are they going to do? I didn't really have anything on the list other than fight the others at the end. So yeah, I like that theory a lot that they could hunt down Ramsey. Yeah. It's a uh, one theory is, is the red wedding 2.0, this Frey Lannister wedding that's supposed to happen. And then lady Stoneheart and the band of brothers, which are now like this broken Robin hood troop are going to show up. And we have like lemon lemon cloak. Who's possibly an inside man at the twins right now. And also possibly, mm -hmm. uh, actually, Rhaegar, Rhaegar's squire in disguise. I'm blank. Um, from, he's from the same house that Lenor's lover was, a first lover was originally from. Lawnmouth? Lawnmouth, yeah. That Lem Lemon Cloak is actually Richard Lawnmouth. Yeah, uh-huh. So, yeah, okay. that's a theory I heard a long time ago. That's a whole theory, yeah, for sure. Um Okay, so the general topic, Tony, could yeah. either be Winds of Winter or... Oh, no, no, uh, Tim, you were just saying you watched one of Tony's videos and uh, you wanted to talk about one of the... What, what was the idea? Oh, it was uh, Victorian fighting Barristan because Victorian wants to cross a name off his bucket list. But I'll, I'll, I'll hand that to Tony because it's where I first heard it from. Yeah, I came up with that theory. I mean... I just when I when I made up that theory, and when I make up, uh, I made up a bunch of theories, but this one spe specifically, I try to make them, you know, not just what I want to see or what I think is going to happen, but I have to have some type of evidence from the exact books, or I don't make it right. If I if I can say anything, but if I don't have evidence from the books to back it up, then I wouldn't say it. So I said this, and the evidence I have in the books of this is just that how much he truly wants to have a big name fight he talks about it constantly that he wants to fight someone he wants a name on his ledger so when we look at that and we see that he's heading out there he's going to be around danny and them he's going to sack he's going to save them i could see him and barristan going at it and him being able to beat barristan strictly because he's old I don't think you'd have a chance for Sparrow in his prime, but at this stage in his life, I think that would be his thing. And then we have the Makoro thing, all that he's going to die. You know, not die, but it's going to be a bright future for him. I think this is what the bright future will be in the end because Danny will see that he killed Barristan, and that's when she'll burn him. That will give her good enough pause, reason to burn him. Because if not, she doesn't have reason to burn him or kill him just because, hey, I'm coming. I want to marry you. I don't think he'll be as aggressive as he's been when he's around. Her. I think he'll, you know, not that he's going to be smooth in any way. But I don't think he's going to just try to grab her up, do whatever he does to the dusky woman, too. I think I have more respect. So she needs a reason to take him out. If Makoro's vision is going to come true and he's going to die in flames, the reason would be that he killed Barris and Selmy. That would be a good enough reason. Then you see the, the dragons light him on fire, and then that, and that's how he goes out. So th that's the reason why I think that that's most likely the way it's going to go. And then you can also look in the, in the show and you see Barris and did die in the show. Oh. like that by harpies and stuff like that 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 would be like luke skywalker dying from a stormtrooper right you can't do something like that you have to have the guy go <laughs> thank you thank you that's that's a perfect analogy too <laughs> that is and the thing is is like D D did that as an insult to the actor because he Correct. brought up the fact that barrison was going to be important in the books they that like that was a total dickhead move like they they did that out of spite okay so yeah. let's think about this this kind of makes sense tony because we have plenty of viewpoints in Mirin. like we needed barristan's viewpoint for a minute because danny was gone Tyrion isn't mm -hmm. there yet and you know we just had quentin and then quentin got burned so we needed barristan's viewpoint 
to get all the harpy shave paint stuff going on. Um, once Vic gets there and Tyrion gets there, then we we don't necessarily need everyone's viewpoint. Um, the major theory about yeah. Barristan is that he's going to turn his cloak again when he hears about Fagon or something like that. Um, he could do that in Marine. Like he could simply hear news about Fagon and decide to leave. And then maybe Vic confronts him, you know what I mean? As he's like turning cloak or something. Um, I'm not necessarily fixated on that theory at all that Barristan's going to flip to Fagon's side. I do think that's a compelling idea, but I don't know that that's, that's not like headcanon for me or anything. So I could, it, it, to it me, potentially Barristan it would, dying in Marine could work. Victorian is very hot blooded and likes to snap and stuff. My main question for you, Tony, or this theory in general, basically is what, yeah. what is Euron's plan to use the dragon horn to get the dragon and how is he planning on, how is he giving the horn to Victarian, sending Victarian to Marine, and it's expecting that that's going to equal a dragon? It's kind of like the underpants gnomes, like step one, step three, profits. Like, what's step two? How do we get from Victarian having a horn in Slaver's Bay to Victarian owning a dragon? And how does um, Victarian potentially getting executed by Danny via dragon affect Euron's planning? Yeah, so I think what happens and the whole reason why you're on now is it's going to sound a little disgusting, and I know it, but in all Trigger honesty, it's either, it's either one of two things. The dusky woman is either Euron or a warlock. It's one or the other, right? It's a good chance that it's a warlock. We've seen, especially, you know, you could take the show, for example. We've seen the show, in the show, the warlock girl jump on there and uh, get away, right? We've seen that, and then do the hiss in the show, right? When uh, when Barrison saved Danny from the, the the creature, and then then the warlock turned to a little girl, jumped on the roof, and then hissed at her, right? If ah, I could interrupt real quick, hit. the warlocks definitely work with illusion and um, deception and things. I mean, that's that's kind of we see them project different images to Danny. It's hard to say how substantial the undying ones even are. Um, so yeah, the dream implantation, glass candles. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so it's a good chance that most likely, I mean, if I had to lean to it, I would lean toward it being a warlock. That's who the dusty woman is. That's why the tongue was cut out purposely so that you can't that say makes, anything. Okay. That makes, I was, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I've never liked the idea that like you're on his skin changing the dusky woman. I've always hated that. Her being a <laughs> warlock in a glamour, that is sick and twisted. And that seems more believable to me. Go ahead. Yeah be that and and so when she sent that, that and that would be the reason why, again you, you heard she hisses all the time and again they did the hiss in the show with the warlock they had the girl hiss at danny why did you think that dan and dave just made that up i don't think they just made that up i think that's the reason why they, they made a hiss like that so and also makoro doesn't like it because makoro could see through the glamour he understands that's the glamour because makoro's got glamour on itself so when dealing with uh with 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 him, he gave him the dragon horn. He told him, and he says, "Oh, Euron was stupid to give this to me with a weapon like this. I could rule the world." Well, he's dumbass. He says, "You need to." It says, "You know." He reads the glyphs. It says, "You got to claim it by blood." So, being dummy that he is, he just figures, "I'll just rub my blood on it," and that's how it's claimed. But it's already been claimed by blood by Euron. He's already done the blood sacrifice as necessary. So, once he brings it in there and he blows that horn, then the horns, the the dragon's gonna go to the owner the one who owns the horn not the person who actually blew it because if that was the case then that would mean that it would go to the slaves that's blowing the horn the slave would be the dragon rider okay. right that's who he's having blowing it so the fact that it's not going to go to one of those persons it's going to go to the owner of the horn not the one who's actually blowing it and that's going to be euron the dragon will fly off, fly off and then euron will claim a dragon so once he blows the horn he kind of is expendable then essentially plot wise yeah, it's a done deal. All his job was to get there, bring that horn there, blow that horn, and he's ready to go right after. Okay, that. so There's then, no need to have character. so does Danny then commandeer the whole entire Ironborn fleet somehow, or I, I do? I think that you know when you've seen in the show Asha uh, Yara Yarsha, as we called her, right. Uh, come be down with Danny and her having some iron bone on her side. We will see that 
part part go down there like that. So they will have some of them on the side because I think some of those people will be loyal to Victorian, but they'll be more loyal to Danny because they'll know what Euron did in this all. Basically, will blame Euron for everything that they did. Okay, Euron's got bigger plans. He's not really here to rule the Ironborn. He wants to rule the world, right? Right, and Euron's not going to appear in Slaver's Bay. So let me turn this to no. Tim. If Victorian were to be killed in Slaver's Bay, you you know the Ironborn lords best. Who would be the ones that would fill the power vacuum and potentially negotiate with Danny? Um, or you know what I mean, like for the future of their entire like if Victorian dies, like who's in charge? Yeah, it's just the thing uh, because Ralph you're Lindbergh. on. <laughs> Ralph <laughs> and Ralph Kenning. Uh, yeah, because that's the thing. Euron has been undermining Victorian every step of the way. That We see that when he awards uh, one of the Shield Islands to Newt the Barber. Uh, Euron has been doing everything in his power to cut out Victorian's base. So if anything, I think if Victorian were to go down, his support structure is probably going to be so shattered by that point it's not like Victor when Victorian falls, every anyone that was loyal oh. to him is going to be scattered. And I Euron's, think that's when Asha Asha's gonna have to fill the void. You well, Euron's captains the, yeah, all the captains that are loyal to Euron would already be knowing what the plan is when Victorian died yeah. by magical circumstances. Euron would probably Euron could also use a glass candle to communicate with a couple of them if he wants to bring them in on just how much sorcery he's practicing, but yeah, they would know what to do. They would be in on the plan, and they would be they would know the plan is to bring Danny back uh, to Victorian. And I guess even if even if they weren't in on the conspiracy plan with Euron, they know the mission is to bring Danny back. So they would be inclined to like, you know, bring Danny back. I guess wouldn't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they would. Uh, want I think to, like, but yeah, it's- without- with, with Victorian out of the picture, I think Asha would be the natural one to fill the void as our like anti Euron faction as far as Ironborn goes. Well, eventually, and yeah. That would, I, yeah. I meant in and Marine that's specifically. Because yeah. we do see that in the show. Uh, show, well, Yara on the show tries to get into Danny's good graces, and Danny's willing to take it if Yara abolishes the old way. Which is like, well, that's that that's a pretty big demand on that part. But Asha's going to try. That's kind of her that's that that's her that's part of her shtick and her portion of the King's Mood is looking for a new, better option, like a third way, if you would, you know, if you will. Um so yeah, that's where I see that going. I think your Euron's downfall is going to be come at the hands of probably Danny, John, and Asha and Theon coming back. Theon being the Theon, the latecomer, they're going to have to. No, I totally agree with that. No, I was just trying to figure out what's going to happen to the fleet literally in Marine. Like, cause obviously the fleet is Danny's transport for her army to get to Westeros. Like from a plot perspective, it's Mm -hmm. not hard to understand. Like she needs a fleet to get to Westeros. She has an army Uh and Victorian has sailed her a fleet. So, I'm saying I'm kind of saying, yeah, maybe he can die. He's, he does have to die at some point. Um, what would be the point? So, Tony, you were going to. So let me give the mic back to Tony. You were going to say something. But also, let me ask you, what would be the point of Victorian's fire hand if he dies? Like, um, I, I guess some of us are dreaming of him ch- uh, choke strangling others north of the wall in Jon Snow's army. But I guess I would. I would say maybe it's to show us that Reloris can make fire hands so that maybe someone near the wall will have a fire hand like that that they can choke others with. But uh, your thoughts? I would love to see them do a human torch situation. And oh, it's just going, it's going to be him dealing with Barristan and whether he uses that hand to kill Barristan or that gives him the upper hand on Barristan. That, that'll be the end of it and everything else. I think that the plot point was to show the healing powers of R'hllor, that they could, it could take this poison out of you and, and out of your body. And it's not really out of his body. You know, it's it, it's still his hand looks like a mangled meat. It's not like it looks cool or anything like that. It's disgusting. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just it's awesome. that's the only thing that saved his life. <laughs> <laughs> and you're right. That's the whole thing. Yeah. You know, when we... when 
that's the best part about books that when when we read the books it looks to, in our mind the way we want it to look right so it can look awesome yeah. <laughs> you know, to you. It looks like Burt Bacon. That's awesome. <laughs> no, it's disgusting. You're right. It would be disgusting. Yeah, I think yeah. I think I, think I was so. when I did the Melisandre Secret series, I really got into all the ways that Reloris could alter physiology. And there's a few. Because Melisandre seems to be gradually transforming herself through the use of fire magic. They can resurrect the dead. And then we got Victarian's hand. So yeah, we could see all kinds of barbecue people wandering around north of the wall to fight the others by the end of the story. I want the more the merrier, in my opinion. So this is cool. All right. Yeah. Well, I like that theory. Oh, oh last thing. Barristan as a Kingsguard symbolizes a White Walker. Um, I don't know if you're hip to that, Tony, but yeah, like the Kingsguard and the White Walkers of all the same descriptions, white shadow, ghostly, in the moonlight, snow white armor, blah, 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 blah. So Bear, if Barristan choke slams, if he, if he chokes out, if Victorian chokes out Barristan with his fire hand, that would make a lot of sense, and it would be a big clue that we will see Reloris transformed people fighting whites and others. Because the white, it'd be the whites, really. The whites are flammable. If you had a burning hand... You really could fight the whites pretty well, couldn't you? Yeah, I, I you would be able to fight the whites, just strictly the whites, because it won't work on the white walkers, right? And yeah, yeah, because the dragon glass doesn't work on the whites in the book. It's just the fire. The dragon glass works on the white walkers, but not the whites in the book. It seems so, yeah. What I remember. Yeah, so it would be it would be great for him to be able to do that if that was the case for the, but he won't make it that far. Uh, at all he's he's I, I give him two chapters the most and he's out of here uh, in the next book and again when dealing with the winds of winter we might not get the winds of winter that we would have gotten if George would have really wrote the book and just it hasn't been as popular as it would be because he may just be like let me get this over with uh, let me get through this book and leave a lot and you know tie things up as fast as he possibly can just to not leave himself in the same position that he left himself in this time. He needs to kill people. There's no question. That's the only way. Like if I'm if I'm his editor and and he keeps coming back to me like, well, I just, you know, I added a chapter here. And I like, George, kill some of these mother efforts. Like it's time. <laughs> so this is why, yeah, like the story doesn't go <laughs> on forever. So you have to really think like, what is Victorian there to do? What is Barristan there to do? And as soon as they're not needed, we should expect them to potentially get killed off. Like, it's that time. So, cool. Yeah, That's awesome. Because if we take all of this with Vic and Barristan and Tyrion, and then when Danny returns from the Dothraki Sea, from the Dothraki sea we're going to have four POV characters in Marine, plus Way too Marwin. Many. Too yeah. many. Yeah. So that's why I said, like, that's why I'm a fan of Tony's idea that Barristan will be killed by Vic. But the other Barristan idea that Barristan is going to somehow hear about Fagon, turn cloak, start heading west to fight with Fagon, is something I could see because we got to remember Barristan during the War of the Nine Penny Kings, he killed Maylees the Monstrous on the Stepstones. He mm -hmm. brought the fifth Blackfire Rebellion to an end. And George w is the type of guy who would love that irony of the man right. who ended the fifth rebellion somehow aiding in the sixth. Me, I could see, I'd be, I'm actually, I would, I like both ideas. I'm a fan of it going either way. But the point is, is that there's too many, there's too many pieces on the Marine side of the board. And one of them needs to be taken off, whether they're killed or because they go to a different side of the board. That's whatever, but one of them needs to be. Yeah, it's moved. time There's to get many. the hell out of Marine for sure. It's time um, to get out of Marine. So, <laughs> I, real, I want to ask Tony about my theory about the the Darsh Kaleen, but real quick, Aleph Null in the chat says Victorian's hand is meant to hold the horn. I I do don't think? I don't think it is because it, it's it's already been blown. He's not blowing it. He knows he's not blowing it. And but he's he, that horn is huge. It's not like this horn is, you know, this horn is it's almost as big as the boat. It's a huge horn. This is not a small horn. The problem it's is so, the lungs, too. It's not the hand. It's the lungs. <laughs> yeah. It burns you from the inside out. Yes. Kind of the same way, you know, 
you know, when, when Danny, you know, I would say the same way the sword, uh, Lightbringer sword does to you. You know what I mean? It's, it'd be the same way that that, that happens to you when it's, it stabs you and stuff. You know, it, it burns you that way. Like, I, I came up with, and this is a long, so obviously, Dave, you know, I've been there for like nine years. <laughs> I came up with the, the theory that Jon Snow would kill Danny, And again, I didn't just come up with that. I came up with that nine years ago. And I didn't come with, come up with it because I thought that that was what was going to happen. I used the uh, the House of the Undying chapter, and I said that when she was talking to the dragon, that that dragon was really Jon Snow. And when she was talking to the blacks, and he, she said he had it was uh, black scales, that that was Jon Snow in Valyrian armor. And then that's when she gets burnt by the dragon and she says that she feels her blood boiling. That's really John stabbing her with the sword forging light bringer. And okay. that's why she felt the boiling of the blood inside of it. It's the same feeling that when, uh, when Melisandre kills the, uh, the dude from beyond the wall, who's inside the crow, that he could feel her, his blood boiling. And the, got the jade, imploded. if I could interject, the jade compendium describes Azor High stabbing a monster and it boils him from the inside. So for sure that dream mimics the Azor High Lightbringer sword forging. It's definitely a parallel. Um, I don't know if, I'm not a fan of the idea of, of John stabbing Danny. However, it's, I can see how you could interpret it that way. Carry on. Yeah, so I think that's, that's how, I mean, we just, going on tangent now but i think that's how she has to go i don't think that she goes out the way they did it in the show they right. did show john killer but i don't think it's because she goes crazy and starts burning king's landing It'd and be now more of a magical sudden, thing yeah and then Tyrion talks her into it i it talks him into it after and Tyrion, Tyr Tyrion that's on death road it's going to be executed himself talks John into killing someone else you know and i i, I don't think it's going to go down like that because i don't think that he can beat the Night King the way Arya beat the Night King. <laughs> right. I don't think it's going to be that easy. I think you're going to have to have this sword or it's not going to work. If you don't have this sword, you're not. Oh, looks like Tony froze. To yeah. beat him and stuff. So, oh, okay. okay. Uh, just for a second. Sorry, I, I just missed your last sentence. Tim, are you trying to get in on this? Yeah, I was just going to say, Tony, like your la the last thing you said got cut off. If you just repeat oh. your last sentence. Yeah, so uh, you know, I said, I don't, I don't believe that it's going to be just a Valyrian steel that can kill the Night King. I, I think it's going to have to be Lightbringer is the sword that has to kill him. It has to be that to kill him. There's no, it's going to be some dagger that you get stabbed with. And it's not going to go out like that. So <laughs> I tend to think that there will be multiple light bringers, meaning multiple flaming swords. And I think that Valeri any Valerian steel weapon will make a good light bringer. We've seen that Barrack, as a fire white, can light his own sword on fire at any time with his own blood. The only problem is the steel isn't up to it. So this is another one of those things where I say George gives us a clue in a different plot line. We're supposed to cross apply it. So Jon Snow, if he becomes a fire white, will be able to light his own sword and maybe other people's swords on fire at will, just like Barrett can in the books and on the show. Same story, okay? That's why it was maddening that the show, John, never did that. Because Barrett's like, the Lord brought us back, you and me, for a purpose. Watch me light my sword on fire. John's like, ah, oh, interesting. I will not try that <laughs> when I'm fighting an okay, ice dragon. Go ahead. I say, no. is it, I don't know, maybe I'm, in the books, when they do that, the Valor people light mm -hmm. the sword on fire. Barrack, they use what, what, they use wild they, wildfire. Right? Not they in the cave. Their sword on fire, and then they Thoros, up, they have wildfire there and do it like that. That's like I'm just saying like that's what it, I, maybe I'm mistaken, but maybe that's what they usually would use, right? The wildfire on the sword. Thoros uses wildfire. And Melisandre uses wildfire on Dragonstone for Stannis' ritual with Lightbringer. But Beric, in the cave when he fights the Hound, he just runs the blade across his hand, just like on the show, and it lights on fire with his blood. And we're so he supposed... Cuts What's that? He cuts himself and the blood yes. lights it on fire. Yes. Right. So yeah. 
we're like I said, you know, presumably if John has, I think his resurrection might be complicated and involve multiple things. But if there is Reloris magic and he is part fire white, then he should be able to light a sword on fire. Um, yeah. Alternately, it's like Barrett's blood is combustible. Right, because it's it's burning Reloris blood. Uh, similarly, Victorian with his fire hand, he might be able to light a sword on fire or at least hold a burning sword. So this could be something that could affect John or somebody else at the wall because I do think there'll be multiple flaming weapons potentially. So yeah, this part of the fire white hand or the, the, the burnt hand of Victorian could be about lighting swords on fire or holding flaming weapons, whether that's John or someone else. Uh, and Tony, just to get back to what you were saying, the only way I will accept John stabbing Danny would be for some sort of magical purpose in the heart of winter. It needs to be even more than just forging Lightbringer. I don't think that's enough. I do think they have to go to the heart of winter and fix something there. And mm -hmm. that that is probably where Danny will have a sacrificial heroic death. Um, so it would be like uh, one of two things. One, perhaps her, she is possessed by the others at some point and uh, stabbing her with a burning sword actually frees her from that enchantment. Or the way I would lean is that she somehow needs to enter the weirwoods. Her spirit needs to go into the weirwood tree to like fix it. And there's a lot of foreshadowing of that in the House of the Undying where they go and burn a cold blue heart and a bun with a bunch of blue shadows around it inside a grove of magic trees, okay? It's, it's, it's all right there, basically. So I think that, yeah, it could be that Danny's got to, her spirit's got to go into some weirwoods. And so she would, the only way to do that is a sacrifice in front of a heart tree. And so that then you could see something like that. But um, I still I, don't think... Yeah, I, I Go ahead. I, I would think that I, I think that it's going to be everything is going to they're going to die. I don't think he's going to want to do it. I think that she's going to grab him and pull herself onto the blade itself and as like kiss him when she pulls herself and basically pull him in and force him to do it because this is the only way. I don't think they beat the white workers like they did in the show at Winterfell the first time they fight them. Yeah. I think they run through Winterfell, they escape through the tunnels, and they really threaten all the way down the King's Landing. And if, if they can't be King's Landing, then I would say it would be the Vale would be the, the logical spot to defeat them. But it would be because they, they have, you know, the, 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 the filter that they have that the, where they have to come through that gate but it's so narrow only a small amount of them can come through at a time so you could hold them off right there for a while until you can actually reach the night king but i think it's they're going to basically if they're going to do anything take over the whole continent i mean i could see them be talking children in the forest they could you know they tried to to, to, to break it off at howland reed's spot i could see them actually really breaking it off there a second time and, and preventing them to get all the way down to King's Landing. And then that final battle they have with them, she will sacrifice herself because it has to, she, there's no other way. This is it. They're, they're going to take over the whole continent unless this happens. Yeah. So two things and I'll give it to you, Tim. I definitely think that Danny's story ends with a sacrificial defeat of the others. It doesn't have another thing where she comes back to King's Landing and fights with, like, that's not happening. So I agree with that. Um, I think there is, George is going to echo the Hobbit, or the Lord of the Rings here. Frodo and Sam go on a mission to the heart of Mordor, Mordor, uh, behind enemy lines, while everyone else, the forces of the living, fight the forces of the, ev the evil one at the gates of Mordor. So similarly, as the others are sweeping through the kingdoms and people are fighting them, I do believe that John and Danny and a few others guided by Bran will be going to the heart of winter to do some magic surgery up there. So that is where I would put um, the, the, these magical sacrifices. But yeah, there's a lot of compatible ideas here. So this has been a very interesting winds of winter predictions uh discussion here to flesh out some of these ideas and tim we have three minutes to midnight so 
Yeah, what do you have to say about about some of these ideas? For me, I think it's Dawn that's the important one because I think Dawn is the true light bringer. Right. And this is now granted granted this is painting what's normally a very gray story into some very black and white terms, but Dawn being the pure sword made from a white meteorite, but it's still having the properties of Valyrian steel. But Valyrian steel, which is so gray, so it's such a dark gray that it's almost black. It's like a corruption of Dawn. It follows the theme of the Shade of the Evening Trees being like a corruption of the Weirwoods. Because what follows the long night? The Dawn. Who's the only dragon to survive the dance? Morning. Mm -hmm. So I think Dawn is actually the important sword. And it also follows the color out of space, color out of space link that George has painted. The black meteorite being being the thing that corrupts and blights versus this more pure white meteorite. Again, like painting with very black and white terms. But yeah, I think Dawn is actually the important sword and that Dawn is the true light bringer. And that the Valyrian steel swords being made through most likely being made through blood sacrifice are actually a corruption, a corrupted version of the forging of Dawn. Just like Azor Ahai's uh, ascent to godhood is a corruption of something like the god on earth. And that, mer and that mirrors Euron's ascent to godhood being a corruption because he is like a herald of the apocalypse. Can and, I talk about that real quick, Dave? Yeah, go ahead. We're, it's uh, just know that the New Year's alarm bell is going to go off in the next minute. But yeah, Dick, go for it. So I agree that Dawn is the sword. Uh, One hundred percent is the light bringer sword. Is Dawn? It's just not lit. I think it still needs to be lit. Sure. Uh, Nisa, Nisa. So that's what. That's how it gets lit. I think that when when dealing with. Uh, uh, Sir Arthur Dane, I think that's why he was left at the Tower of Joy. His his. He was left there. Because... 2 a.m. There it is. 2 a.m. A.K.A. Happy New Year to Happy New like Year. Las Vegas Colorado and stuff, Denver. right? Happy yeah, New Year, Happy New Year to all you. <laughs> Happy New Year to all you. Uh, I, I think that he his job and the reason why he was left there and the other nights at the Tower of Joy was to take Jon Snow away if Rhaegar fell because they knew that he was the, there to defeat the others. I think they showed proof in the show that Dawn is Lightbringer because you see Sir Arthur Dane leave that at the bed. They put that sword right there at the bed when Jon was being born. They didn't have to put that sword there, yeah, the, and they, but they did put that sword there. That's the born you know? under a bleeding star part of the Azor High Reborn, so it's literally born next to a comet. No, I love that. I, I think... I think every there's multiple like fulfillments of that prophet. Just as Danny was reborn on the da Dothraki mm -hmm. Sea, and the dragons were born under the Bleeding Star, John will be yeah, reborn yeah. under Mel the Bleeding Star or the comet coming back. Yeah. And then at his birth, we've got the okay. Yeah, uh, Tim, go ahead. What's yeah, that? Sorry, I just want to interject. Like right. also because because we were talking before about Quentin Martell and how kind of the point of his story was to release the dragons. Well, if we're thinking Darkstar and what the point of his story is, now one, it's like I said before, it's to be Fagon's fake Arthur Dane as a point of legitimacy, but also the other big thing for Darkstar is to get Dawn out of Dorne and get it further north for right. someone like John to get his hands on. Yes. Yeah, real quick, I was I would say that We've seen proof already that the others, the White Walkers, uh, respect the old ways, right? Right from the back when we seen uh, Royce, they stepped back and they could sure. all assault, assaulted him, but they respected the one-on-one -on -one fight, right? So I think that's what it will come down when the Night King comes out, when the sacrifice comes out and John has to battle him with, with Lightbringer. They're going to allow him to fight this one on one is you know so that if you want to say that that he's going to go behind enemy lines and be there that would lead credence to that that they are going to allow it that they could easily just snuff him and knock him out but because they respect the old ways from what we've seen right in the beginning right first chapter of the book that they let him fight one on one so they will step back and let this man fight this man one on one and allow it to have whatever happened happen. okay so that lead okay so we're talking about the Night King, quote unquote. Obviously, 
there isn't a Night King in the books yet. It's I, I know that we both believe there will be a leader of the Others figure that emerges. Now, I am dying to know what your thoughts are as far as who that will be. Uh, my general headcanon, and I think Tim and I are kind of on alignment on this, is that the original Azor High's spirit is in the Weirwood Net. And you're, you're hip to gray areas, memory, sorrow, and thorn, in a Luki stuff. This is kind of what we're talking about. Original Azor High, I, we both think, became Knight's King. And he's the same as the great other. He's somewhere in the Weirwood Net. And he wants to get a body to, to, to live in. And that's going to be the recreation of the Night King. I think the others want to use John's body, and they were testing Waymar to see if he was John, so they could turn him into the vessel for the new Night King. Um, it could be that they will get Euron, because Euron likes to mess with magic and invite spirits to live in his house, and that could backfire. And he has a lot of symbolism that suggests him as a Night King. So that's my thinking on Night King. That I think they will steal John's body for a time, he will be freed, and then he will be like an ice and fire white. And that's why the dream, uh, armored in ice, burning sword, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that ultimately it may become Euron, who is the vessel for Azor High Spirit. Now, feel free to comment on that or take it in a completely different direction. But how do you think the Night King will manifest in Winds of Winter? Yeah. I made a, 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 a video about this a long time ago. Of course you did. <laughs> I've been here for a long time. <laughs> That's more. what I said at the beginning. He's been around. He's the Don. I don't call him the Don for nothing. Go ahead. No, all right. So with my theory that I made a long time ago, I do believe that it's Gilly's child monster is the no. Night King. I think I think that when it comes down to it, you've seen Jon Snow try to do the right thing, right? He thought that they wanted to sacrifice Stannis' baby. Right. So that's why he took that baby, had sent that baby off with Gilly. And mm. no one's going to bother the little old monster. We're going to leave him here at the uh, wall. OK, so that was the wrong thing. The wrong mm. because the White Walkers want monster. When we look at the name Gilly, right, it represents the Gilly flower. But her name also says uh, the Gilly flower itself is called uh, the mother of the evening. If you look up Gilly flower, that's I the have. name of it. Yes. Mother of the evening. And, and it comes I in blue and purple too. So it, it comes in blue and purple. Yeah. And and I think that when it's all said and done, that is who they're after. We've seen them after all the kids. It's monster. The baby's known as monster. I think it's that is the Night King. The my, Night King will be born That's, out of Gilly. Baby. I love that. And I, I honestly love I that. Believe that. I believe that. I believe that. See, I got the whole story. I believe that Craster's father is Blood Raven. That's what I believe. I think his I father's Blood Raven. And I think that, you know, anyone will go look it up. You go on my channel, you look up, it's called, you know, the Night's King Monster. I oh, I think like nine years, I think I think I prefer the Aemon theory, but I think he's either Aemon or Blood Ravens. But go ahead. Well, he, he said they, they said it was a ranger. He said right. my, my father was a ranger. Aemon was never a ranger, but oh. Blood Raven was. Hmm. Right. So well, I wonder if the wildlings could be speaking loosely, though, like all the brothers are rangers to them. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't think they know. I think that's they OK. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Ranger because they the person is out there and out in the back. So and listen, you know, who else would have the connection when we look at, you know, we, cold hands and everything else. So you could go through the cold hand situation. Who is Blood Raven, right? Blood Raven's controlling cold hands and everything else. Oh, I don't think so, but that's okay. I'll let you get you away think, with that. You think, you think that cold hands is, he's he's reanimated. He's dead already. Yeah. Uh, so he's, I, he's Blood Raven's servant. We'll do cold hands in a second. I'll let you keep going with this monster craster thing. So I like, I like what you're spitting yeah, here. Go so ahead. I think that, you know, I think Blood Raven is Craster's father. That's, a, that's why we was able to get the pack. But it, it, even, even then, when you seen, I mean, I'm real quick, we we'll want to talk about, I'll say something about Colin, but when Cole Hands was fighting, we seen that the Ravens came. The Ravens, we know for 100% were controlled by blood Ravens. And you see that those Ravens were really upset and started pecking and chewing and, and started to attack everything from the Rangers when, when Cold Hands did the attack. There was no reason for them to do that, blood Raven to do that, unless he was trying to protect his son, protect everything that he protect his legacy 
which is monster and and craster and craster if you look at the way he was raised and everything else you might as well say he was the king beyond the wall but beyond without being man's raider he was able to do everything why would he be able to sit there and no one mess with this guy all this time all these wives all these daughters but no one for no reason would ever mess with him there's a reason why they wouldn't mess with him and there's a reason why that that targaryen blood is inside of those white walkers and that targaryen blood is is blood raven's blood but i believe 100 percent. that's why monsters the, what the hundredth kid born um, out of all of them, like it's 99 kid and then uh, monsters, the 100s. I don't maybe. know that that's but, said anywhere, is it? I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Monster is the 100th kid born of, I, out of all of the, of the babies. Uh, he's the number 100. I, I don't I, remember I, a number. I know we, we know how many wives he has. He has 19 wives, just like there's 19 forts on the wall. But I don't know yeah, that. Out of, the, out of the male, out of the kids, he's the 100. He's the 100th of them. Okay, well, setting that aside, that's very interesting. There's many things to take that. And I'll give this to Tim so Tim can get in on this. But I definitely think the White Walkers are coming for Monster at the wall. I think they're coming for Jon Snow's body, too. And someone asked, how can they get him? There's ice cells on both sides of the wall. Somehow Jon's going to end up on the other side. And also, if he's inside the wall, it could be that they can get to him. Can I say it real quick? How I believe it's going to happen? Yeah, go ahead. I think I think what happens, and also what's going to. I'm sorry, Tim. I don't want to take you. I'm taking your time. I'm not trying to do that. But uh, I think what's going to happen, and how it's going to happen, is that they, you heard the story of the, the the 99 sentinels that are trapped inside of the wall, right? That were put in there. And 79 with their spear. 79 sentinels in there with their spears and everything else. And sometimes you would able to, they would say that, that the rumor would be you could hear them tapping. I think that they get reanimated by the Night King and they bust through the wall and they become his army and they start attacking and killing the Night's Watchmen. And that's how they will go out there and get, get Jon Snow's body and actually penetrate the wall when it comes down to it. Tony coming with some fresh theories. I like this, man. I got set in my ways over here. It's nice to hear some different stuff. Um, so I'll give this again, Tim, I'll give this to you. But I, I think that, first of all, you're making me, I, I don't know why I thought that it was Eamon. I think it was because of Eamon, that line about Eamon talking about holding a son and this and that. But to be honest, whoever Craster's father is, is a giant asshole. Um, the way that he goes about handling it. And then, and that fits blood Raven. Blood Raven is an asshole. There's no question. I love blood Raven, but he is hard and cruel and absolutely mm -hmm. could have told this woman to piss off when she showed up with her kid like that. I mean, and maybe Aiden did it politely right? and they just remembered the results, which was piss off. Um, but like it kind of fits the, and just lastly, I just think that yes, Craster has to be Targaryen because the original Night King is Azor High, and the others always are frozen blood of the dragon people. That is in their symbolism. So yeah, I, I think it's either Blood Raven or Aemon that has to be Craster's father. Now, Tony, you're saying if Monster is Craster's grandson, then that's why they're intervening and stuff. And I do want to circle back to Cold Hands, but Tim, go ahead and give what, what do you what do you got on this? Okay. Um. Well, first things first, because people are asking, going back to my bit, the Mountain Time drink is Fat Tire Ale oh. brewed in Fort Collins, Colorado. So, just getting that out there. Now, as for me, like, this is like, this is like my big moment to pimp my channel. Because, Tony, I'm not sure if you're familiar with what I do on my personal channel, but I do a lot of the mythos in, in A Song of Ice and Fire. Lovecraft. Uh, Chambers, uh, Merton, Merton Pearl, a, a lot like not. Just, I don't just limit myself to Lovecraft. I, I cover the whole span of things, and everything we're talking about goes into so many of my recent videos. But Dave, you you're familiar with my black sarcophagus theory, and this is building on the Lovecraft stories I've covered, but also the House of the Worm stream I did, which was a huge influence on George because in George's thousand world series he actually wrote a spiritual successor to house of the worm um because in house of the worm what lies it's, it's the story of a corrupted forest and what lays at the middle of it it's a 
funeral it's a funeral pyre uh, just just it's just this massive grave and there's this scene where where the worms are blocking out the sun and i've related to this back how george many many times uses worms as a stand-in for dragons because he'll use the worm worm wordplay w-o-r-m and w-y-r-m right, right. And then there's my black sarcophagus theory, which is building on uh, the tomb of Nefren Ka. So now, mm -hmm. if you're not familiar with it, so everyone's unfamiliar with Nefren Ka. Nefren Ka is a pharaoh in Lovecraft who finds, who comes, who brings down, casts down the high gods of Egypt to worship a black stone and makes sacrifices to it. Who else does this? So Pharaoh, <laughs> God King, worshiping a black stone, right. making sacrifices to it, brings down his his empire. This is Bloodstone Emperor. It's straight up Bloodstone Emperor. So my theory has been is that what lays at the heart of winter? Well, it's probably like in House of the Worm, it's probably a, a funeral mound. And what's going to be under it is going to be the body of Night's King of azor ahai of bloodstone emperor one of the three or his dragon if, if or, right yeah yeah or if they've all been the same but yeah i think what what lays at the heart of winter is probably going to be a black stone mound with with weir with a weirwood with a weirwood underneath and tangled up in the weirwoods much in the same way that blood raven is tangled up in the roots of the weirwoods mm -hmm. there's going to be a skeleton it's going right. to be some kind of skeleton and that's going to be the body of either one of these three, possibly all of them, if they right. were all the same person. So yeah, that's 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 my heart of the winter theory. And so how does that tie into all the stuff we were just talking about? <laughs> well, we were asking like what who do we think Knights King or Azor Ahai is? And I said, I think I I think that he's already dead. But Oh, he's definitely the idea, dead. He's just who's he gonna? He's definitely dead. It's right. like it's like, but it's it's more the idea of the second coming of these things. Mm -hmm. Euron is trying to be the second, like the second coming of Azor Ahai, because right. he's trying to bring himself to godhood. Tony's Tony's idea, if I if I can expand on it, it's like Tony's Tony's idea what of monster being, of monster tr being the one. It would be like monsters like the second coming of this. Yeah. And then, but the idea is that John, but then there's John, because John has all this Jesus imagery. John is the second coming. And the thing about the second coming of Jesus is when he comes back, he's not going to be happy. So we have three not figures here who mm -hmm. are all fitting the mold of this return of this, of this uh, Messiah type character, our Jesus figure, but as it, but an evil Jesus our evil Azor Ahai, and three figures all fit the mold, and all three of them are people who are not going to be happy. Now, with the baby, I'm not sure, because I, I don't know. Maybe maybe he'll grow up in a span. But that, that was going to be gonna my gonna question be for Tony. Is how, what, what happens okay. when they get the baby? So does he just grow up, or we yeah, we'll daycare? I think it, yeah, I think it's the same thing that you see in the show. You see them put the finger to him, and they grow, and they grow up as fast as they put that finger to him. Uh, when we see when it seems to happen to the baby there, all those white walkers has got beards and everything else. They ain't lived that long. That's just what happens when they put that finger to them. They grow up really fast. That's just what it is. <clears throat> there's no daycare. There's no pampers. There's no onesies. They put that finger to them, and when they grow up, that's who yeah. they are, and that's just the way it goes. So, so I don't, I, I don't think it's anything like that. But I think that, as I said in the video, I'm, I can't remember the whole video. But, I said that he is the White Walkers of Zora Ahai, the Night King, right? And mm -hmm. when you look at the the things when when he was born, all mm -hmm. the elements of Zora Ahai are there when he's born. They specifically say it in the chapter. So if you say uh, so, it would be a salt born a mist. What salt, salt and smoke, right? There was three of them. A born a mist, salt and smoke. Uh, the salt was uh, was from Gilly when she was giving birth. She was crying. Uh, the smoke was from the chamber. It was cold outside, so they had the chamber. They specifically mentioned the smoke running through the thing. There's something else there too. Uh, Bannon was dying. Of, yeah, Bannon was dying too. He was, and he was cold. 
That was the cold. He kept saying how cold he was because he was dying. But if you look at all of the elements of, of Azura High, you can see that they all were there when Gilly gave birth to Monster. So I believe that the monster was the bleeding star was there too. I have to go back and look, but there is the bleeding star reference uh, there at that time. I don't know it right offhand, but there's 100% one there. If you watch my video, I remember I said I made it like nine years ago or whatever. I don't remember it all, but the I'm sure it's there, was, Tony. Yeah. It's there's always a comet yeah. symbol there somewhere. <laughs> It's definitely there, but it, it was all there. That's why I look at it, and I, he is their Azura Hyde. He is their their savior for the White Walkers and stuff, and it's going to be Monster. Again, and, and when you hear about Monster, they say he's stronger than the other kids. They're scared to put him down with him. Val says specifically, gives him a name, Monster, says he's dirty. She doesn't want him around. There's something wrong with this child, she says right off the bat and everything else. So I don't think they're just saying that. And, they, and, and, the, and the final thing is obviously Jon Snow thought he was doing the right thing by getting rid of Stannis's child and leaving Monster there. But in the end, it's going to turn out to be the wrong thing. I seen you had a bottle of Hennessy, right? You're drinking there? Damn right. right. So I have, I have a bottle of, of, of pure white Hennessy right here. Oh. Can you see it right there? Yeah. Pure white <laughs> Hennessy. So I will, I will take a shot of the pure white Henny for you. Bottoms up. Yeah. <clears throat> so then, I, I cheers. Well, I wanted to say, and for more of this biblical stuff too, I actually did another one uh, with girl nettles. I did a revelation in a song of ice and fire, looking at the, uh, the, the whore of Babylon. And we did a lot of, we did a look at breakdown on that, on the female side of this whole thing, looking at Melisandre, Danny, uh, Night's Queen and Visenya, to extent, it's the mother of dragons, the mother of others, the mother of shadow babies, and the mother of Magor, who I've referred to numerous times as the Rosemary baby of our story. So, baby sacrifice. Let's talk about it. Um, see if we can get it demonetized here. Um, Tony, so I have recently made a video. You probably you know, don't watch every video I put out. Uh, but <laughs> I made one recently, which you might dig. And it's called uh, The Secret of White Tree. And it's about the White Walker babies and all that stuff. And I was pondering the idea that there's a burnt baby skull in the White Tree Weirwood mouth. And it's clear that they've, they've, there's multiple skulls in there, but one is smaller than the other. So I take that to be a child. And when Gilly has the White Walkers gathering around her and trying coming to take her, she ends up backed up against a weirwood tree right before Cold Hands comes and the Ravens come and saves her. And so I think that George is sort of suggesting to us in various pieces what the ritual is. And Craster, of course, comes from White Tree. So we know that Craster giving his sons to the White Walkers is referred to as giving his children to the wood. And the White Walkers are the White Walkers of the wood. On the show, he just walks out and sets the baby at the foot of a tree. The White Walker comes and gets it. Well, the thing is, I don't think that... And you seem to think that the books hew closer to the show than I do in general. I'll just say that. But I do not think the babies are grown up. I do not think they take them and turn that baby into the White Walker. I think that the babies are taken and magic... Their, man, their mana, their magical life force is chewed up and turned into, used to manufacture the White Walkers. The White Walker spirits, I think the White Walkers are a hive mind. I don't think there are individual White Walkers. It's the old hive mind from the Weirwood Net. And so essentially, they just need the baby sacrifices so they can make more bodies for its consciousness. And so the, I think that the children, that's all. They're taken and they're, they're consumed in a magical ceremony. And in fact... I think that what's going on is all you have to do is leave the baby in the weirwood mouth and the white walkers can absorb their essence through the weirwoods because they are still connected to the weirwoods north of the wall. And this is, again, all my theory, not, not fact, just my theory. But that's what I think happens is the white walkers take, they consume the life essence of the baby and leave a husk. And then mm. the, the people would come and burn that husk in funeral and that's what is left in the mouth of the tree so that's what craster would be doing is going out and leaving his sons in the in the mouth of a heart tree somewhere in the woods 
And so with, with Monster, to riff on your theory, which I like this idea of Monster being important. We don't talk about him enough. He is important. The fact that, like you said, John thought he was doing the right thing and sent one baby away, but left Monster at the wall. That's going to come back to bite everyone. I do think the White Walkers want Monster. That's clear. But I think what they would want him for is part of the ritual to turn John into the Night King, I was just thinking. So what it would be is they would steal John's body and Gilly's baby at the same time, consume the essence of Gilly's baby, and use that to resurrect John as, as the Night King vessel, potentially. All right, so... I, I, I like it. You know, you know, I like what you say. I, I, I always like oh, everything that you come up with. I think you come up with great theories. 100%. If people don't know, let me let me let me put this out there. Maybe people don't, don't know me. They don't know. So so David, myself, Gray Area and Quinn, we used to have a podcast together back in the day. You know, probably was the greatest podcast of all time. <laughs> the the well, legend we, grows in the telling. It, it would grow, and, and but me, me and D would have little debates in this podcast all the time and stuff over theories and situations like this one that we're talking about and everything. And I do agree with you. I and I and I am using a little bit of the show, and maybe I should not be, but I just think that, and and it doesn't matter in the books, but when we see in the show them touch the baby and the baby's eyes turn blue, and then we see them touch the dragon and the dragon's eyes turn blue, I think that they're showing that to show you that. And I don't think that I don't give Dan and Dave credit enough to come up with things. I think that Joy is telling them that this is how you change turn into a White Walker. Uh, even when we seen the, the the dragon glass driven into this dude's heart and his eyes turned blue at that particular time. I think that's what it is. So I think that I could I do understand what you're saying, and it's quite possible. I could see them using the essence of the baby and moving into a different body 100 percent I could see that happening. But I think it's more of a good chance that somehow this baby ages really fast when and I can't explain why it would be like that, but why when 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 they turn it to a white walker so the the john snow i could see that i i just meet with john that would be cool because if if they use monster to make a new john monster oh, then both monster know. and john who both have foreshadowing to be this night king character they will both have become night king sort of that that's why i kind of like it but yeah no i i think it, that would be amazing if they did that if George did that, I think it would be amazing. I think that would be a great book. I would love to read it. I just don't know if he would go that far. I just don't know if he would think about it that far. George himself would go with that way with it. I think that John being dead inside the wall is for him to be resurrected again, most likely by Melisandre. When we look at the situation of the wall, and I think that a lot of people don't talk about it, you have to look at who's at the wall at the time. You have Stannis is gone, right? So you have Melisandre is going to be there. Val is going to be there. Uh, Shireen is going to be there. And, and the queen is going to be there. So I think if she is going to sacrifice this child to bring back Jon Snow, it's something that John wouldn't know about until he came back and would be against yeah. after he, he's done, did this whole situation to bring him back. And he wouldn't have wanted a, that to happen. He would have said this, I'd rather just be dead than you having to kill this child. Oh, I totally I agree with that. The melt the snow to help stand us in the building and in a battle like they showed, like that's ridiculous. Uh, for that, because I think Stannis will sack Winterfell and take Winterfell, and he will be in Winterfell mm. when it's all said and done. I think he dies later on, but I, I think he will sack Winterfell. So I would think, me personally, that it would go more like that with John's resurrection. I think that it's monster, and a monster is going to grow into this Night King figure. From the cool. I love it. I love, and I love the focus on monster. Like I said, so let me give this back to Tim for a second to give some comments on this. 
But I will just throw out Tony as a way to conjure the vibe of our old podcast. Yes. I guarantee you, I'll make whatever bet you want. The others are going to steal John's body. It's one of the theories that I'm most convinced of. I've looked into it real deep. There is a lot of foreshadowing for it, including his very name, John Snow, which actually translates to Jack Frost because John's a nickname for Jack and Snow and Frost Mm -hmm. are the same things. And Jack Frost is the Night King. So you heard it here first. I will just say that. it's. I think that all the Melisandre stuff, that's going to be freeing John from otherish enchantment because he's not going to stay the Night King forever. He might be Night King long enough to lead the others to Winterfell and be freed there. I could see that. I've, I've put some thought into that. But I yes, I will just... I will just bet you a million bucks, a million pretend bucks, a million golden dragons uh, that the others will for a time steal John's body and turn him into a, the most, a very terrifying version of Azor Highborn. Um, I, I, I accept the bet and I will, I will bet, counter the bet that Melisandre kills Ghost in order for John's body to soul to go back. Oh, well, no, I agree with that. That would just be, again, freeing him from icy enchantment instead of just or just originally resurrecting him. But there's no question. And if, yeah. And if anybody wonders why I said I've made that up a long time ago, and if anyone wonders why I say that, if you ever hear Gray Area say free ghost, that is because I said that she's going to be killed back in our podcast days. And she was like, <laughs> yeah. no. Kill no, ghosts, ghosts. no, it's so it's the I Mithras stuff. That, Myth, John is Mithras. So so you'll love this because it goes back to the Tower of Joy. And Tim, I promise I'll give you the mic after this. But um, <laughs> John at the Tower of Joy, the white bull Arthur Dane is killed. Okay, John has a lot of par- parallels to Mithras. And Mithras to be reborn has to kill the white bull, which is actually a friend to him and an avatar in some senses of himself. So ghost as a white wolf will be killed to resurrect John. That's yeah, that's facts. But Tim, yeah, get in on some of this or take it in a new direction. We've got a lot that we've thrown out here. I, I love this talk about monster in particular. Yeah. No, like ugh. people get so upset when you throw out the idea that ghost has to die to bring John back. Just like, the body. Even more, ups- even more upset than the idea of Shireen dying to bring John back. <laughs> Nobody wants the good boy to die. And I always, um, the wolf yeah. spirit is going to merge with John's spirit. It's all going to go in John's body. The wolf will still be there. It's only the corpse, the bo- the fist of flesh. Sorry, go ahead, Tim. Yeah. No, it makes me think of like when I watch a movie and it's like the death of a person on screen does not affect me like the death of a dog on screen. I'll, I'll watch a horror movie and I'm like, the dog better live. I don't care about anyone else. It's because cabin, they're innocent. The dog it's better make it out innocent. alive. Animals are innocent. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so getting this back on track. So for me, <laughs> like I see monster as, as, as just like I see like the arrest of Craster's children's sacrifices as a a life battery for the others okay he's he's like matrix terms he's that nine volt that the others need to stop their smoke alarm from chirping i think that john is going to be that john is the prince that was promised he's the more important factor in this in this story and as like you said like john being knight's king for a brief moment but then being wrestled back like that's an idea i've talked about on the streams a couple times where John's going to be overtaken by the others, but then he needs to be wrestled back by Melisandre or Bran, because that's where we get John being a mix of blue ice magic, red fire magic, and green seer magic. So he, so for a moment, he symbolically becomes the trident where his father Rhaegar died. Yeah, and yeah. that's yeah. and Tony, that's part of what I'm saying too. Is that like first he's ice whited. And then his freeing from ice white enchantment, I think it will involve Bran and Melisandre. Um, it's going to be a team effort. And also, if John, if we want a John zombie that can get it on with Daenerys, like, then we're going to need a better resurrection than what Beric got. And I think the answer to that must have something to do with Green Seer magic. But I don't know that they need to get it on. Actually, the more that I think about it, so it may not be a thing at all. <laughs> I think, though, when it comes to the idea of of someone coming back from the dead, but still being able to function 
on a living level like that, I think green see, green magic seems to be the one that's going to give you more right. of that than ice right. than ice magic, which is at the very bottom, and fire magic, which seems to be somewhere in the middle. Green magic seems to be the more life essence, the more natural, the one that's going to bring you back, but more human than corpse. That's why I see like the green seer magic and brand being so important to John's resurrection, just as much as the Mel as Melisandre and the others are in the tug of war that's going to happen in bringing him back. But it's also what makes him again, like this, this idea of John being a Messiah figure. Now, I'm an anime fan. I like Bleach a lot. What makes a lot of these anime protagonists so so compelling is so, like the chosen one is because of all these different bloodlines they have. John fits that mold because he's Stark and Targaryen, but Daenerys fits that mold too. She's Targaryen, but she's got the first man bloodline from the Black Blackwood, Wood. and she's got and Dang. the Dane blood is possibly Great Empire of the Dawn connections. Right. But what sets John just a mind, just a step above her is the idea of him coming back from death, and coming back from death as a result of all three of our branch of our color branches of magic. Yeah, I think Danny could be whited too by the time she gets back to Westeros, but we'll see about um, that. Did you have a thought forming, Tony? You wanted to say, and then I'm going to try yeah, to change I, the subject. I think that when you deal with the magic and you're saying three branches of magic, I think it's all one magic. It's just mm -hmm. people it do it different right ways, blood. but it's all this comes from the same one bastard children of the forest, ugly ass magic. And I think there's yeah. people just use it in different ways and everything else, but it's all roots with them and yeah. everything else. And when dealing with, you know, again, I said already the 79 Sentinels and all that, them going through, and Blood Raven. When you look at that whole, the war, I know somebody put a comment earlier and they put my name in, and I remember they said something about can the others break the wall because of this magic that's put in the wall and everything else? There is no proof that we are given that this wall has magic in it or breaks these others. The others can't pass to it. We don't know that. We have not seen that physically happen. We have no idea. In fact, I mean, if you want to go, and I know I'm looking at the show, the the show, the wall's been there all this time. The first time the White Walkers come back, the shit come down. Didn't seem to work that well. We have no physical proof at all because the White Walkers have not been around all this time that this is actually done. It could be just propaganda made by the children of the forest who are known to do propaganda. They made propaganda from the beginning of the time with the White Walkers lying when they actually created them. They're known for this propaganda that they've done to keep people away from what they actually so want let me, to So let do. me just stop. I, I want to challenge you here on this. So there's several things that I think cut against this. Melisandre, unless she's making shit up and lying quite a lot, she says the wall is the hinge of the world. It's more powerful than a shy that it's great magic, that she can use it to work more power. My spells will be more powerful here. Um, Alisand can't fly her dragon across the wall. Uh, the whites have to be, the two whites that invade Castle Black have to be carried across. I, I agree with you that it. we don't know for sure a lot of things about the wall, who made it and why and all that shit. But I do think there's a lot of evidence beyond well, just cold hands that, that it is a look, shadow barrier. But go, go ahead. When you go through the night fort, it, the castle itself, I'll, I'll address each one of your things. The night fort itself, right, is the only castle that actually has, it's built into the wall itself, right? It's built in there. It's Perhaps. They have places that, that's what they say, they have places that they live in the wall itself. The night mm. queen lived inside that castle for 13 years, ain't shit happened to that bitch, right? So if the wall was so powerful, why is she able to live up in there? Not for a day. She didn't just come in there and do a toner. She did that 13 motherfucking years. She's been there for a long time. Yeah, and everything okay. Else. I and she was chilling up in there and the whole time, and there was nothing bad happened to her. When we see magic that affected the whites, and I'm dealing with the show real quick, when they tried to get into the cave with the children of the forest, when they walked through, you seen them bodies explode, right? They right. explode as soon as they came through. There was no explosion 
when we've seen any white get traveled through the wall, whether it went to King's Landing or the wall. No, that that's just show that stuff there. Through. But Blood there Raven's Cave is warded. There. I'm saying that that's real magic that was on right. that one. I'm saying the wall itself, we actually have no proof that it actually works. We don't know. We know that okay. we told that. But the children of the forest could have been lying from the beginning just to keep people away. And also, when you deal with, like, the stories of the night fort, look at that one dude, the Mad Axe, right? The story of this dude, Mad Axe. This guy was mad. He was crazy. He murdered all of his brothers with an axe, right? Because he went crazy because of the war. How crazy are you if you know to take your shoes off before you commit the act? If you go to a court of law and you say, listen, I'm going to plead insanity. I just killed all these people. I didn't know I was killing them. I lost my mind. And the prosecutor say, sir, you lost your mind, but you knew well enough to take your damn shoes off so they couldn't hear you coming. Okay, so, but, but, so what's your point, though? Mad right what's there, your point? Right? So you're everyone's mad. lying about the wall or whatever. What's the point? I'm just saying, well, that was the whole th- point about the, the mad ex was that that he was mad he wasn't mad he was warped and he did it on purpose he went out there to kill him he was nothing crazy about this guy and everything else so when i deal with the wall and everything else and that's all from the children of the forest and blood raven who actually had this dude do that when i deal with these do with, with the wall itself i think it's propaganda there's no proof that the wall actually stops white walkers we're told that, but there's nothing, no evidence ever shown in the show because it was invented when the White Walkers were already defeated. But what's the actually, point? What's the point? The point is to the point is to do it to keep the people believing in the children of the forest, right? They're the ones who told you, oh, after the whole search, right? Before the White Walkers were defeated, the world was just about defeat, right? They go out there. And the last no, I mean, Tony, Tony, I, everyone's confused course. right now. I he mean, what is the least. point of this theory? If the wall doesn't stop the White Walkers and they can actually cross any time, like, what's the point here of this idea? The point is, the point is that the children of the forest fabricated so the story to make, to make themselves more important than they actually are. That is the point of it, that the children of the forest are actually the true evil of this whole show is the children of the forest. They fabricated the whole wall to make you believe that you need them to defeat them. They, that's why they came up with the, oh, the, 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 they, they allowed the White Walkers to go out there and kill all of mankind. And then after, when they went to search for the, we need to find the children of the forest, they have the knowledge to kill them. And then all of a sudden, they, they can find them. And the children of the forest say, hey, we know how to beat these White Walkers. Take this dragon glass and you'll be able to defeat them. And they did defeat them. They knew because they created them. They hold whole, it was all propaganda. And then they said, hey, we're going to build this wall so that they'll never come back. And they'll be in the lands of always winter. And you don't have to worry about it. You guys stay away from this. We're going to live out here. You leave us the fuck alone. But the wildlings, the regular man went out there anyway, and that's what they just to get their thing. So to me, it's just all propaganda. There is no proof, 100%. No one can give any proof. But where is it going? Like, I'm really trying hard to get to this with you. How is this mm-hmm. going to play out in the story? I think the wall comes down as soon as the White Walkers get up in there. They're going to knock this fucking wall right down. They're going to knock Why do the they wall care? down and invade Rutheros, huh? Why if they don't if they if it doesn't stop them then why do they need to knock it down? Because they have to come through it somehow. They're not going to come through a door, so they're going to have to knock it down to get through. Mankind so, believes the wall is going to st- prevent the White Walkers from going through because there's magic by the children of the forest in it that won't allow them to pass. That's what they believe. That's what mankind thinks. John, John also That's can't true. sense ghosts through the wall. So there's, there's, it's absolutely a magical barrier, Tony. There's way too many clues that it's a magical barrier. I'm not barrier. saying it's not magical. I'm saying that it's not going to stop the white walkers. There's no proof that it, at the magic. Well, you just took a really long way walkers. around to say that the wall's <laughs> still going to come down when the white walkers invade. Everybody fucking thinks that, man. 
No, that's a known fact it's going to come down, but it's the reasoning that it's going to come down is because the children of the forest lied to begin with. I still that don't understand that part. Back. I don't understand that part at all. I don't understand how you don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand. They lied about it. They've lied about everything. What have they ever told the truth about? I think they're telling the truth about everything. I don't think they're lying about anything. <laughs> about what? They, they, they created the White Walkers, right? They didn't. No. No, they Azor Ahai stole they, their magic yeah. and created the White Walkers. That's what I think. But let, so you, you don't think the I've got, I really need White to change Walkers. the subject here because we've been talking about the same thing for like a fucking hour. And I, I don't. I see everyone in the chat is just like, Tim, tell this man. Like, okay. Sorry, sorry. I, I had three beers, Please, wine, and a home. bottle of water. I really, I, I couldn't, I had to go. You're allowed um, to go to the bathroom, anyway. Tim. Yeah. I had to pee. I'm sorry. It's not like um, a dorm school. Anyway, or anyway, anyway, anyway. So, not to toot my own horn, but this is this is why I, I'm going back to my black sarcophagus theory. And what lays at the wall, I think, is answered at this. Now, the wall is referred to as a hinge of the world, just like a shy. And this creates the idea that there are other hinges of the world. And I do think we have some fine candidates. Five forts and Yin being two of them, and the thing they all share, and the thing that I think they all share in common is this black stone. Because, and same for the Heart of Winter. Because my theory is built on the black sarcophagus of Nefren Ka. Because Nefren Ka, the Bloodstone Emperor, is straight up George's Nefren Ka. And what I said lays at the heart of Winter is probably something that narratively functions the same as Nefren Ka's black sarcophagus. I don't think it's going to be an actual sarcophagus. I think it's going to be some kind of MacGuffin that serves the narrative purpose, which I said is a funeral mound of black stone and weirwood. I think my idea regarding the wall and what lays under the wall is the same. If you were to melt the wall, remove all the ice, what is underneath it? I think it's going to be black stone in the way that a shy is black stone in the way right. that yin is black stone. I think now, someone good has chance. said in a stream, in a stream we did before when they were saying like, someone said like, Tim sounds like he's conjuring um, Preston Jacobs, that, that a song of ice and fire is secret sci-fi. Now, no, a song of ice and fire is a sword and sorcery fantasy in the vein of Conan, but it is built on a Lovecraft foundation. And just like how we'd said, like when I was talking about the three branches of magic in the colors of the trident, but how they're all rooted in blood magic as their origin, I think the hinges of the world are all built on a foundation of black stone. So that's why I think that underneath the ice of the wall is black stone, just like a shy, just like Yin. You're saying on the base of it, not inside the wall itself, like lined on the floor. That they put black stone straight down and then built the wall on top of the black stone is what you're saying, right? I think it's possible. Yeah, it could be like, I mean, it could be, it could be a wall of black stone going up with ice that froze over. Like if you think of like a, if you were to pour water down down your down the roof of your house in in winter and watch it ice over, that could be it. It could be a foundational black wall that just has layers and layers and layers of ice all over they it. Do. and that would make it like that would make it like the five forts and like yin and like a shy a structure right. built out of black stone that sounds great but in the night fort itself it says that there are rooms carved into the wall that you live inside of the wall itself that was what was put there and that's what the night fort was all about that's the difference between the night fort and all the other ones so that part that makes sense that to me Tony. That's why the, the night wall, fort right? relates to the fi that's why the night fort relates to the five forts. If the wall has black stone, then it's probably not the oily black stone of a shy, but probably the fused black stone of the five forts. That's why the wall and the five forts are like the uh, are are such a parallel to each other. The ice wall to your firewall, but that would also mean dragon dragons somewhere mm. involved in the construction of the wall. And that's why it makes yeah. sense to me, right? Because the Great Empire of the Dawn would be the ones who were here doing all the shit. That's where Azor Ahai yeah. comes from. They the build in Blackstone. And if it has Blackstone yeah. and ice, 
then it works as a barrier to both others and dragons, which I tend to mm -hmm. think is what the wall is doing, is separating everyone from everyone, because it blocks wargs, it blocks shadows, it's supposed to be blocking the others, and it seems to block dragons, if Alisan, mm -hmm. you know, unless the dragon just was like, ah, it's too cold, I, I don't want to fly. I'm not, I, I, I will not say that it does not drop block dragons at all, because obviously we've seen that. What I'm saying is that the children of the forest wanted to create a space for themselves to live. And that was supposedly supposed to be beyond the wall, right? So they needed a reason for a man not to go beyond the wall so that they can live their life out there. So they created this wall and said the White Walkers are from this side and this wall is going to prevent them from coming on your side if you just listen to what we say. We no, know that, the that part makes sense. I follow that. Right. So when we know the fact that if you want to now, you don't believe the children for us create the white walk as I do. So that means that when they when mankind went out to go and seek them, the children of us are the ones who set them on mankind to begin with. Right. No. Knowing well, yeah, no, that is that's to them to for for help to save them in the end. And that's exactly what we hear in the story that the last hero sought, sought out the last children of the forest for the help to figure out exactly how to defeat the others. And well, why would they, they be helping the last hero defeat the others if they created the others? Because they knew the children of the forest can see the future, right? We have to always remember that they see the future. They know what's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. So that means if they can see the future, they know what's going to happen when all of this comes back john snow everything else they knew all these things would happen and that they would need their help in the end because they would not be able to control the plague that they unleashed onto the war world so what i have heard by people who think that the children did create the others to protect themselves against mankind the theory there is that they did not expect the others to be able to raise the dead and that um, mm -hmm. they always had a way of controlling the White Walkers with dragon glass. But once they started raising the dead with their modified warg ability, that the children were like, oh, crap, we actually need help. We screwed up here. But I just have a problem yeah. with the children having that much culpability in the story. They're the elves. They're not the main character. They didn't cause the White Walkers like... It was their magic that Azor High misused, in my opinion. And I think the White Walkers also originally are weirwood spirits. So they're more original than the children. They're like the spirits of the trees that got ripped out of the trees. But I really need to change the subject because we've been talking about the same thing for a long time. Yeah. And I do have an interesting topic that I think both of you might have interesting thoughts on. This came out of the Discord. Um, and it has to do with the Deep Ones. Okay. All right, let me take a picture. I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Grab whatever you need to grab. Um, so can I really just say my last piece though? Because oh, sure, because I'm sure. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, I the I I'm not opposed to the idea of the others being a weapon created by the children that went rogue. Like I can I can even I can even imagine it. I can take I can think of Viserys and his line in House of the Dragon, the idea is that we control the dragons is an illusion. You can apply the same thing to Leaf, saying the idea that we control the others is an illusion. Okay. It's a perfect uh -huh. it's a perfect ice and fire parallel. So I can, I can see it. But I do like the idea of, but I'm, I'm just going to say, I do like the the evil Azor Ahai theory idea better. Evil Jesus, and this is, a lot of these are longstanding effects of his corruption. But then, like, going back to the wall and the base of it being black stone, again, I think this relates great with the prince that was promised idea when we look at John and Danny. If John is the prince that was promised, or if Danny is the princess that was promised, because it's a gender neutral term, and it comes from their bloodlines, John being Stark and Targaryen, Danny being Blackwood, Dane and Targaryen, the perfect mix then the wall follow, would follow the same parallel. If it's a structure of ice built over fused black stone, then it is a structure of ice and fire. The, I, the, the physical item follows the same narrative characteristic as the human characters involved in fulfilling the prophecy. 
Right, and it's got weirwoods in it too. So, um, yeah. Mm. But <laughs> and if weirwoods are in it, then but, but no one's allowed to say anything. Your, Look, hey, there's your trident <laughs> again. <laughs> So the I, the question here. So first of all, Tony, I made a video called Aaron got yes. patch faced, and it the, it's a theory. So we know that Aaron Dampere had a drown. He had two drowning experiences actually, but it was the one mm -hmm. six years ago that changed him, where he came back totally different, totally serious, very devout, and constantly prophesying about the will of the drowned god under the sea. So. I think that he actually got patch faced, but less severely. Um, and so he is less gone. Also patch face, it happened to him when he was like nine. So he is arrested development inside patch face is essentially stuck at where he got, you know, so he is way more, but patch face is doing the same thing as Aaron. He's constantly talking about the will and the events that are happening under the sea. That is what Aaron is mm. doing. And so, I think, I'm not positive, but I think that, I wouldn't bet you a million pretend dollars on this. It's just an idea. But I think that Aaron may have been drowned, and the drowned god is obviously the deep ones, who I hope you understand and believe do actually exist in the world, just like others and giants and everything else. There are fish humanoids underwater, okay? Mm -hmm. And the watery halls exist, by the way, because the deep ones in Lovecraft, it turns out, always build cities just offshore of the places where they want to farm, breed with humans, okay? So the reason why the Ironborn believe in watery halls and all this shit is because literally the Deep Ones live in cities underwater and they've been mating with the Ironborn for centuries and stuff. So all their legends are built around this. The, the question and the theory is, how will the Deep Ones potentially come into play? Can someone summon the deep ones okay um in the, in the person was asking oh well can euron summon the, an army from the deeps you know to fight or whatever but my, euron is actually blasphemous of the drowned god he he you know you remember from the 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 aaron damp hair forsaken chapter you know euron laughs yeah. as oh look at this pathetic little drowned thing you know it's and i'm I am the new god. So he's very blasphemous. Aaron, meanwhile, connected to the Deep Ones, potentially, if he was patch-faced. And what would be the point of patch-face and Aaron and showing us that people can drown in the water and come back with like a psychic link to stuff that's under the water? So potentially, Tim and Tony, I want you both to see what you think of this. Could it be that at some point, when Euron is trying to do his blood magic at Old Town or whatever, can Euron, can Aaron Dampere turn the tables on Euron? And are the Deep Ones planning to use Aaron as a vehicle to manifest? And will they, will we see Deep Ones at Old Town somehow through, through the Dampere? Uh, Tony first and then Tim. <laughs> me first right. okay well i, 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 I go with tim first I, if you want i would need more are you telling me the outline of the theory and i and, and it's a great oh, just outline. your thoughts on the deep I one have, do you think I have, the, I have the blank filler but i'm not sure i'm not sure how because i don't know tony i don't know how much you know about the mythos for if before i start going all king and yellow on you <laughs> king and yellow again of course uh, we'll go ahead and let <laughs> let let Tim uh, let Tony soak some of it in, and uh, we'll see what he thinks of it. Okay, okay. So again, going on my channel and 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 a lot of the streams that I've done with Dave is I've talked a lot about Robert W. Chambers, The King in Yellow, which is another okay. huge, huge, huge influence on 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 George. We see it with the Storm Kings. All anytime you see black and yellow imagery. A lot of times it's it's going it's it's relating to King and Yellow. And your Greyjoy is a candidate because Greyjoy's yellow cracking on a black field. And Euron being a rejection of the drowned god of the Ironborn fits the King and Yellow. Because when Lovecraft because Lovecraft did the same thing that George did. Right. A lot of it he took his influences, wore them on his sleeve. 
and incorporated them into his writing. So he took the King in Yellow from Chambers and incorporated it into his story. And he made the King in Yellow a Lovecraft, one of his Lovecraftian gods. Love, uh, King in Yellow becomes a character named Hastur. And then that is expanded upon further in the mythos where Hastur becomes a brother of Cthulhu. And Cthulhu is the drowned god. But, the, but Hastur wars against Cthulhu. Cthulhu is a drowned god figure who lives in the sunken city of Ryla. The Hastur is a storm god figure who lives on the red star of Aldebaran. George even took that. The red comet is is a parallel to the red star from these stor- to the red star from these stories. So with Dave's question of could Aaron turn the try and turn the tables on Euron, I think yes, because Hastor and Cthulhu are enemies. So if Euron represents Hastor, as I've been building this theory up. Right, the storm then, god. Then Aaron being a prophet to the drown god, essentially right. a prophet of Cthulhu, Hastor's enemy, would mean that yes, Aaron would have the potential to throw a wrench into Hastor's plans the way that a follower of Cthulhu would naturally want to disrupt Hastor. Because, like, what would be it's the like, point of like, Aaron being controlled by the Deep Ones if not to spring yeah. some freaking thing? And and what because would that be? People, that you it would be on Euron at Old Town. So, yeah. so what because do you think, Tony? You one, think we'll see any Deep Ones? What do you think Euron's uh, up to at uh, Old Town? I mean, there's I'm, a lot gonna, to chew on there. Yeah. So I, I'm gonna go through it because I <laughs> this happened. So I was a and we're one minute after. away <laughs> from. Uh, I'm sorry, this, Tony. You got to be like. I'm sorry I'm throwing a lot of like back knowledge on you and things you might not be familiar with, but yeah, this is how I find this idea. I, I feel, and I appreciate, I appreciate you sh- sharing that with me. I don't know if he's that important of a character and when it's all said and done for him to be the one to do something to affect Euron. I, I think if we see anything come from Old Town, it's going to be a giant Kraken that will come up from the sea and everything else. I think it would be more likely that we'll see something like that come up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, as for the, the deep ones, I do believe in the mythos of them saying when they brought them in there, I do believe that they do exist. But good I man, Tony, good man, actually, good man. Happy New Year, by the way, everyone. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Happy New, New Year. Year. Dave. I, I don't know if we'll actually see them in the show. I think that if it's anything, and we'll see a, a, a giant Kraken uh, come up in Old Town. That, that's where I think, if not more, multiple ones come up there uh, from there to, to, to help. I just think that when it comes down to, to Euron and him being taken down or anything else like that, it, it's not going to be his character of, of the damp air. I just don't see him anything. And when, when I deal with Pat's face and everything else, like me personally, when I deal with Pat's face, his skin being, you know, the, the color it is and everything else. I, I think Patchface eventually will, will get, and Melisandre, she says that she's afraid of Patchface, right? When she's at mm-hmm. the wall, something's evil about this Patchface character and everything. I think Patchface, and she sees blood around his mouth, right? Blood kind of, which makes me think of a weirwood tree when we see blood around his that's mouth, right which that's makes right. Me, me believe that pat's face will when he's at the wall will go crazy when shireen gets burnt and he'll get warped so he's going to get warped by whether it's blood raven or whatever children whatever you want to but he'll be warped that's why they have the the, the reference of the blood around the wife because what a mouth we, you look at him as skin complexion and blood he is basically what you would well and the antlers are like tree branches too so yeah that totally fits and he be being sort of simple like hodor or being magically retarded actually we could say like in the literal sense Mm -hmm. um magically crippled in a way um he could potentially be um skin changed by blood raven i could see that yeah he I think that's what happened. I mean, Pat's face to me is the, you know, he's the he's the symbol. Stannis hates him, and people wonder why Stannis hates him. Well, he's he's the reminder that his parents were killed. Every time he looks at him in his face, he 
remember yeah, his like, parents yeah. were killed. My mom and dad died. And he lived. Right. Yeah, and you survive. So every time Stan is seasoned, that's why he hates him so much. You know what I mean? Because he's the symbol of, of, of the death of his parents every time he sees this dude with his little jingle bells in his hair and everything else. It's a reminder of that. So I, I yeah. think that's what will happen with Pat's face and everything else. As for, I, I just don't know, me personally, if you're on it. Not your own, if Dan Fair is that important of a character to have such meaning in in there, I don't know if if he'll survive long enough to do something like that. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like what's he there for in the story? He's one of those medium level characters like Barristan or Victorian, where yeah, he's just there to do some stuff and then he'll die when he's done being useful. I can see his final act being screwing up Euron's magical ceremony in the specific way that George needs it to come out. So that's basically what I'd be saying. But I go back and forth yeah. with the Deep Ones, Tony. They're definitely real. George loves them. He yeah. devotes a lot of time to putting them in the background. I don't know what sort of meaningful role they can really play in the story without making it just too fucking weird. Like, straight up. Like, it's... We're all thinking about the others. We can't have a giant Deep One invasion. But we could have a little around the margin somewhere. And there's going to be a lot of chaos at Old Town. A lot of rumors are going to build about what happened. Krakens, blood magic, storms, fires, lots of war. Um, so, yeah, could, could we... I really want it to happen. All right. Okay, so... I would love to... Don't, don't let me say this, that I would not love to see it. I would. And, and I also, again, I'll say again, we, we may not get the book that we would have gotten because George may run through this book faster to tie these things up. We may not get that book that we think. Again, I think, I don't know the man personally, but I think he's more interested in writing Fire and Blood Part mm -hmm. 2. Uh, the doing the Dunkin' Egg series, kind of, yeah. The, the, yeah. Play about, the blaze about the plays about to come out, you know. So I think he's more interested in those things and actually writing a book that we've basically seen the ending of in the show, and people didn't like the ending. And I think he's just like, you know what? Let me get this done because I owe the money, and I rather do these other things. They more interest to me than than doing these things right. Now, so, I'm, so I, I need. I so I just need to <laughs> state a couple things for the record here. Um, mm -hmm. I think that he. Is, I agree with you that he is more excited about writing that other stuff. I disagree about the reason. I think that the reason is because, and being a creative person that doesn't like to work with outlines like George, once you know too much about something, it gets boring. That's why he doesn't outline. Is because if he sp spells out too much stuff ahead of time. It's not exciting. He needs the thrill of discovery to be able to write the thing. And so um, I think that to, I think that like f finishing some people just have a hard time finishing a painting because like, for example, 80% of it was done with inspiration, but then it's like almost done. And now you have to switch to a really technical way of thinking and be like, okay, how do I round out the composition and balance the composition? And some people then struggle and lose the momentum there. So I think that's more what George is maybe dealing with. Just speculation. Yeah. But the main thing I want to say is that the show ending is not the book ending. And we know this. And I'm going to be yeah. dogmatic here, but just here's what we know. Dave and Dan said a few things about ideas that came from George. And specifically, they said there's three oh shit moments that shocked them when George told them about what he knew about his ending way back in season three, which is over a decade ago. And the three oh shit moments were Shireen's burning, Hodor, and um, what was the third? Does anybody remember? Was it the Red Wedding? Was the Red Wedding one of the three uh, oh shits? No, the Red The Red point Red. is, the third one, it wasn't John killing Danny. Okay. Now, John. Killing Danny is more of an oh shit moment than any of those other three. I would submit, especially the way it happens. It is very unexpected. It is not set up. And then it comes out of nowhere. Two weeks after Danny saved the world and put everything she had on the line to save everyone else. Now she's a tyrant that has to be put down. It doesn't track. Okay. 
That is an oh shit moment. Mm -hmm. However, it was not listed among the oh shit moments that George told them. Other piece of evidence is their open statement about the John and Danny ending. They said, we came up with it around in season three, the broad strokes of it anyway. We knew it was something that the people wouldn't like. And so we wanted to make sure we did it the right way. Obviously they failed, but the point is we came up with it. The idea of John killing Danny. Um, so and oh, we both agree Randy. that maybe there could be a magical thing north of the wall, completely different circumstances, whatever, whatever. But Danny being a tyrant, and I would extend that Danny going mad and burning the innocent people of King's Landing is not something in the book and is something that they, quote, came up with because that's the whole reason John needs to kill Danny. So if they came up with the idea of John putting down Danny as a mad tyrant, then they probably also came up with the idea of Danny killing the people of King's Landing, which she never would do. The book character just wouldn't do that. So what I'm trying to say is that there are certain things which are the same, obviously, um, but there are a lot of things that George may have told them where they just decided to do their own thing. Clearly, that is the case. And then there's like, there's no Fagon on the show. There's no Night King yet. There's no Ariane. There's just so many things. All the Ironborn characters are different. You're on a Victarion and Theon and all that stuff. So I really don't think that it's like, ah, oh, the, show, the show's given my ending away. Like, not really. And also, I think the show changed around the, the King's Landing thing, where it's like, oh, they fight the others and then go back to King's Landing. Because we know Fagon's going to fight Cersei for King's Landing before Danny even ever gets there. And Danny's going to confront yeah. Fagon, not Cersei. So. Yeah, and she, he's going he's gonna, to, it, it, Fagon's going to lose that battle. When it's all said and done, Euron will see to that, that, that he loses that battle when it's all said and done. Uh, Euron in, in Cersei's situation will definitely happen in the books. There's, there's no way around that. I mean, he's she's in the vision of him that he puts out there and everything else. Oh, so you say you think happen. Cersei is uh, Cersei's hands up here, fire woman? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes. When when when, when you see him there, when he's sitting on the Iron Throne, and that woman with the pale neck is standing by him, that's definitely Cersei. What I would have a shadow of a doubt. That's fine. okay. I think it's a strong candidate. Um, Do you think Cersei like gets chased away from King's Landing, goes to Casterly Rock, and that's where her and Euron link up on the West Coast? I don't think I. So I have to look at my video. That like, I, how do I they physically connect to, away from to get close to where Euron is? Yeah, if you look, if you Euron, go, people go back on. I got like, I, if you look at my videos, I did a video wins the winter predictions, like, and I predicted that Euron and Cersei would hook up. Uh, way back then, because it was the only choice that I seen her having to survive this whole situation. I do think that it's a possibility that she could get picked out of King's Landing and have to flee King's Landing, and then that's when Euron comes to her and she says, "To win my heart, this is what you have to do." And then she he goes out there and accomplishes the mission for him because he has the dragon at that time, and uh, not like they did in yeah, the show when so everything like that but i think that he'll have the dragon and all that good stuff and that's where i'll be able to go as, as for fagon i mean he takes storms end with guile i mean basically i think it'll be a trojan horse situation you have two of those situations that go on and that's the problem i have with it are they going to do it twice when we look at the stannis situation with King, with, with winterfell it's a good possibility that they have these frays and people dressed up in the armor. Yeah. They give them the fake light bringer, like yeah. they killed Stannis. They hold the sword up. They here, open here. the gates and Stannis runs in there and sacks that, sacks it. And that's how he takes over Winterfell when Stannis does it. Will they do that again in Storm's End? Will they have a situation where I think most likely that the Martell woman is going to make a marriage pact with Fagon, thinking that he's real, and get that and get her on his side and everything else, and that will bring the Dornish to him eventually, because he is with Jon Snow. He's the fake Jon Snow, right? We know that he is not this man's son. He is right. Illyrio Malpathis and his wife's son, and Illyrio is doing this out of respect to his wife, 
His wife was from Melee the Monstrous's line. And this is what why he's doing it to try to respect her and respect respect her line by faking this whole situation because we know that his plan in the beginning was not to do what was to have the Dothraki and Danny go in there and take over the city. And then when they were fighting them, then have Fagon come over and smash Danny and them and restore order by beating the barbarian horde. That's what he wanted to do. Right. But he did not understand that the dragons were going to come about and Danny would get these dragons and everything else. So he had to pivot his whole storyline and how he was going to do it and how he's going to put his son, his bloodline on the iron throne that does have black fire blood in it. Not to real Targaryen, but black fire blood, Baratheon blood, all the same blood, really. When you all look at it, true it's enough, about, true about enough. The same percentage, right. I got it. And right, I got, so I got, that, I, got that, a number of, I got a number of points. I got to cover here. Um, no, you please, can have it ahead, next Tim. Yeah. yeah. Right. No, go ahead. Uh, go, go do your thing. All right. Oh, first off, continuing with the bit, Pacific New Year is a white Russian, an ode to the big Lebowski, one of my favorite movies. Um, okay, anyway. All right, so yeah, so I don't, I'm, I'm with you, Tony, on, on Hands of Pale Fire, Lady of Cersei. I just think it's a question of logistics of where and when do they meet? Cause this isn't the show. The dragons can't teleport. The Ravens don't have fast travel the way they did on the show. Now I'm going to be upfront with you. Like I think Dan and yeah, Dave cool. are hacks and I'll be perfectly upfront with my bias towards the show. I take a crap on it and call it a crown. I think it died with Tywin on the toilet. Season five is where you really tell, that this is no longer an adaption from an author. This is TV writers because of the way they mangled the Dorne and Iron Island storylines. Slight uptick in season six, only for a steady downhill in seven and eight. So yeah, so Cersei and Euron, yeah, I think that's the thing. I just don't, I'm just questioning when and where it happens because Cersei, I do see getting chased out of King's Landing because of Fagon. And this is a point I made on other streams. Fagon doesn't have to do much to get the support and respect of King's Landing. The bar is set so low. The bar is in hell right now. All Fagon has to do is be better than the Lannisters. And that's not, that's not a big wall to climb. So I do see Fagon taking King's Landing. And that's what's going to make Danny, Danny's homecoming so tragic is her being seen as this barbarian queen because the idea of her coming over and defeating Cersei makes her a hero. But the idea of her coming over and defeating Fagon, who's sure. actually doing rudimentary better than the, than the Lannisters makes hey. her a tragic character. Cause that's, what's going Before to make you, them can I stop you real quick. I, as I the so go on. Doth Rocky Let me stop you real quick. I can't stop you real quick. Mm -hmm. Just so you guess what? So, if it goes down like that, right? Let's look at it. If it goes down mm -hmm. like that, let's say that Fagon chases Cersei out, out right? If Fagon's the one who ch chases Cersei out, right? Cersei goes back to goes back to King's Land, goes back to to, to Landisport, whatever we want to say, whatever where she's at, right? She goes. I'm drinking a lot. She goes back there. Danny comes in and then confronts. We're all drinking a lot. And, and, confronts, and confronts Fagon, right? Whatever happens there, she exposes the the paper dragon or whatever it's called. You know, Mama's and then dragon, she, yeah. Mama's dragon, and then she winds up taking it. There is no chance again for Cersei to take King's Landing if Danny's already there. It's over. Yeah. So there has to be a way for Cersei to sit on that throne and take King's Landing in the end. She has no, to that, be why? there. Why? Why would why? And, she Cersei will be there, and in the end, I, I can guarantee you that it's going to be Cersei's skinny ass on that throne. So that's why I think more it's Euron. If that happens, well, that'll be after be everybody Euron goes north to fight the White Walkers, take it. right? You're, it'll be Euron to do it. I mean, if you want to say that, everyone leaves, Cersei then comes to King's Landing, takes over King's Landing while everyone's fighting the White Walkers. I could give you that, that, that definitely could happen. But I, it would have to be Euron to weed them out for her so she can go back and take King's Landing over 
while all this presides. As for Dan okay. and Dave being ahead, I do believe that they are they, but they didn't make all this stuff up themselves. Yes, they did, Tony. Believe, yes, they did. I, I, they said ever, they made it up. I'm sorry, but they made a lot of it up. <laughs> A lot I'm of not, it. I'm not saying they didn't make up some of it. But they, I don't give them respect enough to come up with all of the stuff that they It wasn't up. good, though. It was very bad. It was crap. <laughs> and, 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 in all, and that's why, as much as I love George R. R. Martin, and I think he's an amazing writer, I, in the end, sticking the landing is always the hardest part. And well, I think sure, that but your, your statements don't square. Part, like... They, if, uh, if if the if the show does. was bad, then it's believable that they made it up. It doesn't match no, what came they're, before. They're, the, the Lawnmower Man was a good book, but the adaptation of the movie wasn't as good as the book. Sometimes people just can't put it on the movie as good as the people write it in the book. So saying that he didn't give them stuff and they didn't execute it right is two different things. Well, I think right? in so some cases they them... were taken, and I'm gonna we need to give it back to Tim because you interrupted Tim to make, and then you changed the subject. I so I gotta, <laughs> but <laughs> they took some of Martin's ideas and did their own versions, and other times they made stuff up. I, I mean, that seems to be that. clearly what's going on. But Tim, you had you were still going back on what Tony had originally said about something. I forget what. But did you have other points that you remember? Well, about I was your just. Yeah. No. One You're of the on. biggest points that I come yes. back to is the Jorah and Mormont Cersei. line of, of regarding the small folk. The small folk don't care who sits the Iron Throne. As long the small folk pray for healthy children and a summer out without and yada yada yada. So I think at the end of the day, whether it's Lannister, Targaryen, Baratheon, Blackfire, they're not going to care. They're all they're going to hope for is who can make my life better. That's why Fagon is going to be such a breath of fresh air to them. And I said, that's why what makes Danny's tra story so tragic. Her fighting Cersei is a good end. Her fighting Fagon makes things multitudes more complicated because Fagon, I think, is going to at least try to be a good king. And maybe he'll succeed, but I think it's the fact that he's going to try that's going to make all the difference. Now, as for... Yep. Yeah. I'll let you interject. If I can say, let's, let's say this. Let's go like this way. Mm -hmm. Fagon takes storms and we know he does that, right? He, mm -hmm. he has a daughter's yeah. support and everything else. Cersei's in King's Landing. She hears about this situation. Fagon's about to come. Euron comes to her on a dragon back and is like, I'll prove myself to you that I will take help you. He goes and takes out Fagon and them and stops that whole rebellion right there. Now she doesn't have to leave King's Landing. Euron has proved himself to her. She agrees to marry Euron. This gets Euron on the Iron Throne. Euron then strangles and kills Cersei. He is the Valonqar. He takes her out, and now he sits the Iron Throne with the dragon right there. That would solve that whole situation right there, that when Danny came down, now she has a problem to deal with Cersei. Or you're on, oh, uh, if you wanted to put it that way, right? So that uh, would be I a way that she wouldn't have to escape and everything else. She may be in the position where she could, but Euron is the one who comes and saves the day for her. Okay, that's so an interesting. Assume, yes, if what, if, if what I'm if what I'm if I can interject, if what I'm getting at is, are you saying that like Cersei is going to be Euron's Plan B when it becomes obvious that he's not going to get Danny? Yes, 100%. He's not going to okay, get Danny. Okay. He's going up to the Iron okay. Throne, so it's Cersei is the one. Okay, see, this is this is where I differ. Okay, this 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 is this is okay. This is where we get where we're at our crossroad. I think Euron's going to fail before that happens because I think he's going to become the other's Plan B before he has a chance to do that. Now, this is something that I've theorized on. Because Euron, now going back on all this Lovecraft stuff I talk about, Euron is the quintessential Lovecraft character in, in A Song of Ice and Fire. And the thing about Lovecraft characters, when you follow the themes, they always get mind melted. The ones that are trying to tread on the territory of gods. So I think that, and I've, I've talked about, like, this is something I've talked about with Dave a lot, the idea that when the others lose out on, on John, that Euron is going to be their 
plan B. I think the others are going to mind melt Euron before he has a chance to enact Cersei as his plan B. I think that's where we're differing in our logistics of what happens of where Euron and Cersei meet. I don't think he's going to get that opportunity to kill Cersei and be the Valonqar because I think the others are going to overtake him as that. Like Euron is our third act villain, but the others are our final act villain. There's always a bigger fish. And I think that's going to be Euron's comeuppance. There's a bigger Kraken. So what would well, be the point of, Tim, hang on. So, Tim, if if Cersei is, or both of you, really, if, if, if Cersei is Hands of White Fire Lady, what's the point of her having, like, a magical appearance in Euron's vision? Like, does, is, like, those Hands of White Fire, is that about Cersei's wildfire? Is she, because she's burned people? Or is, because she's not really a magical character. I think it is her wildfire connection. And I do think giving giving the show props, the destruction of the Sept of Baelor is something that I do think that's going to happen and that Cersei's going to happen. I and agree. this is the way I agree. agree. Now, now in the show, because they aged up Tommen, Tommen takes, you know, Tommen takes his skydive out the window when he finds out what Cersei happens. Now, book Tommen is much younger. But he is very enamored with Marjorie, and Marjorie needs to have her. Now, Cersei has done her her uh, her walk of shame, her walk of penance, whatever you want to call it. But they have her and Marjorie have yet to have her trials. Now, this is what I envision happening: Marjorie is going to have her trial at the Sept of Baelor. Cersei is going to set up the explosion, but Tommen. Wanting to be with his little Tommen, nine-year-old Tommen, uh -huh, who uh -huh. still really loves his wife, his older wife, is going to sneak out and make his way to the Sept of Baylor to see her, and he's going to get caught up in the explosion. That's what I see the book version of that event going. And that's going to be the thing that like really breaks Cersei, that she is complicit in the death of her own child. So That's, yeah, so like yeah, it sounds yeah, right. I, I want, yeah, it sounds good. I I definitely could agree with with that. I that sounds great, one hundred percent. That that she could be what she's doing is causes the son, her son's death when she didn't want to. But when dealing with the the prophecy of Euron or or Dampier, the vision number one, we have to realize that this is not prophecy. This is not a vision. This is. Euron showing him what he wants to show him by use of glass candle to get inside of his dream. True. Right? So That's true. A prophecy. This is Euron. Euron's showing him what he wants him to see. He says, look at where I'm at. You see with the throne I'm sitting on is the iron throne. And then that's when they use the, the description of the person using, and they specifically use the word pale. The only person that we see the tall and pale, right, that we know from those stages is Cersei. She's tall and is supposed to be the Valenqua who wraps his pale, uh, his hands around her pale white neck and kills her elf. So he's already having visions from that. Euron's already done with Danny. He's trying to get on the Iron Throne and he needs Cersei to get himself on that Iron Throne at that time. So that's why I feel that he will be there and he will save Cersei's ass. And then that's when he will get the Iron Throne and he most likely will be the one to choke her and, and kill her. I mean, it says, um, when, the tears have drowned, when the tear, yeah. tears have drowned you, Valakra will then wrap his hands around your neck and choke the life out of you. I so mean, that would Valakra be after would accidentally killing her son. That would be when she's drowning in tears. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yes. yes, yes. Would add that. And then he would take her out and kill her. And then he would be the man on the Iron Throne sitting at that particular time. I, I, I see it. I know everyone wants it to be Jamie Lannister and Jamie the Killer and everything else. I don't see it. I don't see yeah. uh, Jamie being the one to kill her. I don't. I don't. I think. That's I think too, it could happen, but yeah, no, that's where I, I'm on. I'm on. I'm on Occam's razor with that one. That the prime suspect is the most obvious one. I do think that Jamie is the Valonqar being the younger twin. Cool. Well, this is just the kind of thing I wanted to do was to flex our ideas about what could happen in the winds of winter and 
Because, yeah, it's easy to get locked into your own headcanon of what's probably going to happen. And it's nice to have that shaken up a little bit with some different ideas. It's like Because, like, with the monster thing, I hadn't really thought about monster. And so Tony's bringing up, well, what if he's the Night King? It's like, ah. Oh. And then so that's different. Because, again, me and Tony have different ideas about how the White Walker babies are treated. But just thinking about monster makes me think, oh, well, maybe they'll use monster to raise John, which is similar but different. So yeah, I hope you guys have really enjoyed some uh, some of these different ideas. And Tony and Tim, I both uh, I'm grateful to you guys for not that we would have yeah, to stop you, now, but just I appreciate yeah. the, the discussion. Okay, well, I hope you I hope you take that and you make some great videos that you do. And you know, again, I don't think the name Gilly is made by choice. And again, especially no, you never. heard it in the show. You know, when it says, "Oh, the Gilly Flower," right? That's what you named after. You know? And that name happens to be the same name that is Shade of the Evening. That is called the Mother of the Evening. My bad. Mother right. of the Evening is the name of that flower. The Evening is the Long Night. <clears throat> the Mother of the Long Night who ushers in the Long Night. That would be the Night King. And that would be her son, who is he is the Mother of the Long Night. Uh, he's either yeah. the 99th or 100th child born to craft. So I think that's a show. People in the chat yeah. were saying that it's on the show that they said he's the 99th child. But well, yeah, Gilly, even, still, the even, still, of even still, Gilly is another of these mother of abomination figures by being the mother of monster in a symbolic sense. Well, that's what I was saying. Just right. The name yeah. mother of the like that could simply apply to her having babies that turn into others. Um, but but monster, I it, like I said, yeah. a lot is made of monster. Just his presence and Gilly. I mean, he's in the book since book two. The, all the effort to save him, cold hands, Sam, smuggling him mm -hmm. through. Brand sees him. Like if monster becomes in some sense the Night King, like Brand met him. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. and, he, and he beats up. He beats up Mance Raider's kid. Like she, like like they say, they're scared to have him around. Man, yeah, baby brawl, <laughs> baby brawl. <laughs> yeah, he keeps beating him up. They say he's too strong. He's, he's way too strong for him, and and he's just this monster. He's just a, 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 a he won't, he's too he won't strong let him have the nipple. <laughs> and they don't want him around. Yeah, he fights for the nipple and everything else and all that stuff. He's he's <laughs> there's something going on with that child. That child is definitely. I, I mean, I think he's yeah. a night king, and but there's something going on fishy with that child and everything else. So I hope that you... Oh, it's not I, fishy. He's promised to the others and they stole him. They're, they're pissed about that. We know that. That's, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, just so. want to, I just want to interject because this we started on this conversation with Deep Ones and we went so far off the road. So if I can just round it back to our origin point with the Deep oh, Ones. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so... About an hour ago, Dave, Dave, you had said, like, we're probably, we're never going to see r actual deep ones on page, which, yes. We may or may not, yeah, lose. right. We might not. He's only going to lose. No, we're, we're, we're not. Here's the thing. Why. Now, this is, <laughs> I never, I don't, I don't often criticize George, but here's the reason we're never going to see on deep ones, actual deep ones on page. If we were, then a song of ice and fire becomes a part of the mythos because now he is fully incorporating a Lovecraft figure. And if anyone, if you're familiar with George's ideas regarding fan fiction, for La uh, Song of Ice and Fire to become a part of the mythos makes it fan fiction. And George is going to do his damnedest not to allow that to happen. Mm. He'll, um, he'll dip his toes in that water, but he's not going to take the full dive. <laughs> uh, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn would like a word with you because it's... I need to read that. It's on my... to re That, I believe... Memory saw on thorns on my to re my to read list just keeps growing. Memory saw Great on Empire of the Dawn area. is and straight Elric, up Numenor. Elric like Great Empire of the totally blame you for. Sorry, Tim. Great Empire of the Dawn. I was just saying is Numenor. He barely changed that. So uh, okay. I don't know. Um, I, I, I just think that you know, I, I George R. R. Martin. He's a great author. I, you know, I would never. I mean, I, I'm writing a book myself. It's going to come out next year. This year, actually. Uh, but uh, I would never be consider myself anything close to that but he is a human being and when you look at human beings and you look at where it's at you know i, I me personally i just don't know 
how much though this is his, what made his money and everything else how much he wants to finish this series as much as he wants think- at his age to do other things <laughs> oh and i think he is- wants to finish it but there's some emotional blocks too i mean it's a heavy burden and he's definitely i mean he's obviously struggling with it there's no question about that we're just speculating on why um yeah i mean it's i just think it's a whole thing of like writing a new story is fresh it has no obligations (laughs) and expectations a new dunkin egg store it's fine it's easy just do whatever Mm -hmm. but like finishing the book yeah it's i do think he really wants to do it i do believe in him i do think he will do it but obviously it's you know Two books, while. he's saying. Two books. You think he's going to get through the, 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 the dream of spring. I know all that. He's going to get through both. Simpsons I, did it. I Every just think Winds of Winter is going to get released in two bound volumes because he's already said that he's written more pages than Dance was, but he's only 75% done. Like when that update a year ago, when he said 75% done, he said he'd written 1,200 pages. That's as long as Dance already. So if it's going to be bigger than dance, it's going to have to be bound in two volumes. Like, because dance is about mm-hmm. as big as a book can be. Yeah, it's so only certain size you can make a book. Yeah, where the, the, the ink doesn't yeah, stick right anymore, right? Falls apart. And everything. So I, I just, <clears throat> I just think you know, as not not as anything close to him, but when it's again, okay, it's like being with a new woman and being with an old woman that you've been with a long time. The new woman is go, always Tony. exciting. It's always brand new to you. You could be doing the same thing, but it seemed brand new, right? Because it's a new chick. And I think that all the Duncan egg and, and, and for Duncan that, egg, that people talking just, about. I just, show. I'm sorry. I have to say that that would work both ways, regardless of gender or preference, like in any direction yes, that course. would work, but go ahead. Of course. And Duncan egg and people, I would like Dunk to be the dude who plays Reacher. If you ever seen the show Reacher, I can't think of his name right now. I'm drinking. But if you ever seen the show Reacher, that should be the guy who is casted as Dunk. He would be perfect. People in the chat, if you ever seen that, you you, you know. If, I'm sure you, some of y'all watch the show Reacher. Look up that dude right there. That that is Dunk. That should be Dunk right there. Throw a little couple of wigs on him and everything else. That would be Dunk. The woman would be happy about it and everything else. He should play Dunk. This thing I would without a shadow of a doubt. I think he would do it. But um, I, I and when it comes down to him, I just think that. He has so many. He wants to get that fire and blood part two done. He wants to get the dunk stuff part two. He likes this. He likes the, the animated the, sea I'm snake gonna, show. Tony, didn't you see the not a blog post today? He's all fired up about animated shows. He's talking about the ones that he's watching, and he said that there's mm-hmm. several animated ice and fire shows being developed. And in case you didn't hear, guys, this is from this morning. George announced that the sea snake show is in development. It has been changed to an animated show. And he gave a little bit of the reason why, which is simply that it's going to go in a different city every week and it's going to go to some crazy locations all over Essos. Oh, and it would just be oh, wickedly expensive to do. Tim, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just, I just, I, I died of happiness a little inside because I was oh, you hadn't heard that? animated. I did not hear of this because oh. animated opens up so many worlds of possibilities it, it does doesn't it get, yes it means we get ne- we could put potentially get nefer and the thousand islands and all the all the crazy far eastern yes past, you know yes past past the bones places if they made a tv show they'd cut half of that shit out and it would just be like him landing well, at a make, sea yeah. town and drinking yeah, a little it would be lame it's lame as hell so i'm yeah I'd be, the only uh, way to do that story TV. yes you know no limits yeah. yt all that stuff. So Thorios, a shy, all the wildest, weirdest places make it high fantasy. So I'm pretty excited about that. George I would, is, I would love, for, yeah, I love for him know, to get the I people who made that. Castlevania, who did the Castlevania anime series to do that series. That would be amazing. Uh, we're dealing with the, with the, the, the play that, 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 you know, the play is about, or, um, you, you know, you know, I'm sure you know about the play. But would you consider everything that we see in that play canon? Oh, are you talking about the Robert's Rebellion play? Yes, yes. Just, just. Well, not, I barely just know about scene. that. Who? Tell me what you know. What's the it, basic facts about yes, it? It, it? It is just. It's just the tourney of Harrenhal is the play okay. itself. 
It's just taking that. That's what it's going to take. The whole tourney of Aaron Hall and everything that happens in it is the play. That That's it. It's that how how involved is George? Do we know that? Yeah, that was going to be my question. <laughs> he did the it's his play. He's the, he okayed the play, and it's his play. Yeah, so whatever the mystery night's going to be is going to be all that situation, everything that happens there, the Mad King, all that is all from George. That's everything so I do George. think that George is telling the story of Ice and Fire across multiple mediums. I think he fed us a lot of stuff in the world of Ice and Fire and in Dunkin' Egg that is very important to the main story. And I don't see a problem at all with him using a play to tell us a couple of arcane details about the tourney of Heron Hall. No, I, so yeah, I think we, we need a report on that for sure. When is it coming? Yeah, Do we if know? It gets, it's, if it gets the next, George Steel approval. It's this, it's this year. It'll be in New York. It's this year it comes out. It's we'll done. have to get okay, some people to go yeah, watch and take very detailed notes or if you're not I'll allowed to there. take I'll, notes, you got to, I'll this be is George's family a lot for his. Oh right, you, <laughs> sorry, Tony. You're sitting there with your fucking Yankee on. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I'll definitely be there and everything. But I I'm think it's obvious what we're going to see, and that's Leanna Stark as the as the mystery knight. I think that's, I think that's obvious. I don't think it, you know, but the Ashura Dane stuff with Ned and his brother, I think, would be. Oh yeah, what the the thing would be. And, and stuff like we'll that. no doubt learn a little bit about Rhaegar and Lyanna, what brought them together, how, you know, prophecy, mm -hmm. love, necessity, politics, what kind of mix it was or whatever. So, yeah, that's sick. That's fun. Yeah, yeah it should be George, a good time. If you're not going to finish the book, then at least finish it through other mediums. <clears throat> we did, we'll Tony, we had a really good Lyanna stream a couple months ago. Um, somebody pissed me off on tw well, p Twitter because, I, I mean, you know, Twitter is... And I, I made a tweet and I was like, uh, the infantilization, the infantilization is such a messed up word to say, of Leanna Stark needs to stop. And right on cue, a bunch of howling ninnies. Uh, she's literally a child. She's literally, Rhaegar groomed her. And I'm like, okay, so first of all, 14 in a medieval society, not a child, not an adult either, but somewhere in between. Rickon's a child. Bran's a child. Okay. Daenerys... Like these 15 year olds, Rob Stark is leading an army and killing people in war. He's 15. Mm -hmm. Daenerys conquered a city. Okay, like in this world, at about 13, 14, 15, you start doing adult shit. And then you go through Leanna's stream or her whole story. And like every detail we have about her is a character with agency that makes choices, that speaks truth to power. Ned says to Robert, if she were here, she would have told you you're a fucking fool and you're not fighting in that tourney. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And at the end of the day, what Leanna did was she chose not to go along with her arranged marriage to Robert Baratheon, and she chose instead her own partner for whatever combination of reasons. And so I was just kind of like, people need to stop turning this character into a helpless victim that has no power over her own story. When very clearly she has a lot of agency, regarding her young age, or regardless of her young age, and she's clearly making her own choices. So we had a great time going through her story. And what happened is it just like the character is super interesting, especially at Heron Hall, the way that she interjects into the, when the squires are getting beat up by the phrase and stuff like it's such a bold move. And it's exactly the kind of heroism that George likes somebody standing up for somebody getting picked on, you know, and I just, I really love the character. So it really makes sense that they're doing a play out of that. Her story is amazing. You know, uh, so yeah, it's, there's definitely a lot there to work with. I, that's, I almost want to go to New York to see that, man. There you go. You should. Come on out. I got yeah. you. you. Come out here. I got to take care. You ain't got to worry about a place to stay. Or oh, dude, like we'd that. have a great time. No doubt about it. And I would say it, 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 sounds like, it sounds like people who were saying that Oh, Kristen Cole was seduced by, by the same by ninnies, the, oh, the very same. Oh, he didn't want to do it. She oh, everything's him problematic, you know. It's like yeah. Kristen Cole knew exactly what he was doing, bro. <laughs> Tony, these are people that don't even understand how children get made. I think, like you guys, know that there has to be. Anyways, mm -hmm. Tim, let me. Say, like, I'm, like I'm, I'm. 
Tony, like, I'm down in Pennsylvania. I could just hop a Bieber bus and get up to NYC to go see you in this Broadway show. Yeah, I'd love to yeah, see it. Yeah, come, come through, son. Come through. I got it. Come through. Uh, I mean, it's worth okay. a trip, dude. Tourney of Heron. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I kind of... It's going to be an ill Broadway. It's going to be an ill Broadway. Broadway. Guaranteed yeah. it's going to be ill. I had to spend you know some of those uh, YouTube bucks on that. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, George is going to be there at least opening night and all that and everything else, and it's going to run on Broadway. You know what I mean? So it's going to be an ill place. It's not going to be like a... He announced this. He was, he was really excited about the play. And the fact that they just picked this one scene out of every scene that they could have picked means something that he wanted this to be shown and it would be he thinks that it would be best shown on stage too so yeah. let's okay perfect comparison the chat brings up again when we spoke about this earlier damon and rhaenyra perfect counter example so damon grooming rhaenyra that is an, a perfect example mm -hmm. of grooming damon is mm -hmm. a trusted adult figure inside of again the circle of trust he's an uncle he's got Access to a child, a child woman, yeah. a teenager, because he's he's been bringing her gifts since she was like six, okay, or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. So inside the circle of trust, an adult with access to her seems to be preparing her to be his partner, okay? That's grooming. It happens over a long period of time. Again, inside, it's an uncle. That's exactly how it happens. Mm -hmm. um, Rhaegar and Lyanna just met at Heron Hall. So that's not a grooming situation. That's two people falling in love and having an age gap. And you can say yeah. now, that you could talk about the age gap or whatever, but that's not, it's just not grooming. And what exactly? I get that. I get that looking through a modern day sense. Yeah. Leon is a minor cause she's under 18, but what exactly is the age gap between them? What was um, Rhaegar, I think like Rhaegar is 22 at Heron Hall and 23 when he dies. And Leanne is 14 okay. at Heron Hall and 15 when she dies, I think. So we're looking at like eight eight to nine years. And Robert is 19 when he's betrothed to uh, Leanna at 14. So there's an age gap there okay. too. I don't, I don't, this isn't an excuse. I was just curious how yep. big no, the That's age what it is. Was. I mean, of okay. course, again, modern times we've evolved. We've changed a few things since medieval society. One of the things is that we have expanded the bubble of safety and innocence of the teenage years of childhood into the teenage years. That's a good thing. 14 year olds don't need to be getting betrothed to anyone 19 or 23 or 68. So this is good. Yeah. This is called progress. Um, but of course we have to remember that this is all happening in medieval context. So, Oh yeah. The people that say you grit raped John because John was coerced because you grit forced oh, him to sleep with her because he needed his protection. It's like John, first of all, chose to lie and go undercover with the wildlings. So he put himself in that situation. And oh, by the mm -hmm. way, by literally two seconds into the thing, John's having a great time. And they did it like six times that night and three the next morning. So, uh, well, you know, See, that's, yeah. that's kind of that uh, difference though, between, between when it's a, a male, a younger male with a older female mm -hmm. like that you know the modern day sense is like when we hear when we hear ideas of like 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 a 14 year old kid who sleeps with his older female teacher and everyone's makes the joke of like oh the kid must have loved it he was lucky and it's like no he's just as much a victim as Correct. anyone else i think john and you grit kind of fit that maybe so, fit that mold so yeah you grit's 19 and john i believe is 15 at that point um, and there's obviously right. a little bit of an experience gap. John's a virgin. However, John also has a privilege. There's a privilege gap. John is castle born and bred and you great as a wildling. So um, you, John is also being backed with the power of the Night's Watch. And he's literally on a secret mission as a combatant to learn mm -hmm. the secrets of the wildling. So I don't think John has any innocence at that point. And it just shows you that like age, it's not just about the numbers. You can't just look at the numbers and be like, that's a problematic. You really have to yeah. consider the situation, I think. I kind of read, yeah. I read go ahead, Tony. Let's, let's get Tony get in on this. Yeah, 100%. I, I mean, when you look at that situation, when when dealing with John and Egret, I mean, she may have had him on AIDS, but she she ain't never had a coochie lick before, obviously, right? So 
He, she had a lot of stuff going on, but she didn't know how to have. Oh, that John going stepped on. up to the John, plate. And that John, was a man of he instinct. He, he just knew what to do. John, he knew exactly how. He's to the get chosen that one. He's coming. the chosen one. You know, so when you, AIDS is what it is. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I'll say it's uh, you know, embarrassing. Obviously, my kid, but my kid's mother is a little older than me, and um, I remember when when we first got together. This is many many years ago, many moons ago, and we first got together. And I was having sex with her, and I remember I had taken her and I had turned her around on her stomach, and she said to me. I don't want to take it up the ass. And I was like, wait, you don't have to. <laughs> but she was so inexperienced, though. She was older than me that that's what she thought what would happen from that position, right? So age in the end doesn't mean that you're, it's all about experience in the end. It doesn't matter about how old you are. It's about how experienced you are in that case. And John obviously was more experienced because he knew what he was doing down there. Ain't nobody do that to you grit down there. And that's what it is. So when I look at a situation like that, I can't, it's not grooming or anything like that. It was just uh, uh, he, she just happened to be older, but he knew exactly what to do to her, and that's just what it was. I almost didn't let you talk about this. I almost didn't pass you the mic, Tony, and uh, and, and now I see that I shouldn't have. Um, no. <laughs> you shouldn't. You shouldn't. Yeah. I, I, I was, I'm all I was going to say was I I'm just drinking. I just read John and Gret as two teenagers who were attracted to each other and did it. I just, you know, I kind of just I just looked back on my own. You know, when I lost I lost my virginity as a teenager, so it just you know, it didn't seem like that big of a deal to me with John and Gret. It seemed more natural, I guess, in this day and age. All right. Well, um, <laughs> I don't remember. I don't know how we got started on that. Oh, uh, yes, right. I do. This is the deep ones all over again. We, we get together so far off the road. After. No. What's if that, we Tony? For a long... I said, my kids' mom were talking. We were together for 20 years, and we have two We have two kids together. Not with her anymore, but we had two kids together. Oh. I was with her for 20 years. She was just a very... She was a she was a virgin. She was very experienced when I, when I got with her, and that's just what it was. She just was going off the thing, but she's a well, very I'm, beautiful woman. If I we if anybody takes anything away from the stream, it'll be that you are a family man with a couple of beautiful I kids. I and, do have uh, beautiful kids. That's what's on the record. Cool. So, <clears throat> all right. Well, um, let's see. Uh, real quick, Kelly Johnson, Tony says hello. And asks, up, yeah, he he said likes to send me PayPal's. I know he's one of your fans too. And he says, uh, brings up the Valerian armor, uh, Euron's mm -hmm. Valerian armor, which really would okay, fit okay. John very nicely, um, and could be the fulfillment of his black ice armored in black ice dream. So uh, how mm -hmm. how would we've talked a lot about the logistics of Euron and how all this stuff's going to happen. How would the suit of armor get to John? I, I, oh, that's, I, that's going to be corpse looting, I think. I've said, if, I, if, all right, so I've, I've, I've said, I made theories about this back in the day that, that that was John Snow's armor. It has to be his armor. That's the way it has to go down because we've seen the White Walkers touch swords and, and break them in their hands. So this, it's just so he has to have Valyrian armor. So that's his armor. It's black and red on top of that. So we, we know that that's his Targaryen colors. It's his armor. So how he gets it. Ah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to go with what I said back in the day. So I'm going to say, I'm going to keep... I think that Jamie kills Euron when it's all said and done. I think Jamie takes Euron out. And I think that Jamie is the one that gives Jon Snow the armor when it's when it's all said and done. Uh, I think it's a revenge situation for Jamie for him killing Cersei. I think Jamie is the one who takes out Euron and then he's the one. And that's how Jon gets the armor. That's interesting, and Tim, I'll let you get on on this. Interesting because of the whole Kingsguard Night's Watch parallel inversion. It's like the Lord Commander of the Kingsguard giving a suit of black armor to a Night's Watchman. That would be very interesting. Tim, your thoughts? Again, Occam's Razor, Battle of the God's Eye 2.0. John is Damon. 
you're on is Damon, one eye. John is a direct descendant of Damon. I brought this up. Every king following the Dance of the Dragons from right. Aegon the Third to Viserys to Aegon the Fourth, whether they're his son or his nephew, or, or they're all direct descendants of Damon. So I, I, I think I think it's going to be a battle of the. I think there's going to be the battle over the god's eye euron's going to be white it be the knight's king plan b like i said he's going to steal a dragon most likely viserion who's our ice dragon john's gonna ride Rhaegal, battle over the god's eye and then john's gonna loot his corpse it's that's gonna be that's gonna be a rite of conquest that he gets that that he gets that valyrian so there's more others to fight after he defeats euron there that's why I said you're on, you're on his third act villain, but the others are final act. Okay. That's interesting. These are cool. Again, new ideas that I hadn't really heard of or considered before. So <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here. There's a chance I might have to cut off the last 15 minutes of the stream in order not to be demonetized. Um, although I do appreciate, <laughs> appreciate the realness, <laughs> you know. What is the uh, new year? I do so. In general, Tony, I do tend to keep my streams a little more PG than you do with your streams. Um, I don't know I, if I said anything crazy that was actually the. It was a little crazy. Was. That was a little. That was a little crazy. Um, but <laughs> it's fine. It was funny. It's we have fun here above all else, so it'll be good. It just, but yeah, cool. we'll go ahead and wrap it up just in case we have to chop this last little bit off. We'll let you two oh, be the judge. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Hawaii. <laughs> Is Hawaii one hour or two hours? Oh, no, we can wait out? seven minutes. I suppose we'll wait seven minutes for, um, no, Hawaii's two. It's only like someone oh. in Alaska or maybe, wait, I know in South, does South America go further out west? I believe it does. Hawaii's three hours. Yeah. Who gets, who has a new year? Somebody figured out, give me a major city three. in the next time zone or a couple. Somewhere in Alaska and maybe somewhere in South America. That's the, that's all we got. American Samoa. Oh, probably the Commodore Islands because those are those are in the Bering Straits. Well, this is what we have a chat for. <laughs> um, okay, so Tony, uh, what are you yes. covering lately? You're covering all kinds of stuff on your channel. I am all over the place right now. Reacher. I think I, I did a video for Reacher. I did Gilded Age. I did do that. Uh, my Big show, I guess, that I do is from. Uh, that's the show it will be out. I've interviewed just about every actor from the show from, uh, Phil and I and stuff. So that, that would probably be my big show that I do every year that, that people come back for. But we'll be covering House of the Dragon as always. Again, I, I, though though people have told me this has got nothing to do with me and I want you to see 20 plays it. I am on YouTube, the longest running Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire channel that's still consistently running. On the whole fucking... Are you older than Alt Shift? I am older than Alt Shift, yes. My channel was out before Alt Shift X was out. It was out before History of Westeros. I mean, History of Westeros channel was out before mine, but you have to remember they did not care. They did not cover Game of Thrones for the first three seasons, and I did. So they were not out there doing that. They just covered the book straight up and everything else back in those early, early days. In fact, uh... The first live stream ever done on Game of Thrones, ever on YouTube, was done by me, James Johnson, his mother, LaJana Sargent, and the small guy. No one else ever did a live stream. Oh, that's James of Thrones. Thrones. Yes, James of Thrones. Yep. Well, so I love, so James of Thrones, and I always mention him when I mention the Children of the Forest, because his mom, LaDonna, has, is the one, the first place I heard the theory that the Children of the Forest are reptilian. And that yes. checks out because cat's yeah. eyes can also be snake eyes. John, or they call one of them scales, which means they have scaly skin. And uh, they also have four fingered clawed hands, which some mm -hmm. reptiles have. So like, yeah, they kind of check out as lizard people living in caves. And that obviously might have something to do with the idea that, like you say, all the magic goes back to the children of the forest, even the dragon bond stuff way back when yeah. has to do with children of four. That's definitely possible. Yeah. So yeah, James she of Thrones, shout out. And James is the one who came up with the night King would be the big bad of the books back in the day. And I remember everyone laughing at him when he, when he came up with that theory. Oh, he's only in the books for two seconds. He's not going to be the big bad until they actually showed him on the series. No one took him seriously, but he said that from the beginning. 
And I was one of the people who didn't believe it until I seen him on that series and he was 100% right. But yeah, we were the first person who did the live stream of Game of Thrones way before History of Westeros and all of them. In fact, they asked us, and I got no, got love for all those people, but they asked us how to do it and everything else and all that. That's back in Bard the Poet old, and all of us and all that. So we've been here doing a long, a long time. We'll still be here. I mean, you when you came on my channel, you were... I think it was your second live stream that you ever did. Something like that, my yeah. Channel around there. So, you know, you know, I've been here for a while. We're still going to keep keep going. Me, the Phil Issues guy, you know, Gray, we're going to keep doing it. And, 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 and David and us, we, we have a, a thing that we're working on. I'm not going to say it right here out loud and stuff like that, but him, Gray Area, other people, we have something that's going to pop up uh, next year. And, uh, I can't wait for the two weeks expand on it more and let y'all people know about it and everything else, but it's going to be a good time. And uh, again, thank you. Thanks for rocking with me, your boy right here. Thank you for, for your theories are amazing. I appreciate you, man. I'm going to take a look at the channel and go through all of them and stuff like that and everything else. And thank you for having me oh, on here. I truly thank appreciate you. it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I would, I would be remiss if I didn't take this network, the networking opportunity, but <laughs> Mr. Don Teflon, if you and the usual suspects ever need a new guest, you know, hit, hit me up. Hit me up. Definitely <laughs> As for Bridgefold, me, you'll be back this year. Bridgefold yeah. will be back this year. Yeah, as for me, um, as for me, like if you uh, those who haven't check out, uh, put out two new videos in the last couple of days. I got the Westeros be like, which is really popped off. I said people really like the Wojaks and uh, the Vagar the Burninator uh, House of the Dragon parody music video. Um, as for serious videos, cause I've done my funsies, uh, yeah, color out of a shy is going to happen. I want to follow that up with a stream where we're just going to straight up read, uh, the color out of space. And then, uh, yeah, I also got to get back on Zothic, Le Zothic legend cycle. And then I want to top that off with the guarded by squishers video regarding Rickon, Asha and Theon and the whole lobster Lord theory that I got cooking right now. Nice. So. Gray Waste Tim uh, is his channel. Tony's Teflon is Teflon TV. And I am told in the chat that James of Thrones is now James Johnson. And he is on YouTube as James Johnson. No, it, it, he's James Johnson, but it's, it's James of Thrones is his channel. Oh, it is still James of Thrones. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. James Johnson is the name. But James well, there you Thrones. go. Yeah, I mean, even, yeah, you can check out some of these old videos that we're talking about. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this last little bit of like, nostalgia here it's a good time for new year's but yeah this is like yeah this is history yeah. man we've been doing this a long time and long time. i'm just yeah, so yeah. glad you're still around to tell these stories i mean i still meet people <laughs> that like remember westeros.org where i started arguing with people back in like 2014 that's where i got my start so uh <laughs> well real quickly the art that's been below us this whole stream all this dragon art it's all from 3d hive mind art 3d hive mind design and they are all over instagram and the main thing is that these are 3d models you can buy them so look up hive mind 3d designs anywhere on the internet and you will eventually or actually right at the top of the list will come up their link to they're selling these things um the design so if you have a 3d printer you can download their design for a pretty reasonable price and print out almost any of the dragons, including Nana Vagar, in these various poses. There's Tessarion, uh, Grey Ghost, and uh, Cannibal there. So I use their art a lot, um, or at least I did on this new video. And I love all their dragon models, so I just want to give them a special shout out. And I figure some of you guys probably might want to download and print a dragon. So there you go, Hive Mind 3D nice. designs. Pretty cool. And if anyone would talk about the uh the monster video that i did back in the day i did that video i have don willie and don the kraken with on that video with me if you want to you can look up on go on my channel and just put the i have almost a thousand videos on my channel so it you just put in uh the white walkers monster that will pop up or any video that i do the link is usually because that's still to this day out of all the videos i did still probably my favorite video the link is always in the description of almost any video I did. So you can just put the last video I did, check it, and you'll see in the link. It'll be there. It'll say the White Walkers monster, and that's 
before I break down that whole situation and everything else, because those are my boys. And that was, you know, one of my first, you know, theory videos that I actually thought I got right. <laughs> so, so I was really excited about that one back in the day. And I had my and, uh, boys on it with me and stuff like that. Who, You know, shout out to Don Willie, the real Azura hype, and, and, and my man, and my man, Don the Kraken Wit. Yeah, Don, Don Willie. Shout out. I like Don Willie a lot. He's a good right. fella. I just want I want to shout out Quinn the GM again because he came up. He's a you know great people. Um, also Fantasy Haven. Uh, he's also a great one if you especially like the Westerosi lore with animation. He's doing a great job and uh, yeah, like this has been like this has been great. This is like like we got like the OGs and the new and shout outs to the OGs. Shout outs to the newcomers. Uh, gray area yeah. gray area put out a video and I know. Um, I'm on deck with her for another Obsidian Knights. I got John Six, whenever she gets back to that. So I'll have plenty to say about how the North forgets whenever we get back to that one. But yeah, like between Dave, Tony, Gray Area, Quinn, Fantasy Haven, it's such a great community. I love it. I love it. I just love seeing that. Every, and I love seeing the old heads and the new heads getting together. Know that about it. Great, cool, great. very good. And I like I said, nice because we argue with too much. <laughs> 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 it's always an argument with me and Gray. I love her. That's my. I love Gray. Love her. I love. Well, her. and of course, you guys <laughs> are actually people. like, you guys are like real life friends. So yeah, that's my friend. You're that's allowed to friend, argue. But yeah. Yes, that's not wrong with that. That's not that's what people say. Like, oh, you argue. There's nothing wrong with that. Arguing is a, a show of friendship. Like, I can argue with that. Doesn't mean we ain't got to agree on everything just to argue. We argue yeah. in respectfully. No, honestly, I think a lot of people in the chat enjoy someone coming on here and testing me a little bit. Like, yeah, it's it's yeah. different, you know. So it's. Yeah. I think like as long as long as you respectfully disagree, because I mean, me and Tony have had you know some very opposing opinions on where well, we hold on, on i mean he did story, disrespect though, cold hands he called cold a hands talk. a blood raven meat puppet we had to talk about that yeah. listen sir this yeah. man <laughs> is not out there living his second life in a in his own corpse for 800 or 1000 years for you to, to call him a mindless meat no, okay i'll stop um, i do think <laughs> though that he is showing us something very important which is that skin changers can do resurrection differently. And it's about John. So yeah. the fact that he's a cold white, but he's in possession of his own body means that the others raised his body, but then his body must have been freed from enchantment somehow. And he's back on team living. So it doesn't make sense for blood Raven to be puppeting him because the same shit's going to happen to John, I think. And I think that also yeah. Cold Hands is showing us that he retains his skin changer magic, even though he's been resurrected. He's talking to the ravens. He's controlling the elk, you know, because you can't just ride great elks yeah. without skin changer magic. And uh, so that is what I think is happening. And maybe I'm wrong, but I know, I know you're going to leave. So I was told I would leave this on my Blood Raven thing. Blood Raven <laughs> is the reason for. The whole summer of Heron Hall. Blood Raven is the reason that this whole thing has started. He has gone back into time. He was the one putting all the dreams into the head of, 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 of Sir Duncan the Small to go and have these dragon dreams and catch these eggs in order for Rhaegar to get born, in order for Jon Snow to get born. It has all been Blood Raven who has gone back into time and started that whole situation. Anyone who says that, oh, that can't happen, he wasn't alive back then, Bran no, was the, not alive when Hodor The ink is dry, Tony. <laughs> and no Man, orange tabby i'm i'm not just drunk sweet like i'm only a little drunk i'd be singing the praises of dave and tony and mj and direwolf city even if i was 100 percent sober <laughs> but we feel we feel the love though so that's cool well i am interested i love cold hands i really hope that's not the last we see of him outside of the cave you know i i, I hope he comes back around but uh like I said, thanks for coming on, Tony and Tim. Appreciate y'all. And uh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and get some rest. And 
go watch yeah, all our videos boring, and yeah. all of our channels over and over on repeat forever and ever. So we all get rich. Thank you. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> but no, happy new happy year, everyone. New year and uh, yeah, I'll see year. you next Sunday. Probably. I don't think I'll have anything for you before then, but uh, cheers. Ha, ha, ha.